Welcome to Billionaire Romance Audiobooks. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. It helps more than you know and is the best way to stay up to date on our latest releases. When you subscribe, you'll also get notified when we release new videos. Thank you for listening, and we hope you have a great day. Christmas Billionaires A Billionaire Romance Box Set Audiobook by Michelle Love Audio Copyright 2023 BFA Publishing Note, we edited this romance audiobook to comply with the YouTube content guidelines. If you want to listen to the full-length non-edited version, you can grab a copy from Google Play Books or Kobo. Blurb Wrap yourself in the warmth of the holiday season with these captivating tales, brimming with steamy love and romance. This collection is the perfect companion to ignite your Christmas spirit and leave you enchanted by the magic of the season. Books included in this Christmas box set. Book 1, A Baby for Christmas, A Bad Boy Romance. I thought losing my V-card would hurt. Instead, it turned into the hottest night of my life. I am the only female billionaire in Louisiana and want a child for Christmas. That's why I hired charming, smoking hot Daniel Fontaine. He's the perfect candidate and the only one I want. I offered him a million dollars to stay with me long enough to get me knocked up and to walk away, giving up all paternity rights once the job is done. But it's taking a long time for me to get pregnant, which I don't mind. Love making with Daniel is a perk by itself. It's not easy to keep from falling for him. But can I trust him to be anything more than my baby daddy? Book 2 Snowed In, A Secret Baby Christmas Romance I'm marrying the wrong woman, while the right one secretly carries my love child. I never wanted things to turn out this way. I never wanted to be the guy who screws his assistant and knocks her up, and then pays her off to keep it quiet. Except, here I am doing just that. It's breaking Cheyenne's heart and seeing her in pain breaks mine. I got her into this mess. I needed a political marriage. Marrying Crystal means more money, influence and respect for my family. Breaking the engagement to marry Cheyenne means a lawsuit and scandal, especially when people find out why. And they will. If Crystal's good at anything, it's cold-blooded revenge. But a chance at life and a family with Cheyenne may just be worth facing it. Book 3, The Biker's Girl, A Bad Boy and Virgin Romance Now and again in my life, I run into a woman so pure and sweet that I just want to get her a little dirty, in all the ways she likes. That's what I think every time I look at sweet, thick little kitty, who runs the animal shelter next door and keeps my dad's dogs healthy. I would love to make her smile and scream. I'd even let her leave me with plenty of claw marks. But sweet little kitty so shy, I'm still trying to figure out how to hit her up without scaring her off. Now we've got the cutest rescue mission in the damn world on tap for the holidays, and the guys are having as much fun with it as I am. And the more kitty warms up to me, the closer I get to what I really want for Christmas, her. Book 1 A Baby for Christmas Chapter 1 Amelie I'm sick of spending the holidays alone. Growing up I always spent Christmas with crowds of people. This same sprawling country manner echoed with the voices of dozens of French cousins from my father's family. Their parents turned their noses up at me, the Creole daughter of a poor American mom, but the children just saw another playmate. When my father died in a drunken crash, the crowds disappeared and his family turned their back on us. Christmas withered down to my mother, me, and maybe a few friends. My mom, an orphan, had no one but me, at least then we had no one around to hurt us with their duplicity or scorn. Now I'm in the same position, the only family I will get are children of my own. I'm 30 and unmarried. It's leaving me contemplating some pretty unusual options to fill up my lonely, vacant home. Am I really going to do this? This year again I'm having Christmas dinner alone, just like the last five since mother's death from cancer. 
I'm her only surviving child, and the duty to continue the family line falls on me. But times like now, as I watch the growing storm wind stir the myrtle fronds outside, I wonder what to do to have a child of my own. And on my own terms. The maids and other staff have gone home, aside from the security guards patrolling my mansion and grounds. The cook Marcy left a small feast of my favorites on covered plates, salmon with lemon and garlic, rice pilaf, tomato salad, a sliced Philippine mango, and a single glass of chilled chardonnay. Cherry pie for dessert. Its crown of vanilla ice cream was melting so fast in the hot evening, I had to eat it first. It's not very Christmassy, but neither is the weather outside Baton Rouge today. My Christmas lights adorn palmettos and trees in full bloom and fruit. No severed evergreens or fake snow to be found anywhere. But like everywhere else, the Christmas feast is about family. So here one is being planned. I dine at a small bleached wood table on the screened balcony, which peeks through the myrtles at the rolling lawn spreading out in every direction from my estate. This was my father's mansion, my father's money though in my hands it has multiplied exponentially. I get the occasional phone calls from France, now that I profit more annually than their country's GDP. I recall my mother and our last lonely Christmases, and never answer. My cousins might have grown up into decent people, but they're a package with their parents, whom I want nothing to do with. That's why I dream of my own family, with my own children and grandchildren filling up this place. I used to dream of a husband as well, but time and disappointment have changed my ambitions. Since my mother died, I haven't even been on a date. Romance is a gamble, one that has not paid off for me. But a baby. It's so much better to care for a child on my own, than spend another ten years playing the field, looking for a man to love me and start a family. I want to be a mother. A man's permanent participation in the process, isn't exactly necessary. And as much as I cried over dad, genetic material and money were all he could supply. And I don't need money. Looking down at my notepad, I've been making a list of considerations sometimes crossed off. Sometimes they make me blush. Intelligent. Fit. Healthy family history. Mentally stable. Responsible. No addictions. No family history of addiction. 34 to 42. Dark hair? Scratch out the dark hair. I don't actually care what color my baby's hair is. The donor can be any race or color, as long as he's healthy, meets the other standards and is willing to abide by my terms. Apparently that was too much to expect of Louisiana men, when I looked for dating and marriage prospects. Even if all I wanted was to keep the money I earned before the marriage. That's how to distinguish a gold digger, if anything gets between them and my money even if it's my own property, they get mad. The rumble of thunder distracts me, the lowering sky tosses through the branches and I nod. Not long now. Staring at my list, I take another bite of my pie, barely tasting it. A lot of financial, physical and romantic predators have been fended off. The last one was Marcus, who told me he would lay down the law as soon as we married, and that my estate needed a real man to manage it. By then, similar and worse encounters had burned me out, so I outright told him to go to hell. I dab at my lips with a napkin, the delicate girly way. I haven't given up on romance so much as on letting men and luck decide when I become a mother, and how long to spend alone. That gives strangers too much control over my life, and many of those strangers have turned out manipulative and hostile. Rain starts falling in sheets, the smell of ozone promising a real summer thunderstorm. The wind lifts my curly brown hair away from my face as it sighs its way through the insect screens. It'll be a beautiful night. The Lord of the Rings series is on when the thunder first rattles all the gem and mineral samples lining my living room walls in their cases. It's actually a parlor off my bedroom, but I don't spend much time in the vast spaces on the lowest level, not enough parties to justify it most of the time. The thunder rolls again. I scoop up the notepad and pick up the pen, taking a gander at my advertisement. Are you a healthy single, or polyamorous man between the ages of 34 and 42? Single woman seeks donor for live-in arrangement. Discretion and a background check are required, must be willing to move in and relinquish custody rights. 
room board, medical tests and travel will be covered until conception is confirmed. Incidental expenses are negotiable. A substantial bonus is available for a successful full-term pregnancy. Sitting back I let out all my breath and nibble on the pie again, examining what is there so far. It seems cold given the subject matter. Maybe it should be. Would it be too soft? This is business. Even if it involves being with me at least once a night, until a pregnancy is established. If my dating experiences do not improve, this might be the last time I'm with a man. As well as the first. Maybe I should be pickier. Dark hair goes back in. The sort of men who have always caught my eye are, Richard Armitage, Idris Elba, Hugh Jackman and Mark Dacassos. The more personal parts of my list will not be printed, they are reminders for when the photos start coming in. Thinking about it, I add attractive as well. Now you're just being shallow, I chuckle. But, this situation will be awkward enough, no matter how hot a specimen plays my stud. It will be even worse if I'm not attracted to him. A flash of lightning edges everything in a brilliant light for a moment, and I brace myself for a brownout, but the power doesn't even flicker. The plantation has been in our family for five generations, in my youth, the lights would flicker with every storm. Clearly, upgrading the power system has paid off. Why don't you get out and meet more people, Amelie? It's the commonest thing my friends tell me. They don't understand that after everything, I want tenderness, kindness. If a man cannot provide it, I would rather go without one. My child will get my love and efforts instead. After a few more hours of watching movies and fiddling with my ad copy, I retire to my bed. Lying alone on a mattress that could sleep for, I listen to the storm beating against the armored windows. My doubts gnaw at me for a while before drifting off. What if no suitable man responds? What if someone else shows up who tries to use me? What if he's difficult to live with or lousy in bed? Maybe I should have done the artificial insemination after all. My eyelids start getting heavy. I'll feel better knowing my child's father. And, the idea of spending my entire life without experiencing being with someone, hurts. Especially since it's hardly my fault. In this day and age, it seems that men will sometimes dig to get under the lowest bar. Even my father did that. My own bitterness is noticed with some amusement as I drift off. It will probably be fine. Not every man is dreadful, and most of the respondents will be perfectly normal. One of them should be able to help me conceive in the course of a year. Provided, of course, someone is interested. There's always the lab if not. And so I advertised anonymously online. Chapter 2 Amelie Holy crap! Why in the world have I done this? In just two weeks, I have received about 6,000 applicants. 6,000 men who love the idea of getting paid to impregnate me, even sight unseen, with no name or mention of my wealth. And most of them are very blunt about it. Not only is romance dead I think, but a lot of these guys can't even manage tact. I sit in my book-lined office, overlooking the rear garden, scrolling through the archive of messages on my tablet. I disqualify anyone immediately who is from overseas, gives a hint of being married, or asks my net worth. That only pars things down by several hundred, however. All right, this is ridiculous. There's no way I'm going to read all these emails from top to bottom. It's time to put on my executive hat and cut everyone who doesn't qualify. First are those who refuse to follow instructions. It's as simple as running a computer program. There's no emotion involved in sticking to my list. I didn't make my first billion by being kind to those who didn't respect me. I sort out the too old, too young, and those from outside a hundred mile radius, cutting the list down to just about 4,000. I use the same cold detachment and adherence to facts that I use when hiring or firing at work. All the same, I feel flutters of fear as I send rejection after rejection and the consequential blocking of the applicants. Thank you for your interest. Unfortunately, you cannot be considered for this position because you are not from Louisiana. Still in your teens. 
old enough to be my father. All right, that went swiftly. I take a good swallow of my sweet tea before deciding on the next eliminating factors. One way or another, get down to a short list of a few, maybe even just two men. Thankfully, I did not disclose my home address. The image of strange men trampling my lawn and flower beds, tracking dirt onto my pristine walkways and stately porch, makes me shudder. How many would be angry if refused in person? How many would explode into online abusers if I gave them a chance? Maybe it's silly to let strangers threaten me, even in big angry crowds. What exactly am I afraid of? I have money, power and a small army's worth of security between me and any scorned suitor. Perhaps it's just instinctive, this urge to protect myself from the men who would use me without care. I cut another 900-odd applicants who are clearly trolling. A few at least give me a laugh. But none get a reply. And after that, the selection process becomes unsettling. Two out of three left are so overtly and creepily physical in their approach, they make me shudder with revulsion. There's overexcitement and awkwardness, and then there's vileness, suggesting they either don't care about my comfort level or maybe just want to see how much garbage I'll put up with. I cut them easily and send my formal rejections with a gleeful disdain. Although you technically qualify for the position, you lack the social grace, consideration for others, and respect for women needed to make living with you for up to several months bearable. This decision was made based on your explicit description of your physical intentions, fantasies, and demands. It seems that 200 odd of the remaining applicants want to preach at me for my immoral choice. The rejection pile grows. I've been judged by every member of my family, with the exception of my mother, and see no point in putting up with it from an applicant. That leaves 896 men. Staring at page after page of email messages, scrolling back and forth, figuring out other disqualifying characteristics. There's too many to interview. I couldn't even correspond with them all. Frustrated, I scroll the included image files. Nudes, fetish wear, or bad imitations of Christian Grey get binned as well. The same goes for below-the-waist pics showing off bulges, real or enhanced. Nice zucchini smuggling job there, friend. I could have lived my whole life without seeing that. You are a walking argument for thoroughly rinsing one's produce. I struggle on, bolstered by the brief laugh. But I'm getting tired, and even more frustrated. My rejection letters get increasingly vague, formal, and short. I regret to inform you that the position has been filled. Thank you again for your interest. Send block and move on. 591 left. My glass is empty, and I stand up to stretch and get another refill. Outside I can smell rain again but right now the steam heat parches me. My head throbs. I gently massage my temples, eyes closed and swallow more tea. I'm at my limit temporarily out of ideas for how to further narrow down the list. Ready to quit for the day, I scroll back and forth through the photos, hoping for one of the men to catch my eye. And then, quite unexpectedly, one does. His face flashes past as I scroll. It registers in my head. I stop and frown for a moment. In an instant, and in the midst of hundreds of other images, a pale and dark blur catches my attention. I slowly scroll back. A pair of almost silvery gray eyes stares back at me from beneath dark brows, gleaming behind a roguish curtain of jet black hair. His skin is pale, his features a strange mix of generous and sharp, with a pointed nose and wide, sensual mouth. A smile lingers on those lips that makes my toes curl. Oh wow. Hello. He sent five photos. Tall and muscular, he looks as good in a suit and tie at a club as he does in shorts at the beach. I stare at the drops of water gleaming like pearls across his broad chest and feel my mouth go dry. When I reach his last photo, I hesitate. In all these applications, I've seen just about everything, from genitalia to bizarre instructions from total strangers. But this one thing is unexpected. He's smiling softly as he bends down to put his arms around a small, dark-haired girl in a wheelchair who's so obviously his daughter that a lump forms in my throat. A single dad. It would be a package deal for the duration. And she's special needs. I have the ability to accommodate her easily, so that's no reason to exclude him. 
Besides, how can I say no kids when it's kids I want? So, instead of deleting his email, I open it up. Hi, my name's Daniel Fontaine. I hope you're doing well. I'm a single dad in my 30s. I live in New Orleans, where I own a small online investment firm and devote most of my free time to my daughter's care. I fit all your criteria, and you didn't mention having a problem with kids, so I thought I would give this a shot. He follows it up with a current medical report, STD test results, and a genetic profile, a very nice addition, though more information than I actually need. I read over the rest, my gaze jumping sometimes to the thumbnails of his photos. Their effect on me is startling. My cheeks get warm when I look at him. Shyly, I glance away and feel girlishly silly in doing so, as if the photograph is looking back at me. It's such an unexpected feeling it scares me a little, but a warmth stirs in my heart when looking at him smiling at his daughter easily counters that. It's not love at first sight, but I wonder what he'll be like in person if just an image leaves me this weak in the knees. Is he as kind as he seems in that photograph? Maybe he won't mind my awkwardness. And wary. What concerns me right now is the awkward part and the inexperience. I guess having an older child around would be good practice. Besides, I can hardly ask a man to leave his daughter home. I keep reading, deciding not to cut him out. I have included the results of my recent physical as well. If more information about my health is needed, I can supply it. I'm a practicing martial artist, I don't smoke and do not drink more than a beer or two a day. My family's Cajun and French and lives mostly on this continent. No health issues. A few smokers and one uncle who likes getting drunk but nothing serious. The sole cancer death in my family was mesothelioma from asbestos exposure. My daughter Caroline was disabled in an automobile accident three years ago. She is nine and undergoing physical therapy and surgeries in hopes she can walk again. Until then, she is confined to a wheelchair. I'm hoping this won't inconvenience you. It would, but that still isn't enough to delete his email. Instead, I bookmark it and move on. I decide to at least look through the remaining hundreds of emails, even as I know that Daniel has already set a high bar for the rest of them. By the time I turn in, I've narrowed the applicants down to a dozen of the hottest, most eligible men in southern Louisiana, but it's Daniel's smiling face I see when I close my eyes. Chapter 3 Daniel I start checking my emails every few hours, eagerly waiting to hear from a wealthy single woman from Baton Rouge, looking for a man to knock her up. My application was sent three weeks ago, and I was warned the response might take up to a month, but Caroline's legs have been aching so bad that I'm getting desperate. It took the dedicated work of two hackers, a private detective, and my own powers of persuasion to track down the mystery woman. Her fertility specialist gave up her name and details after a fat enough bribe. It hurt giving up the money, but if I play it right, I'll get it back a thousandfold. Amelie LaBelle, Louisiana's only female billionaire. A world-famous brilliant jewelry designer whose mining and production companies hold an enormous market share and who single-handedly erased the debts of over a quarter of a million locals last Christmas alone. Smart, talented, rich, powerful, and soft-hearted, not to mention one of the hottest women I have ever seen. Talk about my dream girl. Or at least, the closest I have seen since losing my wife. That's her. Jerry grins as he returns with two long necks from the kitchen. He's fair and chubby, with a perpetually boyish look, and is a house husband and new dad when not writing code, or tracking down people on my request. And she totally wants you, dude. I drink in the gorgeous Creole woman on the screen. Her elegant gown and tumbled dark brown curls give her the look of a Greek goddess. Her eyes are a soft golden brown, like good bourbon. Her lips set in a shy smile turn me on. Robust curves, a cute face, and a demure manner. What an intriguing combination. Damn I hope so. Her idea of a substantial bonus could pay for the rest of my baby's treatments. So how much for all of it? Jerry frowns as he settles back in his chair. His own twins are tiny and currently napping. 
The baby monitor sits next to his computer screen, showing their tiny curled forms. The remaining surgeries are $1.2 million, including physical therapy. Designing a brain-controlled assistive walking exoskeleton to retrain her brain and muscles means more time and cash, up to another quarter million. My voice goes grim. He takes a big sip of his beer. That's a chunk of change, even with the kind of scores you manage. You don't think the bonus for knocking this lady up will actually pay for all of it? No. But I'm hoping to persuade her to pay for it anyway. I'm very good at persuading people. In fact, it's my real business. He lets out a low whistle and turns back to the golden-eyed goddess on the screen. So what's your plan? Buy us time, I reply cryptically. After over a decade in my line of work, I know better than to let anyone in on all my plans. Buy myself time to convince her. It shouldn't take more than a few months. His eyebrows rise as he takes another drink. But your part will be over as soon as she's knocked up. How will you delay that? I smile. That's taken care of. I'll have at least until Christmas before having to worry about it. Christmas. Roughly 11 months away. Long enough to make sure my little girl got her legs back before the lovely Ms. LaBelle gets her baby. Anyway, everyone will walk away happy. If, of course, we walk away at all. Because that's my real ambition. Not only that my little girl walks again, I want to give her the life of a billionaire to make up for my mistake. I really want to see you pull this one off, dude. Jerry chuckles over the chorus hum of his computer equipment. How do you figure she'll choose you over everyone else? Because my net surfing friend, I'm exactly what she's looking for. If not, I'll find out what she secretly wants and will become that man. I hope she figures that out. Best of luck on this one, Danny boy. She's gonna be a tough nut to crack. He's looking at something on the screen besides her photo. I curse myself for getting hung up on her picture without reading to the end. No family on this continent, not much of a social life. You couldn't find a thing on her romantic life. He shakes his head. Bits and pieces, but nothing lasted more than a month. No signs of acrimony, she just stopped calling them and blocked them online. Reading over the details he has gathered on her, they are added to the database on Amelie LaBelle, building in my head from my various sources. She's not happy with confrontation, especially with men. Probably not Sherlock, but she didn't found and run so many companies because she's a wuss, or dumb. He scrolls to show me the rest. She does have relatives overseas, but they're not in contact. Isolated, non-confrontational, probably lonely as hell, but with a strong will and mind, a lot of money to burn, and one simple desire. No clue why she never married. He shrugs one rounded shoulder and burps. Not entirely, but if her romantic life's been unlucky and her standards are high, well. Better alone than miserable with someone, I muse. Exactly. He tilts his head. So, saying you get the job, how do you plan on keeping from impregnating her if you're wronging her nightly? I stare at him and reprimand him with a sharp, Jerry. Okay, okay, none of my business. Just curious. He looks at me nervously. I sigh, relaxing. It's fine. Leave that to me. Soon after that, the twins start crying. I help with a diaper change and give the poor guy some advice on properly giving a bottle. The two are cute, but from their thin blonde hair and round faces, they unfortunately have inherited their dad's looks. Hopefully, they'll also get his brains, but not his lack of social graces. I walk out into the steamy rain with a thumb drive of files on Amelie in my pocket and her soft smile in my head. There's still a chance my initial hook won't be as good as somebody else's, and she won't even respond, but it's definitely worth a shot. New Orleans in January is still a steam bath on days like today. The sky is low and a deep saturated gray-black with shadows of purple like massive bruises. Right now, all we have is soaking rain and the occasional whip of wind, but the feel of a real storm gathering behind it. Get home to my little girl. 
The wheels of my retired police car skid in the growing wind as the pavement becomes slippery from sheets of rain. I'm glad Caroline's not here. The skids and the way the wind rocks the big sedan would terrify her. If anything, she's an even more nervous passenger. It's the trauma. I'm not sure what to do besides the obvious. Soothe the nightmares, look after her when her upper back hurts, and do all I can to pay for every doctor's appointment. The bad memories and the growing levels of fear, those I don't know how to fix. Pulling into the lot at the extended stay place in Metairie, the rain is starting to turn into spatters of hail, and the sky is even darker. I get the cover onto the car and rush inside, hoping Caroline is holding it together until I am at her side. When I enter our forest-colored, blandly decorated suite, Caroline is curled up on her bed near the big windows, quietly watching the storm. Her thin, pale little legs are limply stretched out in front of her, and she's typing on her laptop, propped on a pillow beside her. She looks at me as I cross over to our small kitchen, her warm brown eyes so much like her mother's, it hurts to look into them. Hey, Dad, she says in a tired voice. Hey, sweetheart. Up for some lunch. She isn't doing well today. Shadows around her eyes, and she's paler than usual. She shakes her head, giving me a wan, apologetic smile. Sorry, Dad. The pain pills are really tearing up my stomach. I'm sorry, baby. Do you think you can get a nutrition drink down at least? It's our usual compromise when she can't eat. She licks her lips and nods. Okay, Dad. Strawberry. I sit by her as she labors away, sip by determined sip. When are we moving out of this place? She asks, as some of color returns in her cheeks. I'm almost healed from the last surgery. We don't have to stay, do we? I gently smile at her. She hates the residential hotel. It reminds her too much of our early days, when we were crammed into real hotels because there was little money and no honest work. I gave up honest work for her. She doesn't know where the money comes from. But she's right, we need a real home. I have a job lined up near Baton Rouge. It should pay well enough for the rest of your treatment. I don't want to get her hopes up too high, since it's not yet confirmed. She needs some hope so much right now. Maybe I do too. My back hurts today, Dad. Even with the pills. She presses her lips together and looks at me pleadingly. I gently pat her on the shoulder. It's the pressure changes from the storm. You're still recovering from where they fix those three vertebrae, so they'll be sensitive for a while. It'll get better. Soon you won't need so many pills. She sniffs. Will the pain ever go away? I close my eyes, wincing and hug her. We'll do everything in our power to make sure it does, honey. Even if that means seducing a billionaire for her money. Chapter 4 Amelie So Daniel Fontaine, my lawyer Gloria Chan, taps her narrow pursed lips with her fountain pen and peers at her laptop monitor does in fact own a small investment firm in New Orleans. No local properties. He's currently living in an extended-stay hotel in Metairie with his daughter, probably to be close to her physical therapist. I lean forward in the padded leather seat next to hers to peer at the screen. No criminal record? Not so much as a parking ticket. This guy's clean. And with the contract we just hashed out, he won't get away with much if you choose him. Legally, anyway. She smiles as she sits back for me to read. How was his daughter disabled? I ask suddenly. Am I sniffing out the possibility of him hurting her? Maybe he seems too good to be true. Car accident. Here's the police report. She opens another tab. Three years ago. His uncle Andrew was driving. He blew a .24 on a breathalyzer, three times the legal limit. My throat suddenly tightens. His wife died at the scene, his daughter paralyzed and with a shattered spine, Daniel with two badly broken legs. Andrew walked away without a scratch. Her normally cheerful tone has gone grim. Damn. Did he go to jail? Poor Daniel. And that poor poor kid. Yeah, died there 16 months later after being shipped in a riot. 
Daniel was his last living relative and never picked up his ashes. She eyes me. Can't actually say I blame him. Me neither, I breathe. He's trying to fix what happened. His daughter was robbed of her mom and the use of her legs because her great uncle lied about being sober. Gloria taps the pen between her fingers like ashes from a cigarette. If that was my kid, I'd do anything to fix it. What about the interview? I'm trying to keep calm. He was affable and polite. And startled when he learned who you were, the pay rate and the bonus. Given the medical bills he is facing, that might be the reason he is so eager. Her chair creaks as she leans back. Drawing a deep breath I feel an odd flush of warmth. It's been a crazy and weary few weeks since I read Daniel's first email. Now he's one of three finalists and the one I should not choose. He affects me too much. I may not be in full control with him around. Yet Sean or Aaron both seem like safe bets but also boring by comparison. Sean, a stable and predictable New Orleans architect and Creole like me, who would have gained my mother's approval in a heartbeat. And Aaron, a medical illustrator from Baton Rouge, already with two kids in his open marriage. They're both perfect. Neither one rings a single alarm. But neither one haunts my dreams like Daniel. Is something wrong, Amelie? My lawyer asks with an owlish tilt of her head. No, it's fine. I'll talk to him. See how it goes. Set up the first coffee date with Mr. Fontaine, I say confidently. Give him my private number, if he wishes to call me ahead of time. She presses her lips and looks at me silently for a few seconds, as if considering something, but finally just nods. I'll try to nail it down tomorrow afternoon, she says, and types in a few notes. Walking out into the misty afternoon, I hear a distant ambulance siren piercing the fog. Instantly I think, not of Daniel himself, but of his daughter, that little girl with shattered legs and spine, a little girl my money might be able to save. I should just offer whatever she needs. I've saved people before. Sometimes it's the only thing that keeps the loneliness at bay. This world is dark and cold, but I have gained the power to bring some light to it. I can't win the approval of my father's family, or bring back my mother, or find a man to love me. But if modern medicine can make that girl walk again, and only lack of money stands in the way, I could save a good-sized country's economy with my money. Who am I to refuse this one girl? This could work well for all of us. I get my baby, his medical bills get paid and his daughter gets her last surgery. The street is crowded despite the dreary weather. It's warm, my cream gauze duster and tank dress cling to me in the breeze. Walking, I feel another warmth rise up inside me again. He has a better reason than lust or greed to shack up with an unfamiliar woman and give her a baby. And I can't stop thinking about him. There's nothing wrong with the other two except they're not him. They're not Daniel. Someone does a test tug at my tan leather purse strap and I turn at once to see a retreating back and crop of dark hair. Ah, for a moment it escaped me how much I hate crowds. The good feelings distracted me, but not enough to fall prey to a pickpocket. Maybe I should go out with a driver instead of incognito, I think, returning to my small silver hybrid and settle into the driver's seat. But sometimes I wish to go unknown, quietly visit shops and go about my business. Fortunately, the tug at my purse strap is the worst thing to deal with until the safety behind my gates. Well that's that. My first pick among the finalists is having coffee here with me tomorrow. I stroll through my doorway. I stop, my heart suddenly pounding. Oh no. What to wear? Locking the door behind me, I hurry up the stairs into my dressing room, dashing past my startled butler. Is everything all right? Small sleek Edmund asks, his mild blue eyes narrowing in concern. Ah, stand by for a refreshment list for tomorrow's coffee and possibly an emergency call to my seamstress. My dressing room is organized meticulously by color and the jewelry set they were chosen to go with. Black with diamonds, opals and rubies, sea colors with sapphires and pearls, forest colors with emeralds, earth colors or white with turquoise and amber. The cloth is just a backdrop for the gems in their settings, my art and the source of my fortune. I've only worn about half of the outfits here. 
My mother took me shopping all the time while father was out on business trips, with his newest young secretary. We would come back hours later, laden with bags, and I would tuck them away and forget about them. I take the brown jasper and coral set and hang it up along with my belt and purse, discarding the outfit into the hamper, as I dive straight into a frenzy of trying things. Part of me thinks this is ridiculous. He's the one who should be trying to impress and attract me. It's my money and my decision. The rest of me wonders what his favorite color is. I finally settle on orchid purple and soft pink, a silk halter dress with an empire waist and a flowing skirt. It goes well with the set of pink jade flowers and purple tanzanite in rose gold. Two weeks just to carve those flowers. The carved rosebud dangles into my ample cleavage. Will he have the taste to appreciate it? What just happened worries me a little. This isn't a date. This is a business arrangement. Stop being so nervous. But I can't help it. And because the feeling is laced with an unfamiliar, giddy happiness, do I really want to? Chapter 5 Amelie The night was spent tossing and turning, second-guessing every decision about the arrangement, my clothes, the coffee service, everything. All morning was ridiculous, too nervous to eat, fussing endlessly with my hair and makeup, spending too much time choosing a perfume. I wait for Daniel, giddy and silly, as if, instead of arranging a human stud service, it's my first date with a new man. You haven't even met him. I check myself in the entryway mirror. You don't know what sort of man he is living under the same roof. He's clean of disease and Dr. Weiss confirmed he is healthy with a high count. Keep calm today and keep alert. Learn about the man himself. Returning to the armored foyer windows, I look out past the porch to the gate at the base of the small hill. He's not due after three times, annoyed I walk away. Oh come on. Amelie, you have all the command in this state of affairs. You're literally renting him out. He's in a financially desperate situation you'll solve, if he gets the job. You can have him tossed out in three seconds if need be. You don't have to impress him. Really. No matter how forcefully I tell myself that, the moment the gate intercom crackles, I jump to the control, allowing his old black sedan to enter. He drives up, parks, and comes to me in loping strides across the raked white gravel of the driveway. He's wearing a dark, well-tailored suit and a tie that matches his lovely pale eyes. He bounds up my porch steps with the eager energy of a more youthful man. I close my eyes, steadying my breath, reminding myself once again I am in control. He knocks. My eyes open and I move toward the door. I put on a small smile, ignore the urge to beam, ignore the equally strong urge to retreat into the depths of my home in a fit of shyness, and open the door. His face beams up sincerely and his gaze falls on me. Ms. LaBelle, he bows slightly. Am I late? He has a plain but well-maintained leather briefcase at his side. Right on the nose, Mr. Fontaine. Please come in. My office is upstairs. I step back to let him in, and watch his gaze flick around briefly to absorb the entrance before returning on me again. Thank you. His eyes twinkle as he passes me. My throat tightens as his scent hits me. Manly musk and hints of spicy cologne, easily detected in the heat, as he closely slips past. I close the door, trying to ignore its enticement. He walks toward the staircase, moving slowly as he looks around. My breath catches at the sight of his muscular back. The cloth straining across his shoulders makes me wonder what his muscles would feel like, tensing under my fingertips. I want this one. No one else will do. Welcome to my home. I sweep ahead of him, so the view won't make me stumble on my own staircase. Please follow me. Of course. His steps are surprisingly light. We get to the second floor, where my office door stands open with the fans running and gauze curtains drifting in the breeze. It's lovely, he comments as we walk. Is this a family property, or a purchase? It has been in my family, for over a century. Even his voice is attractive. Low and resonant, with a music to it. Does he know its power? or is he using it on purpose? He may be oblivious. His manner is pleasant and a touch flirtatious but opaque. 
examining his micro expressions, would get me gazing at him. How does that make me feel? Worse, he might notice. He cannot learn how much influence he already has over me. When his eyes twinkle at me, it feels like I'm about to float. That's bad. It's nothing I can afford. Money. No problem. My heart. That I have to guard. My poor mother was a miserable example. You do right by our family. Make us a success. Those snotty jerks think we can't make good on our own now that your daddy's dead. I paid dearly to make sure you could have a future with all the money you could ever need. Now go make me proud. She paid dearly. In tears, in humiliation, in my father's infidelities and lies. She stuck it out, never divorced him, to ensure my future. And I went out, worked hard, succeeded and made her proud. My child will do the same as I will, provided the love, a fortune and a duty to those of us who came before. The thoughts take some of my dizziness away, I focus back on my guest, leading him to the office door. Before coffee, I'll conduct a private interview that will take about 15 minutes. We'll start with questions you might have and go from there. How am I keeping my voice so even? As you wish, he says simply and follows me inside. I settle in at the desk and he sits across, flinging one leg over his knee and folding his hands over it. He looks completely at home. I'm not sure what to say for a moment. Fortunately, he's content to fill the silence. Why are you having a child this way, instead of going to a laboratory? I understand it could have been handled discreetly, and that you would have been able to pick the genetic traits of your donor. His voice is gentle, but his curiosity makes freezes my smile. Many reasons. So many tears shed over those reasons. You're very direct. No annoyance or defensiveness, just stating a fact. It's best we are honest with each other, he replies in a quiet earnest tone. My daughter's life will be greatly affected, for good or bad. Let's be sure there are no miscommunications or knowledge gaps that might lead to problems. Of course. My cheeks are getting warm. The practical part of my mind wonders if his daughter is an excuse to be nosy, but he has a point. Does she know why you would move here? She knows I'll do some work for you, but not the nature of the work. She's only nine, and may not understand her daddy putting himself out to stud. He says this as smoothly and pleasantly as everything else, catching me completely by surprise. He looks at me, and the warm twinkle of humor disarms me completely. A moment later, he continues more seriously, now about my question. I swallow and nod, nervously pushing out an answer. A lot of women who hire a man to impregnate them, want to know the father at least on a basic level. Not to force any more involvement, but rather. Is that your reason? I'm not interested in a general answer. His voice sharpens just the tiniest bit, and my throat tightens a little. Yes. A large part of it anyway. A more traditional approach is not possible. Nor do I want to treat conception like. I hesitate. How do I tell a stranger going to a clinic felt like giving up? I couldn't even make a call for an appointment. How barren and sad it felt when I contemplated it. I want a child by a man's touch, not by a test tube. Would a strange man understand that? like a mere medical procedure. I look awkwardly out the window, over his shoulder. A flock of small dark birds obscures the view for a moment as it rises into the misty sky. A sudden stab of melancholy comes over me, so deep that I can't look at him for a few moments. He need not know about my sad romantic life. He doesn't need an explanation of every how and why. He's a stranger. One who has enough information to trust me, but the deep loneliness behind my decision that he will not learn. He may just take advantage if he does. You look gloomy, he comments, and my attention goes back to him in embarrassment. Shit. I'm fine. I take a moment to focus and look up as calmly as possible. Do you have any further questions? Yes. What will my schedule look like? His voice is gentle, but with the confidence of a man who already has the job. I can't resent it. It does, however, make me worry my emotions are easy for him to read. 
hours. I cough into my fist, blinking rapidly, realizing I never considered the specifics of our conjugal visits. Ten to two nightly, I say finally. The rest of the day is yours, except for a few medical visits. He nods. Dr. Weiss? Yes. I'm assuming you'll need time for clients and your daughter's school commute and medical visits. Yes, and physical therapy. Is this place accessible? His brows draw together, his tone and manner that of a concerned dad. It's even more disarming. There's a personal elevator that was put in for my mother after her health declined. I'll arrange for Caroline to have the bedroom next to it. Now I'm doing it, talking as if this is a done deal. He nods in satisfaction. Ah, good. So, ten to two. Barring emergencies, yes. He looks more amused. My stomach flutters. Is he considering what to do to me first? Sometimes my daughter has a rough night but barring that. He strokes his chin and then flashes a brief naughty grin that makes my toes curl in my pumps. Four hours though. Nightly. I refuse to be knocked off balance by this amazing, intoxicating man. Yes. Until we can confirm a pregnancy. The twinkle in his eyes becomes a gleam. I've always wanted to test my stamina. Why did you choose me, anyway? My mouth goes dry. Tell him he's the only one among them I think about at night. He's the only one I want to be with. There are actually three finalists. But you chose me first, he observes. I lick my lips instead of answering. His eyes narrow in amusement. Do I have an advantage over the others? Trembling my gaze sweeps over him. When our eyes meet, the searing heat of his interest makes me realize the other two finalists do not matter. I want Daniel. And he knows it. Besides meeting all my criteria, the dedication to your daughter was particularly notable. The half-truth sounds weak an excuse. It's not as common among fathers. His sly smile fades and he tilts his head in curiosity. It depends on the dad. I know several who would walk through fire for their kids. And every single one of them makes me jealous. But never mind that. That is true. I simply don't have experience, so found it notable. He watches me silently. In that moment, it dawns upon me what I have admitted. Suddenly, I'm a little frightened. I have no control around this man. Well, that's it for my questions. Do you have any for me? He tucks his hands behind his head, broad chest flexing under his sleek suit, eyelids lowering like a contented cat's. I'll let you know. Your advance is $50,000 plus expenses. You'll receive it upon move-in, in in cash if you prefer. I hesitate, then find myself offering more than intended. If you need assistance with medical bills during that time, let me know and we can work something out. His eyes light up. I appreciate that. I relax. He's not manipulative. He's just a dad jumping at a chance for his daughter. Would you like to come down for coffee now? Absolutely. Mind if I take it iced? I'm parched. He winks as he rises from his seat. Of course. Chapter 6 Amelie Iced coffee with muddled mint leaves, chocolate and cream swirled into them. The tall glasses sit between us, as we take seats on my beloved balcony. In two silver bowls, thin slices of chocolate cake support fans of strawberry atop clouds of whipped cream. A pyramid of finger sandwiches, mostly smoked salmon with cream cheese and cucumber, sits on a plate by the desserts. I could get used to this, Daniel says, saluting me with his glass before taking a long sip. His eyes squint with pleasure, his muscular throat works and my fingertips want to reach and feel his skin. You live in this palace by yourself? Our family used to be much larger, I reply quietly and he goes silent, focusing on his drink as I watch him. If it's the family home, it would feel weird selling it and living somewhere else. He grabs a sandwich and bites into it with a grunt of enjoyment. That's exactly it. That. And honestly, my father's family has gone back overseas, so it's up to me and my descendants to fill this place up. The coffee gives me a rush of energy, 
I've barely eaten since this date, er, appointment. I'm starting to understand where you're coming from, he muses, seeming intrigued. Or is it just projection? I hope not. I do have a couple more questions now that I've thought about it, he starts, setting down his glass. Where's my room? That depends on your preference, I say very carefully, aware of my heartbeat picking up. There are six bedrooms on this level besides mine and your daughter's. And I'm still talking like he's got the job. Is he calling the shot or are my hormones? You're probably used to sleeping alone. I do my best not to bristle. I'm a very light sleeper. Again, no point in getting into details. Understandable. So this place, can we use its facilities while we live here? You have a pool. Swimming is good for my girl's rehab. Would that pose a problem? He's a little tentative, and I am less worried by my own vulnerability. Absolutely not, so long as someone is supervising, she may use the pool whenever she likes. The sandwiches are on slivers of toasted sourdough, sprinkled with dill seeds, they crunch pleasantly between my teeth. Maybe it's all right, we're acting like it's a done deal. This is comfortable, aside from my ridiculous shyness. He's thoughtful, he seems to like me, we get along all right, and I want him in my bed. Maybe the last part is the most important, the primal instinct that overrides intelligence and leaves me impatient to hold him. The part that wants a child of his blood, his out of six thousand men. I nibble on the treats and watch him eat as we chat, he tells me about his daughter, her love of drawing, how much she wants to settle somewhere and have a dog. I tell him about the house, the few off-limits places, mostly the kitchen and my jewelry workshop as well as my bedroom, and about my own schedule. So you've taken a partial hiatus from your company? He leans forward and puts his chin in his hands. Who runs the show in your absence? I still have the final decision, but the board handles most day-to-day -day issues for the next two years. It might not be the most ambitious move, but my mother would understand. My shareholders were less sympathetic, but I'm still the majority stockholder, and what I say goes. What are you hoping for? That smile. Stop it. It's too sweet, too warm and too sensual. I want to see it every day. Um, raising a girl would probably be simpler since what she'll be going through will be familiar to me. But any child is a blessing. That's the most diplomatic response I can offer. Daughters can be a handful. I try to be a good dad, but I'll be out of my depth the moment she hits puberty. He laughs ruefully and I laugh with him. It feels really good. You don't have a boyfriend who will get jealous, do you? He asks in that same mild tone. One tapered fingertip nips up a bit of cream from his dessert and then disappears between his smirking lips. The sight of a brief pink flick of his tongue catches my attention and I look away. No, I haven't been, that is. How does he do this to me? I busy myself draining the last of my coffee from the melting ice cubes. Calm down. I don't date, I finally manage. He tilts his head in a curious, almost animalistic way, his pale eyes staring unblinkingly into mine. Why? I catch one of the ice cubes between my teeth and bite down on it. It grinds between my teeth and goes down my throat. I suddenly want to tell him it's none of his business. But instead, it wasn't going well, is uttered. For a split second concern darkens his eyes and he looks away again, mortified. I despise pity, like my mother. He doesn't ask about my dreadful romantic life. Instead in a gentle warm tone that comes out smooth as honey, you must have a case of skin famine. I look back at him, eyes wide, and see him licking a bit more cream off his finger with a naughty gleam in his eye. Skin famine? Skin hunger. The need to be touched. Most of us have it, at least to some degree. I suppose, I murmur, suddenly very uncertain again. Warmth and a weight fill me up, and his hand gently covers mine. Maybe I can be of some help there too. I start trembling again. His fingertips caress the back of my hand, sending jolts to the pit of my belly. The way you look at me. I'm eager to get started on that baby if you are. Oh God. I. Don't tell me you're not curious. He stands. I get up as well and he moves closer, looming over me, 
his masculine scent clinging to my nostrils. I don't imagine you'll want to spend months trying for a baby with someone who doesn't know how to make one. His sudden intensity catches me off guard. Breathless, I stare into his eyes as he squeezes my hand and draws me so close his shivery breath is on my cheek. His powerful body brushes against mine, and his free hand slides up my arm in a light caress. Sure you wouldn't like a taste? His voice is low, full of heat. I stare mutely back at him, astonished by his bold proposal, and by how appealing it seems. When it comes to doing anything physical with a man, I've always taken it slow, glacially slow. My stomach contracts with a flood of shyness. Tell him to go away. Make up an excuse. He's just a finalist, he hasn't won yet. But he has. When I first looked at his photograph, when I thought of him every night, when he proved time and again that he's exactly what I'm looking for. Not just a donor for the child I crave, but a partner for the duration. I wrestle with myself, close enough that his warmth settles against my skin like summer sunbeams. And then, then he does the worst thing possible. He reaches out for me and wraps me in his arms, his broad chest becoming my pillow. Come here. No don't I think, a moment before he cradles the back of my skull, as the warmth inside my chest spreads through me. Don't be so sweet. Too late. He holds me, tenderly enough that I could break his grip, but I melt against him instead. He's warm and solid and his hand slides up and down my back in a stroke that leaves me weak in the knees. Oh, I murmur, feeling his burly back under my palms and his heartbeat against my chest. It's been so long since anyone held me that my heart aches. And I can't remember a man being this tender. A faint rattle of him pushing aside my plates before he returns to stroking my back. Every caress leaves me warmer and looser, the ache slowly burning away as the heat of his touch brings my focus to the present. Not in my sad past but now, in my mansion, with a man who will do anything to me that I want. I look up at him and his kiss steals my breath. It felt lovely. But I don't actually want to sleep with him, on top of the balcony table. And he's too much the gentleman to take it there. So, he purrs as he helps me onto my feet. Where do I sign and when can we move in? I take a shivery breath. My lawyer will send the release forms to your hotel tonight. I manage, sounding fragile and completely enthralled. He smiles, conquest gleaming in his eyes. Chapter 7 Daniel I want a crow, wheeling Caroline up the newly installed wheelchair ramp and onto the porch of our new home. Her eyes are so wide. Is this where we'll be staying? She breathes in amazement. Yep, for at least six months. I'm hoping for longer. It depends on how much work Amelie's got for me. And by work, I mean keeping her good and seduced. But you need not know that, honey. So, Miss LaBelle's will let us stay through the rest of my surgeries too. She sounds hopeful and less tired than in months. Hope is a heck of a drug. Also, not having to live on hotel food in a small suite with few services, nothing to do but watch TV and nowhere to go. Yes, at least that. She wants to make sure you are comfortable here. I almost feel a bit guilty. It's clear that under the stiff guardedness, Amelie is a very kind-hearted woman. She doesn't deserve to be used. On the other hand, she probably won't mind if I parlay a few extra months of good company into working legs for my daughter. She doesn't have to know our prolonged affair is intentional. Only how good I can be for her. I'll take your belongings upstairs. Amelie's butler, in all the excitement I've already forgotten his name, bows his neat balding head and transfers our suitcases to a small luggage cart. I nod distractedly. Thank you. Caroline says, and he smiles politely, but his eyes twinkle. Likes kids, huh? That's a good sign. Though honestly, I can't imagine Amelie hiring anyone who doesn't. I had it in the bag the moment our lips met. That little tremor that went through her, the way she stretched against me, the way her hand slid up my back. The disappointment in her eyes when I let go. Keeping the surprise from Caroline for a day and a half was rough but it's all paid off now. I've won and she's delighted. 
When Amelie appears at the top of the stairs, a fat folder and a pair of keys in her slender hand, my gaze slides over her hungrily. She's in a sea-green dress to complement the cluster of sapphires and emeralds at her throat. The silk clings to her, its layers fluttering around her like butterfly wings. Tonight, I think, and then quickly push that out of my mind before it arouses me in front of my daughter. Welcome, Amelie says. Her gaze drops to my daughter and she smiles. I'm Amelie LaBelle. Has your father told you about me? Not all that much. But of course, Caroline has done her research anyway. You're the jewelry billionaire. You still make your designs. Is Dad doing your investments? Caroline's tone is bright and probing. Amelie blinks in surprise. He is assisting me in one of my future ventures, she says carefully, and I relax. She's not the best liar, but she's trying to keep from confusing or upsetting my daughter. I'm really glad you're letting us stay here, she replies, changing the subject. She's already sensed there's more to this, but she's not the nosy type. Otherwise, I would have been in trouble years ago. I have more than enough room, and I have grown tired of living alone. Amelie smiles sadly for a moment before her expression brightens. Well, let's give you the tour and get you settled in your rooms. She's all business again, despite her warmth toward Caroline. Her voice is smooth, her manner unruffled. She's in control again, and it only tempts me more. The gentle-hearted, desperately lonely woman hiding inside this cool, competent heiress and businesswoman intrigues me. But her carefully cultivated act has an appeal. One would never know how quick she was to tremble and cling to me. And this will be your room, Caroline, Amelie says, far too long later. She opens the double doors leading to Caroline's suite and shocks me. The entire room has been redone in the same shades of blue as the outfit Caroline wore in the photo I forwarded. There's an adjustable bed with space on either side for her wheelchair, an accessible bathroom, a television, computer, and snack fridge. I stare at Amelie as Carline lets out a cry of delight and smiles mischievously, her nose wrinkling. Oh wow! This is amazing! Caroline rolls in, looking around with even wider eyes. She turns to Amelie, as if half expecting it's a joke. Are you sure? Of course. Amelie's smile warms, more of her kindness coming out in her expression. I will need your father at odd hours, and both you and he should be comfortable for the interval. Um, thank you. I don't really know what to say. She sounds a little choked up. Amelie notes this immediately and moves toward the door to give us some privacy. I'll let the two of you settle in. Daniel, I'll be in my rooms when you're done. She leaves and I turn to my daughter, who is still processing all of this. Dad, is this really happening? I get all of this. And the surgeries and no more hotels. For as long as I can manage, yes. And by the time we leave, we should have enough to get us a small house somewhere. Or, if the lovely young heiress gets wrapped around my finger enough, we can stay forever. As I help my daughter unpack into the low wardrobe, we talk about the rest of the day. She wants time to herself. Her back hurts, and the pain pills are making her groggy again. Once she's in her sweatpants and t-shirt and settled on her new bed, I kiss her forehead and smile at her. You need anything before I check with the boss. We'll have dinner later, right? Yeah, probably the three of us. You'll love it. The food here is great. Good. I got tired of room service. I make sure she's resting comfortably before stepping out. I cross the hall to my room next to the enormous master bedroom. It's luxuriant and masculine, dominated by a mammoth wood frame bed. I toss my coat on top and make sure my bags are here. Then I eagerly walk out again. But right now, all that is gravy. The real fortune is waiting on the other side of this door, and every instinct tells me to go there and make her mine. I'll spoil her. I'll make her feel so good that she'll have more trouble letting me go. I gently knock on her door and put on my softest smile as Amelie opens it. Caroline's napping. I step inside. She nods and closes the door behind me. 
She gasps as I brush against her, and I turn so quickly that it's almost a reflex. I take her in my arms, and the money, the keys, the long con, even Caroline, all slip out of my mind. There is only Amelie, and her body pressed eagerly against mine. Chapter 8 Amelie I can't remember how we get across the room. Daniel carries me while he is kissing my breath away. I close my eyes, drifting off blissfully. I chose right. You are the one. But even as I slide into sleep, there's a pang of sadness and regret as he slips out of bed and leaves. What it will be like when he leaves for good? That's a long time away. I turn my face to the pillow. Chapter 9 Daniel That didn't go as intended. It was amazing, but I might be in trouble. It's raining again. By the time I can drag myself out of Amelie's bed and put my clothes back on. My legs are wobbly, I'm thirsty and starved, and yet I'm more relaxed than in years. Damn, I'm thinking, while pulling my pants back on over tingling skin. I've done well. She was satisfied, in ways any woman in her position would be desperate for. Women like this don't just want a test tube baby. Otherwise, why get a stud instead of a lab visit and some hand-picked donor? Maybe it's oversimplifying things, but I was right when it comes to Amelie. She wants more of this. I pull on my shoes and turn to get out of the room. With good companionship, she'll fall for me. For certain. I step out of the door, quietly close it, and lean against the wall just outside, watching the rain through a hall window, gathering my strength. I swore to do anything to make up for what my stupidity cost Caroline even make a billionaire fall in love with me. Whatever else happens, at least Amelie will be distracted and pleased long enough to pay for the surgery, the exoskeleton, and anything else to help Caroline. There's something else, though. If I get another boner soon, I will be right back in that room and on her in seconds. And she will love it. And I will love it, too. And that's risky. It's dodgy, and you know better. It's not actually a temptation, not for a while at least. She got everything, light and tingly from knees to belly. I emptied myself in her and enjoyed every second of it. I've never felt this much intensity with a woman, ever. Even my wife, Mariah, the mother of my child. The woman who took all the light out of my life when she passed. The years with Mariah were wonderful, loving and optimistic despite our financial struggles. They were full of her kindnesses. Her past left her shy, and I was always tender with her. Despite my enduring love, this level of sheer intoxication was unknown to me before Amelie. I squeeze my eyes shut. What the hell is going on? The seduction is going perfectly. Amelie is having so much fun, she doesn't want my visit to end. It's only my opening move, but she's taken to it even more than expected but it's supposed to be one-sided. My feet need to remain on the damn ground to maintain control of this situation. Otherwise, it could all come crashing down. I walk down to the kitchen, enjoying Amelie's scent clinging to my skin. The place is bigger than some restaurant kitchens, with stainless steel and copper counters, a walk-in freezer, and a pantry bigger than the bedroom of my hotel suite. I grab a pitcher of filtered water from the fridge and drain it, Glass after thirstily gulp glass, as I create a towering deli sandwich for myself. Am I dissing Mariah, by getting so turned on with another woman? But then I smirk and dismiss the thought. Holy shit, okay. Stop being emo and get some clarity. If it naturally turns into a relationship, all the better. But until the situation is established, I can't fall for her. Taking a seat at the breakfast table, I take massive bite of my sandwich, chewing rapidly. Lightning flashes outside, and the rumble of thunder comes several seconds later. If she's happy enough, she may not notice or care. But I can't lose my head in the process. My phone rings when I'm halfway through the sandwich. Dr. Weiss is calling using the burner phone I gave him. Afternoon, Doc, I say in a mellow voice, ignoring the apprehension in my gut. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Fontaine. I trust that you and your daughter are properly installed at Ms. LaBelle's mansion. Weiss has an arch, cold tone to his voice that makes my eyes narrow. I put my sandwich down on the plate. Yes, thanks, she's napping. How can I help you today? I already identified, and the very thought sends my blood pressure rising. It's regarding these tests. My career is at risk by falsifying records for you, he says in the same snippy tone, now with an edge of glee. How much extra is this going to cost? Go on. An additional 50,000. I break into a dry little laugh. Shit, man, do you have a payment coming up on your yacht or something? I want to squeeze his neck with both my hands. How the bribe money is spent is none of your concern, Mr. Fontaine. His voice gets cold and arrogant. Defensive, the jerk knows he's being greedy. And if I say no? A faint, sharp intake of breath as I challenge him. You will have your recent vasectomy exposed and end up jailed for fraud, he says mechanically, as if reading a script. How much time and whiskey did it take this jerk to get the nerve to call me? Do you really plan to drop the dime when it will implicate you as well and ruin your career? A long silence follows. I smirk and take another bite of my sandwich, chewing while waiting for a reply. Those are my terms, he says in the same mechanical tone. There's brittle ego behind it, and I smile. Look, Doc, you're allotted a fortune to help Amelie get a healthy baby, which she will get just with some delay. You're also paid to hide my vasectomy for six months or so until it's reversed. By Christmas she'll have a solid pregnancy, you'll have your cash, and we'll go our separate ways. Why mess with such a good deal? I ask reasonably. He's silent again. Savagely, I bite into the sandwich and chew. Give in. I have more money than you and can afford better lawyers, he ventures, and I roll my eyes. That's not true any longer, remember. I gently reply. He huffs twice and hangs up. I close my eyes and sigh, trying to control the rush of adrenaline. I don't like being threatened. Or blackmailed. Fortunately, Weiss doesn't know what he's doing, and seems to realize that squeezing me for more cash didn't go as planned. It worries me. Doctors have a superiority complex. It makes them overconfident. It could mess up all our lives if he messes up. That would mean jail for me, a broken heart, and lost hope for my daughter. I will kill that little jerk before that happens. Blackmail out of greed escalates as long as the greedy person has something on you. If I encourage him, Weiss will make the same damn call every month or so, bleeding me of the money for Caroline's surgery. Now, I've forced him to consider how his plan to penalize me will mess him up as well. Still, his sense of revenge. Doctors hate being outsmarted by anyone who doesn't have letters following their name. I finish my sandwich, watching the storm, trying to figure out what to do. Maybe go back to Dr. Parikh get the gel flushed out, and make a liar out of Weiss before he has the chance to rat on me. I take a deep breath as lightning flashes beyond the windows. That would be easier said than done. Parikh will not be back in town for a few months. Maybe find someone else. A faint pang of guilt overcomes me as I rise to put my plate in the sink. I wish this shit never happened. I'd rather go back to building houses. But building houses won't pay enough to treat my daughter, thanks to gluttonous doctors like Weiss. Neither will small investment commissions. My options have been limited since the night my uncle pulled out his car keys and ruined our lives with his lies. Amelie doesn't have to get hurt. She never has to know. She'll get what she wants and barely miss the money. If we get more out of this, if we live here on a permanent basis, me, my wife, and Caroline, it's even better. Either way, I have to pull it off flawlessly, or everything will come crashing down. Caroline's worth the risk, I remind myself, going back upstairs to check on her. But that tiny pang of guilt is haunting me. Chapter 10 Amelie How long have you been making jewelry? Caroline asks as I set down my polishing cloth. 
I've moved my portable work table out to the screened porch to finish off a few pieces. My workshop sometimes feels claustrophobic when the weather is nice. Daniel's daughter wheels over. We're fast becoming friends, and I smile at her approach. Especially since she's often exhausted. Right now, she's somewhat pale but much better. She moved while recovering from her latest surgery. She never did more than quietly complain about pain. She's such a trooper. Daniel shows his pride in her frequently as well. He's such a good dad. What would it be like if he stuck around, to be a dad to my child too? I smile wistfully at nothing, and turn my head hastily to answer. Ah, my grandmother taught me how to knot pearl necklaces when I was 16, and it's sort of built on that. It's been a month since they moved into my life and the days have rushed by. I was worried having people in my space would bother me long term, but it's wonderful. No more loneliness gnawing inside of me, a sensation that has never been comfortable. Why do you have to put a knot between each pearl anyway? She gazes at the amber, jet, and fossil piece I've been polishing. Is it so they won't slide off if the string breaks? That's part of it. Chasing after lost pearls is not fun. Nothing rolls under furniture faster. I hold up the heavy necklace and watch the cherry amber light up in the sun. The other reason is that pearls are delicate, and the knots keep them from rubbing together and damaging one another. Her eyes light up. Oh, so it's like a padding. Exactly. You're quite clever, Caroline. How are you feeling today, anyway? I set the necklace down. Well, it hurts, but it's different. Before it hurt, and I couldn't move that part of my back. Now I can move it, but it hurts lower now. She wiggles, then winces. You don't have to show me, honey. I'm sorry it hurts, but did you feel anything there before? She shakes her head. No. And I'd rather hurt for a while than feel nothing at all. That's usually best. Dad says they'll give me robot pants so I can walk again, she says solemnly, and I have to stifle a giggle. It's an exoskeleton, sweetheart. You wear it over your pants. Your daddy told me about it. It seems pretty high tech and amazing. When he first brought it up, I offered to further fund the program. Taking blood money out of gem mining made me rich. Investing in medical technology to help people walk again is good for my soul. How can something like that teach me to walk again? She tilts her head. It is controlled by your thoughts, and it moves the legs for you so your muscles and joints remember what walking is like. That way your muscles will stay strong, maybe strong enough that you won't need the exoskeleton one day. Will I be able to feel my legs or just move them? She looks down at her legs, which are scarred and thin. Once you get the last of those bone fragments away from where they're pressing on your spine, you should feel more, if not everything. Am I explaining this well? Living with Caroline has been a crash course in living with a kid. She's smarter and more mature than most nine-year-olds, but she's still a kid and sometimes my inexperience with children really shows. She's always asking what the $10 word I just used means, for example. She's adjusting but I could do so more myself. I don't want to upset her. She's had a very rough time and I care about her. Besides, her daddy dotes on her and anything that might drive him away is the last thing on my mind. That man is candy. I can't get enough. And even though he's being paid, nobody pays him to spoil me like this. What's the hardest part of jewelry making? Caroline peers at the necklace but is thoughtful enough not to touch. Most jewelry is made of metal, and metals are tough to work with. You have to use smelly fluxes and polishes, heat them up and bang on them, all kinds of things. It's fun to see it come together, but it's stinky and hard on the hands. Sounds like physical therapy, she sighs. But the docs say you're doing much better, I remind her. Yeah. I just get frustrated sometimes, she admits. When you're doing the exercises, it's all boring. And I still hurt. But reading my journal, it used to hurt much worse. I nod, my smile frozen on my face. She should never have gone through this. But here she is, toughing her way through with barely a complaint. Are you and dad getting along, she asks. I blink, yanked out of my line of thinking. I know it's selfish, she replies a little sadly. 
But I don't want to leave again. We're always changing where we live. And I hate hotels. Oh, don't worry about that, I reassure her at once, trying to push the memory of her dad pinning me to the shower wall out of my head before blurting something embarrassing out. I enjoy the company. Caroline smiles and relaxes a little. I smile back and return to work, answering her bright questions as I go. Dr. Weiss is strangely cold and short at my checkup. His mouth is a line, and his normally pleasant demeanor is subdued. Is he feeling well? No signs of pregnancy yet, I'm afraid, he says apologetically. Any changes in your menstruation? It's been a bit erratic. I assumed it was from stress. He nods. It might well be. I suggest you boost your intake of broad spectrum B vitamins and D and try to get more sleep. Have you cut back on work hours? He's taking notes on his pad, occasionally glancing at me. Why do his eyes look so cold? I'll do that. It's only been a month and a half. There are a dozen reasons to keep Daniel and his daughter around, at least through Christmas. Even if there's no bun in the oven yet. Besides, these things often take time. A few of my girlfriends took years before they managed a successful pregnancy. And it's not a problem having Daniel and his daughter around. Quite the contrary. In spite of that, it troubles me now and makes me wonder if things will work. Maybe it's not about a pregnancy. It's my fertility specialist's odd manner. Is something wrong, Dr. Weiss? He stares at me for several moments, as if considering something. Then he pulls the corners of his mouth in a fake smile and says, No, not at all. Have a good day, Ms. LaBelle. Daniel is congenially chatting with Weiss's aging, sweet-faced receptionist when I come out. About his daughter, of course. Yes, she's strong enough now to do physical therapy daily and she has more mobility in her back. The receptionist beams. She'll always be in my prayers. But here's your wife now. You two have a lovely day. She has no idea of our true relationship, and I feel a strange reluctance to correct her. Thanks so much. You too. I reply as Daniel offers me his arm. How did it go? Daniel asks quietly as we walk out. Nothing yet, but that's not really a surprise. It's only been six weeks, after all. I keep my voice light. In the back of my head, I am wondering why Dr. Weiss glared and scowled his way through the entire exam. We're both healthy, so it shouldn't take forever. Making a baby can actually take a fairly long time. It took us about six months to conceive Caroline. His hand brushes mine and I take it almost reflexively. You're likely right. I'll worry more about it in a few months. I am realizing that having a baby and raising a child is complicated, and I am also not eager for Daniel to leave. There is a look of relief in his eyes as he steps forward to unlock the car door for me. Chapter 11 Daniel Spring is here and with it another surgery. Caroline has less pain with each week that goes by. It's not just the surgeries and physical therapy now. It's living somewhere where she can roll around, be in the sun, Swim and not be someplace that reminds her of our desperate days. She's happy now. She wakes up smiling each morning. Amelie is doing well too. It's certain that she's happy. I don't know if she's fallen for me yet. As for me, well, I'm a wreck. But a productive wreck, and they're both happy, so something is going right. Do you want me to come with you? Amelie asks over breakfast. She knows me too well already. Every time my little girl goes under the knife, it wrecks my nerves and she can tell. It's no big deal. It's my worry to wrestle with, and she's getting too far under my skin as it is. Even Caroline is calm about the surgery. She's gotten experienced at this, always my little hero. I'm just pretending. I'm used to doing it by myself, and have no business leaning on Amelie, especially with what I'm doing to her. Sure, if you don't mind. Why did I say that? But that's just how it's going for me lately. Amelie may not have fallen for me yet, but I'm fighting not to fall for her. 
I doubt it'll succeed. No problem, she replies, smiling softly. Caroline is sleeping later. She can't eat before her surgery. I busy myself with huevos rancheros while trying to sort out my thoughts. That, and the damn guilt from every single time Amelie does something kind that I don't deserve. I got into this, supposing she was a typical billionaire, with a touch more ethics. It's true, she will barely miss the money. But she never deserved to be the target of a con. Amelie seems to disprove every assumption I've ever made about her. From her heartbreaking loneliness to her genuine kindness, she's more than big-hearted in that I'm rich and afford to be generous way. She cares about people, even though so many of them have been rotten to her. The more she does that, and the more attached I get to her, the more like a piece of shit I feel. Here I am lying and hiding the fact I'm on birth control to draw out time with her, and yet I'm learning she would probably help us anyhow. Jeez, I'm a damn heel. Is something wrong? She asked me softly. You know, you don't have to care so much. She looks hurt, and I start to suspect how attached she's gotten. It should make me feel triumphant, another hint I've won her heart. Instead, it makes me feel even worse. Sorry, does it bother you? She asks in a smaller voice. I look at her, and then smile wryly. Bother. No. It's flattering. My eyebrows bounce on the last bit, and I don't hide the gleam in my eyes. She smiles and blushes, looking at the table. So we can't be friends then? The contract you signed did not say a thing about that. I just don't want to disappoint you. What she doesn't know can't hurt her, but every damn day that goes by chews holes in me. I deserve this. But if I stop now, as soon as she gets a positive pregnancy test, my job's done and with it my chance to make sure my daughter gets everything she needs. I never wanted to be a criminal in the first place. But like this job, the last job, it's all been forced on me. It was either this, or Caroline suffering for the rest of her life. Because of her dead piece of shit great uncle, and because of me. Amelie scoffs. Disappoint me. So far you've done the opposite at every turn. That's good to hear. And indeed, nothing in the paperwork says we can't be friends. Hell, it's probably better if we are. I smile charmingly and drop the subject and eat my breakfast, not tasting a single bite. There are currently three bone fragments remaining pressing against your daughter's spinal cord. The cord was not severed. Instead, it has been severely pinched. As we previously discussed, it's partial spinal damage. Dr. Bryant is a small, bird-like woman with fluffy gray-blonde hair cut to jaw length, currently twittering information to me from behind her big steel boat of a desk. This is why she has bladder and bowel control and has regained some sensation. We don't know how much control of her legs she will have by removing the fragments. However, if her progress continues as it has in the last 18 months, chances are she'll eventually graduate to a cane. Not good enough. Thank you, doctor, I say with a smile. So how many of the slivers will be removed today? I spent 15 minutes before this meeting calming Caroline down and holding her hand as she drifted off from the anesthetics. The whole time, she actually seemed calmer than I was inside. Watching her prepped for surgery always makes my stomach feel like a million crickets are jumping around inside. I stayed tough for her, I always do. But the doctor's last-minute briefings, though well-intentioned and more information than other doctors give, aren't fun to sit through. It would help if I wasn't so imaginative. I've been to bloody surgeries before, but it's never amusing thinking of someone cutting into your child's back. Two are close to one another. We'll be able to remove them with retractors and a laparoscope. The third will require a final surgery. Otherwise, we'll have to make a larger incision which means keeping her up to a week and potentially losing progress on her rehabilitation. I sigh. What about the exoskeleton? Not my department, although our prosthesis expert has done some research. Your specialist, Dr. Grace, should be returning in mid-July, in time so Caroline recovers from the last surgery. She smiles almost mechanically. Of course, by then we'll be running into summer vacation. 
He may want to delay. I exchange glances with Amelie, who has been sitting quietly beside me. She's the one insisting on writing the check, so it's her concern too. Does Dr. Grace have a forwarding number? She speaks up suddenly. She has her cool, all-business tone, and the doctor straightens up and looks at her. He does, if you wish to discuss faster arrangements. She starts fishing in her desk drawer for a card, as Amelie nods. I can make a deal to get her completely fitted before the end of the year. I can certainly make it worth his while. I don't deserve her. But the desire's winning, and soon that thought floats out of my fevered mind. All right. The doctor closes her laptop and gives Amelie a business card. Caroline's anesthesia has taken hold, and she's being monitored. I need to go to her ward and scrub down. I'll see you with a report in half an hour. The reality of Caroline's surgery comes back like a splash of cold water in my face. I stand up and Amelie rises beside me. Of course, doctor. Thank you. What will you do if she doesn't regain full sensation in her legs? Amelie asks me gently as we drive home two hours later. Keep looking for a medical procedure that works, regardless of how long it takes. I can't keep the grimness out of my voice. She'll walk again, no matter what it costs me or what I have to do. She's looking at me tenderly. I can't meet her eyes. Let me help, she gently requests. I pull the car over and close my eyes to think. Say yes for Caroline's sake. You might be able to do it on your own, but Amelie can get it done faster. I'm not asking for a savior, I protest. The honest truth slips out before I can stop it. I don't deserve you swooping in. The bonus you've offered is enough. She sighs through her nose and lifts her chin, and the firmness in her voice cuts through the conflict in my head. Whether or not you deserve my help doesn't figure in here. Caroline does. My father was a rotten man, all right. He spent money on skanks he brought home and was too busy drinking to maintain the domicile or manage his money. I inherited what he had left and multiplied it tenfold in three years. I've already made my first five billion, Daniel. What the hell is the point of all this money if I can't do something good? She sounds troubled and determined. Oh, man. She's twisting the knife and doesn't even know it. I'm flattered you trust me. But you already do a lot of good, okay? She gives me an anxious glance as we move back into the congested traffic. I know you're the only gem and gold mine to maintain international safety and pollution standards and pay a living wage. You regularly get people out of debt. You do enough as it is. And I really don't deserve your help. I've kept the contraceptive gels instead of having them flushed out because I worried she would quickly conceive and decide to be rid of me. It was a con in the first place. Can I fix that or make up for it now? Focusing on the road, I fight the urge to say more. Let me do this, she asked almost pleadingly. Money can't fix everything, but at least I can get an exoskeleton from your specialist by Christmas. My heart is beating fast. She's reached out with a soft finger and touched the raw muscle as it pulses in my chest, pain and warmth and more vulnerability. Let's see how much Caroline improves after this surgery, and then talk about it. She seems satisfied with that. What time can we pick up Caroline? She came through surgery, but they will keep her overnight. Tomorrow around 10. I won't sleep. I never sleep when my little girl is not home and well. It's not very logical, especially knowing she's in good hands. At the bottom of the off-ramp, I slow down for cross-traffic, and as the truck comes to a stop, Amelie's slim, soft hand touches on my arm. Stay with me tonight. The surprise makes me glad the car's not moving. There's heat in her eyes, behind the demure curtain of her lashes. I should say no. But I answer with a kiss. I grab the phone from my jeans while heading to the bathroom. She promised to get Caroline an exoskeleton by Christmas. She'll have a baby in her belly by then too. Once my damn part is done, maybe I can live with myself again. Chapter 12 Amelie 
it's been four months and I'm not pregnant yet, which makes me worry. Dr. Weiss said there's no problem with my reproductive system or with Daniel's, but something has been nagging at me. Daniel and I do it every night and at every opportunity during the day. Yet every month, my period comes like clockwork. If the information Weiss gave me is correct, this shouldn't be. But Weiss has been acting strangely for months, and I never got a second opinion. Maybe it's time. I shower alone after my latest round with Daniel. Weiss has an impeccable reputation, and I pay him a lot. But he's very wealthy and very distant for a man who helps women conceive and reputations can be bought. I could accept the delay for more time with Daniel. If trouble conceiving equals more months of being exquisitely boned every night by that amazing man, I'll take it. But that's not what bothers me. Something isn't adding up. I felt it since Weiss's shift in manner. Can I trust him? My hands smooth down my belly, which Daniel likes to kiss. A smile ghosts onto my face. It's been amazing, transformative. Don't watch him walk away. Couldn't I ask him to stay? To start a relationship, like normal people? We work together. Everyone's happy. Leaning against the cool shower wall, the hot water sprinkles over me and my stomach suddenly tightens. That wasn't the deal. He's supposed to provide me with a baby, not become my new man. What if he's not interested in something deeper? Is he on his best behavior to get the job done? Will it get worse if he stays? A huge lump in my throat goes down as I dry off. My eyes are stinging. I don't know which is worse, Daniel leaving or finding out that Daniel is just like all the rest. What to do? I grab a chicken sandwich and some sweet tea. Finally, I give up and focus on more practical things. Like how we haven't produced a baby. It can't be our fault. No doctor has ever told me I have signs of fertility problems, and Daniel has a daughter. Unless Weiss missed something, which I'm starting to suspect. I take a bite of the sandwich, getting my irritation under control. Doctors are only human. There's plenty of time to fix this. Another doctor should examine Daniel, to be certain. Dr. Weiss can transfer my records to the other specialist. After voicing my request, his receptionist puts me on hold for almost 10 minutes. When the line picks back up, it's Weiss himself. May I help you, Ms. LaBelle? He asks with a suspicious edge. Yes, I want a copy of my medical records. My electronic signature is on a permission sheet, and the records can be released. It's a common request. Why is he acting like this? The discomfort is in my voice. There's a long pause. Of course. My receptionist must have misunderstood your request. His voice sounds more measured. That's more suspicious. There's no problem then? I ask in my business-like tone. F you Weiss. None at all, he says hastily. Why are you requesting the records now? Insurance reimbursement, I lie smoothly. They're giving me static, uncovering my fertility counseling. Oh. Now he sounds relieved and now I'm really worried. Of course. I'll have them faxed over right away. Damn it, I mutter after he hangs up. My heart is nervously banging away in my chest. What are you hiding, Weiss? The time dealing with my father has left me with an instinct for slimy men. To detect male lies and avoidance in general. Daniel, for example, is tight-lipped about many things, but his motives and passion for me are obvious and can hardly be judged as terrible. But after four months, a paranoid doctor who guarantees our fertility aren't playing out. A doctor who gets nervous about copies of my records. After every damn thing I have been through, Dr. Weiss is setting off more alarm bells than a warehouse fire. I tiredly rub my temples, staring at the screen of my smartphone. I need to discuss this with Daniel. If something is wrong, will he be all right with going the IVF route? I still want to have his child, even if Weiss has been tricking us and there is a fertility problem. But going to him with those serious words, we need to talk. We're not a couple, even if I wish we could be. No damn business dragging him into relationship conversations. Looks like soon there may be no other choice. 
I'm going to talk to another fertility doctor, I tell Daniel as we drive to pick up Caroline. He looks at me sharply for a split second before focusing back on the road. Why is something wrong? With Dr. Weiss, yes? I sense his tension and wish we didn't need this conversation. He's been behaving suspiciously since my two-month checkup, and when I tried to get a copy of my medical records for my insurance, he reacted defensively. Damn, he mutters. That's not a good sign. Have you been taking any medications prescribed by him? No. Just some vitamin supplements. He said it had to be a year before I could consider fertility drugs. There's always in vitro but... I hesitate. How would you feel about that? It would be fine with me. He says so quickly it shocks me. He smiles tightly. I'm paid to get you pregnant, after all. That could involve a uh, needles. Most men seem to balk at the prospect of anything sharp or pointy heading for their sensitive parts. He scoffs. One million dollars is enough for a few hours of sore private parts. And we're not there yet. So what's your plan? He shocks me again in the most pleasant of ways, just rolling with what's going on instead of balking. I'll find another fertility specialist to get a second opinion. It shouldn't take long, but you should know ahead of time. Okay. Give me the day and time when I'm not driving, so I can put it in my phone. He seems calm, completely in control, surprising me with how flexible he's being. I'm starting to feel better, but then he runs a red light. Tires screech and honks erupt on either side of us, he realizes too late what he just did and quickly steers through the intersection to get out of everyone's way. Fortunately, it's a sleepy afternoon and the traffic is thin, we're fine even if I want to smack him. Holy crap Daniel, didn't you notice, I come out of my anger. He has wide eyes and a pale face. I'm sorry, he gasps and pulls to the side of the street to compose himself. I'm not sure what just happened. This is the first time I've seen him mess up. Normally he's dead on. Do you want me to drive? Daniel is a proud man. He opens his mouth to dismiss my concern, and then closes it, looking thoughtful. Perhaps he remembers his uncle's hideous mistake in driving, when he shouldn't have. Yes let's switch. Sorry. He gives me a sheepish grin. Don't think I'll be myself until Caroline's back home. I nod and smile. He didn't sleep a wink, and not just because we were making a lot of love through the night. Let's get there and bring her back. Then we could probably all use a nap. Yeah. He looks a little pale. But that is understandable. Still. I can't shake a sense of worry while driving us to the hospital. Chapter 13 Daniel Amelie carefully drives us back home. I was smarter than my uncle and gave up the keys when I knew I was too distracted to drive. At least it didn't happen when my daughter was in the vehicle. She would have freaked out and left me feeling guiltier. That didn't happen, just a near miss and maybe one looming. I sit in the back holding sleepy sore Caroline, who wears a calm smile that I mirror, brooding behind it. Amelie wants a second opinion. That means either bribe another doctor or come clean before this gets messier. Or find a way to get my damn tubes flushed ahead of time. No more gel, and instantly my count will be normal again. It's only a short procedure, and sore balls for the day. Where's a urologist who will work fast? It's an outpatient procedure that takes less than 15 minutes. The only problem is, the procedure, like the gel itself, isn't well known in the States yet. Now I have to slip out of this mess before both of the ladies in my life end up hurt and disappointed. There's no damn way Caroline will not be affected by this. It will kill me if she's disappointed. Also, it will kill me to disappoint Amelie too. When did that happen? I liked her enough to feel in the wrong within a few days of meeting her. But day by day, week by week, month by month, I've actively tried not to get emotionally involved. Caroline's attached to her too, and Amelie clearly cares for her. Over time, we've naturally grown together. I could enjoy it all with a clear conscience and no fear of it falling apart 
if I had come here honestly. Now the whole stupid, irrelevant plan that brought me here needs to be fixed before anyone finds out. There is no choice. Otherwise, I don't even want to think about it. We have Sherbet on the balcony with Caroline when we get her home. She's tired but more tired of lying in bed. She slowly eats the sherbet, still queasy from the sedatives. They say we won't know how well it worked until the swelling goes down. It must have helped, because my toes are prickling. My spoon drops as Amelie and I swap excited looks. Holy shit! She's feeling something this soon. That's wonderful, sweetheart. I hope it doesn't feel too odd. My smile's genuine for the moment. She shakes her head and smiles around a mouthful of sherbet. After she pulls out the spoon and swallows, she simply says, I'll take it. Amelie beams across the table, and I nod. Me too. Caroline falls asleep in her chair a while, after emptying her bowl. I carry her up to bed, and get her settled. When I get back downstairs, Amelie is hanging up her phone with an odd frown. Is everything all right? I ask, on high alert inside and mildly concerned. That was Dr. Weiss. My stomach tightens. He was asking about the records and started rambling. I think he might have been drunk. Oh, you weak son of a gun, what did you do? This is why I hate drunks. I stare at her for several heartbeats before blinking and then saying, That's really bizarre. Did you ever get the files he was balking at sending? They sent them but they don't look like a complete copy. The frown on her face makes me sick. I don't know what to make of this. Weiss, you complete damned idiot. If I had known you had no balls before I let you near my own. Okay, I put my hands on her shoulders comfortingly. Look, we're dealing with two separate problems. Weiss may be a quack and you're not pregnant yet. We can't control what Weiss does until we level some charges or a lawsuit against him. Do not ask what exactly he said. Instead, I focus on what Amelie needs and how to help her. Seeing the stress start to leave her makes my gut stop churning on its own. Okay, you're right about that part, though I'm tempted to block his number. She rubs her temple, the corner of her mouth tucking up when she tries to force a smile. Do that if he starts harassing you, or just hand him to me. I have experience dealing with rich, drunk jerks. Who do you think does the most investing? It's how they gamble. I stroke her hair with my hand and rest it on her shoulder again. She thinly smiles, but at least it's genuine. Okay, you can run interference. Get as much information on what's going on with him out of him ASAP. I nod. Will do. So, what should we do instead? We turn and walk, not toward her bedroom, but to the sitting room nearby. We settle on its overstuffed burgundy and gold couch, and she nestles into my arms. The real issue is I still need to give you a baby. It's been months, and you've helped us a lot. I couldn't be more grateful, especially now that Caroline's starting to feel her feet. That's with my full sincerity, even feeling undeserving to have her in my arms. This could mean starting from scratch with another doctor. Is there something wrong with my body? I could be barren. I, she takes a huge breath and I hug her tightly. Look, if anyone has a problem, it's me. I was in a big car accident. Snapped both of my femurs almost at hip level. Titanium is a part of me now. I'll take the blame for this, even without giving up the details. I owe her that. You are fine. You have periods like clockwork. No other doctors ever said a thing about fertility problems. I may have scar tissue or something. She takes a deep breath. So if we go to this doctor and there's a problem, and we have to do in vitro with retrieval, you're game for that. This time I take a deep breath. That would neatly get around my sperm-blocked vas deferens with nobody the wiser. Sweetheart, as much as I'd love to stay with you for as long as you'll have me, and Caroline loves it here, if you want the job finished, that's fine. In fact, if you tell me you want a retrieval later today, I will do it. And more truth spills out again. Holy shit! I freeze up for a moment, then force myself to speak again. You'll have your pregnancy, 
And Dr. Weiss's crap will have just cost you little time. She stares at me. For the first time, it's tough to figure out what's going on behind those soft golden brown eyes. Maybe the mix of emotions is too complex? Or is it astonishment because she's learned I'd love to stay with her? Look, could you answer three of my questions honestly, she asks. She's trying to be all business, but there's vulnerability behind it. Proceed, I force out my heart hammering. You really would do a retrieval, if needed, to prevent further delays. She's skeptical and incredulous. I look her in the eye, say the word. Give me a chance to make up for my screw-up without you or my daughter, finding out what a lying idiot I am. She nods once and relaxes a little more. Okay. Next question. You told me everything you receive goes to Caroline's surgeries. Every bit. In fact, if you hadn't helped us, it wouldn't go far enough. But yeah, that's the bottom line. I'm giving you a baby so my baby can walk again. Still nothing but truth. She relaxes some more. Okay. Last question. This time she hesitates, drawing it out, looking past me out the window. It makes me hitch my breath and brace myself for her to ask about Weiss. Would you really want to stay? Her voice is hopeful and vulnerable, and suddenly I'm aching all through myself and gathering her onto my lap, burying my face in her hair. I'm not even sure I deserve you. I'm not perfect. Hell, I almost got us into a car accident earlier today. You deserve a man who is never ashamed of his past or have something to hide from people. Like turning into a con artist who targets rich people, so a bunch of greedy doctors will put my daughter's spine back together. I. There are tears in her eyes, and she pulls away slightly. Nobody is perfect. How bad is it? Where to begin? I never hurt anyone. Maybe I really should just tell her. How far would you go to make sure your child could walk again? I breathe out. She nods gravely, not blinking. Pretty far. But even then, you'd have ethics. Things you wouldn't do. There's relief in her face when I say, yes. I don't want to be the guy who you can't trust. Even though I have been. How dumb was that? I want to be the man you can rely on. The man you deserve. Everything I'm saying is heartfelt, but it sounds like drivel. And who knows what she's thinking. That's nice to hear, but... I've heard a lot of promises from a lot of men. You are the only one to get this close, but words aren't shit without action. Her voice ebbs back and forth between tender and firm, and I feel her inside again, this time worse, like she's gripping my heart. I will never hurt you, I say quietly. Not intentionally. Maybe by being a jerk, but I try not to be. She lets out a sad laugh. That puts you a cut above a lot of guys, that's for sure. But only proving that makes it real. I'm such an idiot. I'm prepared to. Is it possible to actually make my way out of this and somehow win this magnificent woman? I can't change the cowardice that kept me from fixing this sooner. Can I make up for it? Is there anything else? In some ways, it feels like the hard part's over. Even if I just made an idiot of myself. She stares at me a long time. It's tough not to look away. No, she says gently. You've already given me a lot to think about. I need a nap now, though. I cover her up with a blanket. No, I have to fix this. The rest of my afternoon is spent calling every urologist in the county to get an appointment in the next two days. Most won't even see me, and the rest balk about the gel since they haven't dealt with it. Dr. Parikh, who injected the stuff in the first place, is still out of town, and no way I'm asking Weiss. I agree to going ahead with IVF, even if the retrieval gets difficult. That can happen without the new doctor ever detecting the gel implants. They're unusual outside of India right now. They could assume scar tissue is the culprit, narrowing all the little tubes and such so the seed can't get through. Either way, it would bypass the birth control too. It should work. That doesn't change the fact that I sailed in here to deceive Amelie and seduce her into keeping me. 
This was a con. Then I fell for her. I would deserve it if she found out and threw me out. But Caroline doesn't need to suffer alongside me. Too much of that already. I start to call more urologists but then stop. Suddenly, I feel like a coward for scrambling for covering my butt. Amelie will get what she wants. I'll go directly to the retrieval after the test shows a zero count. If the specialist discovers the implants, I'll face the music and beg Amelie to show Caroline some mercy. I don't deserve any. Chapter 14 Amelie Daniel's going through with IVF at my request. I am getting what I want, without more fruitless waiting. I should be happy. My head is spinning as I lie on my bed, cold tears in the corners of my eyes. Pretending to be tired, I sent him away to settle before his touch intoxicates me again. It's not going well. If what Weiss told me is true, I'm still getting what I want. I'll be pregnant by Christmas by the man I chose. But I can't be happy about it. Weiss's phone call, his story, happened as Daniel was putting his daughter to bed. I was tired and worried about the near accident. Also looking forward to spending half of the afternoon in his arms. It took me all this time to realize I've fallen for him. I was debating to tell him today. That's what made his affirmation that the feelings mutual so agonizing and so screwed up. Shut up and listen, Weiss told me slurring and snarling. He started to spill out a story that sounded so crazy, he could have made it up. Some of the facts are true, and it scares the hell out of me. He had a vasectomy. He's been lying to you all along, the bum, so he and his crippled daughter can have a nice place to stay and get the surgeries. He paid me hide his zero count. Why did he figure this lie would last forever? If you're planning action against me, better put the blame on the right guy. This was his idea. Afterward, in Daniel's arms as he tried to comfort me from pain he may have caused, I thought about the four months it's taken me to get pregnant and tried to figure out whether I can trust him. Instead, I got a confession of love. Oh God. He admitted to being imperfect and ashamed of his past. He wanted to do better and agreed to get me pregnant. But if Weiss is correct, he lied to me. Of course I'm coming home, baby doll. Your mama's just nervous. It's all right. Daddy's silhouette in the dark, an empty shape making empty promises. Did some messed up part of my subconscious make me attracted to another lying piece of trash? Do I just draw them like sharks? Or is Weiss lying because he's a drunk jerk who resents that I'm checking up on his work and who is trying to distract me with drama to cover himself? I have never felt so conflicted, it feels like two angry snakes are warring inside of my gut. And no idea weighing in my head does anything to resolve it. Get rid of him. He's been lying and tricking me. It's time to regain control before he starts manipulating again. Forgive him. He's desperate. He's only doing this for his daughter. I can't trust him. But I can't throw his daughter out when she's depending on me or help. She'll be crushed. Even if Weiss is telling the truth. Caroline is Daniel's reason for everything. How far would you go? Would you do the wrong thing for the right reasons? If he's deceiving me, even if he has fallen for me, accepting it means he'll think he can keep lying. I can't live with that. With the back of my hand, I wipe some tears away. This is why I stopped dating. He took my versus card. What can I do if he's just another jerk? I squeeze my eyes. Stop, I whisper into the pillow, the weakest order. Stop it. Be objective. Do I really want to give that up? But how can I enjoy it, now that Weiss has planted this seed of doubt? If I let Weiss ruin everything, my heart will dry up. I'll get seed from a lab and my daughter will grow up never trusting men. But if Daniel really has been lying, I can't let it slide either. If I'm not doing a dramatic breakup that will disrupt our lives, I have to find another way to address it. Wiping my eyes I walk to my vanity mirror and stare into my face, seeing the streaks of dry tears and the resolve. I won't end up like my mother, 
trapped in a relationship with a man because of a needy child and the one thing he brought to the table. What does Daniel bring to the table? He could lie about loving me. But every damn time he gets emotional, he falls all over himself, like he wasn't expecting it. I doubt he's lying about his feelings for me. I go into the bathroom and clean myself up. I brush out my hair and catch it behind with a golden clip. What else? Good company, if he doesn't drive distracted. A child who already feels like she belongs here, and whom I would miss. I wash the tear streaks off my face and reapply my makeup. My eyeliner is blue. My lips are crimson. I'm not shaking anymore. What are Daniel's drawbacks? He may have lied to me for months. He admitted to having a past he's somewhat ashamed of. He may be infertile and hiding it. But he's willing to face surgical intervention and recovery to provide me with what he's promised. Which is pretty ballsy, pun intended, and shows commitment. He may even be completely innocent, in which case I have to plan my response so an undeserving person is not hurt. Maybe there's a way to do this so, if he's done nothing, he'll just end up confused. If he's been swindling me after all, I need to make sure nothing like this ever happens again. And if that means doing anything to get that job done, well, I didn't make my first billion by being nice. A smile crosses my freshly reddened lips as a plan starts to form. Chapter 15 Daniel So, I take a deep breath and face my daughter. It's time I come clean about something. Amelie and Caroline look at me, leaving me wondering if Amelie's expecting a confession too. How much has Weiss told her? How much does she believe? Amelie has insisted about being honest with my daughter about what's going on, and I'm biting the bullet and doing it. Later this evening, I'll bite another bullet entirely. Because to my astonishment, Amelie made an appointment with a world-renowned IVF and seed retrieval specialist just 30 minutes away, same day. She can wield power when she wants to, and it has left me a bit intimidated. Especially since, this time, it involves her holding me to my word in a very immediate way. Off we go to the IVF clinic to have my seed tested, and then go through a retrieval. And of course pray the exam doesn't reveal the gel. I'm going to ask for a sedative. I didn't come here because Amelie hired me for investments. I try to ignore the heat creeping up the back of my neck. She hired me to give her a baby. Caroline blinks at me, ah, uh, what? Damn. There's a place called an IVF clinic where women can get pregnant. Sometimes they hire men to help them. She scoffs slightly. I know what intercourse is, Dad. Amelie stifles a cough in her handkerchief, and I ignore the urge to change the subject to literally anything else. Uh, I think you've got the wrong idea of an IVF clinic, honey. Okay, so. Caroline looks at Amelie helplessly. What's the deal here? Do we have to leave? There's a kid? She's worried. Okay, okay, don't fret about that. The real deal is I might have a small surgery tonight to make sure they can use my seed to get her pregnant. Please let that be enough. If that happens, I'll be sore for a few days and might have more appointments for a while. You should not be troubled. Amelie looks between the two of us. Wait, why would you need surgery? Don't you like each other? You kiss an awful lot for people who don't. Her eyes are bright and expectant. Sure but things are more complicated. She has more energy after her nap than I've seen in a while. It's the depression lifting, even though something weird is going on, she has hope. I have to do everything in my power not to shatter that optimism. Sorry to lie about the investment project. It was kind of private, but it's gonna pay for the rest of your surgery. I give her a reassuring smile. Caroline frowns. So we won't have to go away before the last surgery, and my robot pants are ready. Don't worry about that, sweetheart, Amelie speaks up. If you and your daddy end up leaving, you'll be walking on your own two feet. 
It's a big promise to make. But she's a billionaire, and she's Amelie. I've never met anyone as determined. She's so kind that sometimes I forget the strength underneath it. I feel pathetically grateful when Caroline smiles and nods. Okay, my daughter agrees. But what about this other stuff? Oh, sweetheart, what's going on between your father and me shouldn't affect you. Amelie's voice is so warm and tender that for a moment, I think wistfully of the three of us as a family. Then Amelie turns her gaze on me. We'll sort out any other problems on our own. There's something in her eyes that makes me a little nervous. Come clean about everything. She won't let any problems between us affect my daughter's care or housing. The only one getting a boot will be me. Except, there's no damned way I'll talk about being a con artist in front of my daughter. That's where I draw the line. Putting it off for any reason is the coward's way, and I've been taking that route far too much. I excuse myself, thinking about that surgical table and the most uncomfortable ways this night could end. I owe it to Amelie, just like I owe her an explanation. I'm going to let myself recover from those needles before facing the music. Caroline has that dangerous little frown on her face again. I brace myself. What is it, sweetheart? How come you can't make a baby the normal way? Amelie nearly spits out her tea. Oh God. Your dad got hurt in the accident too, and it might have caused some scarring that... Caroline's eyes fly wide open. Oh no. You broke your... I'm fine. I interject, slightly panicked, never ever wanting her to finish that sentence. Ever. It's just easier this way. You know, using a laboratory. This right here is my karma. I should have told the kid the truth somehow from the beginning. I lie to everyone. I lied to Caroline about how bad she was hurt. I lied to myself about conning an innocent woman this intimately, and I started out treating Amelie like another trophy. I glance her way, and she's choking quietly into her napkin. This is probably awkward for her too, but now that Caroline's acting more secure, Amelie seems more amused than anything. Maybe hiding the truth from Caroline annoyed her? Caroline nods and then frowns. So who's gonna be here if I have nightmares? Edmund promised to stay all night, sweetheart. Chances are we'll be back in a few hours. Amelie pats my daughter's hand and she smiles, reassured. Okay, good, I like him. He's nice. She returns to eating her breakfast. Holy shit, that was awkward but it went better than expected. I'll wait to ask Amelie about it until we're in the car. It was the right thing to do, but why insist I come clean with my daughter before we even hit the road? I'm not trying for an argument, but she did seem awfully amused. When I was a little girl, she begins as we drive to the clinic near Old Jefferson, my father lied to me all the time. He claimed to love me, he may even have done it to spare my feelings. But he lied. He lied when he cheated on my mother with call girls. He lied when he started bringing them home. He even lied when one of them stumbled into my bedroom with no clothes and drunk. He had a lie for everything and it never stopped. He even died while partying with one of his skanks without ever coming clean about anything. Her voice is cold and bitter and I feel a stab of anger at that man who treated his daughter that way. I would never do something like that. No, she says in that same intense voice. I don't know that. I only have your word. Do you love your daughter more than my dad loved me? Obviously. Are you better to her than my father was to me? Sure. But you can't claim to love people and then lie to them. And I don't want to have a baby with a man who is okay with that. My heart sinks. If you didn't have a point, I wouldn't have gone along with talking to her. My tone may be slightly grudging. You did. She sounds thoughtful. Now just hold out for the IVF treatments, and you've kept up your end of the deal. Gladly. I feel relieved, absolved. Maybe I can get away without admitting my infertility was self-inflicted and part of a stupid plan. 
Dr. Butler is a tall, statuesque blonde woman with a pursed mouth who looks me over, unimpressed, in her rimless glasses. She spends ten minutes explaining the technique. I'm to start, since my fertility test is the least invasive. She hands Amelie a sample cup, and the two of them share a glance before she looks back at me icily. Deposit a sample, and take it to my laboratory down the hall. If your sample is normal, we will test Ms. LaBelle's fertility instead. Whatever has to be done. I have a promise to keep. Amelie's face softens a bit. Very good. Try to hurry. If we need to perform a more invasive procedure, I'd like to get started promptly. Out of the room she goes, heels clicking briskly away down the hall. We good. I mumble, astonished at how she can get me off even in a lab. For now, she says cryptically. Let's see what the doctor says. It takes me longer to catch my breath and push off the wall than it did for her to make me finish. I tuck myself back in my pants, zip up and follow her, silk shirt sticking to my chest from sweating. Amazing woman. Slightly scary. I have to win her for real. The results are almost what I expected. Although you are in good health and have the proper hormonal balance, the doctor begins as she leans away from her microscope. This fertility stuff is complicated. How did our ancestors even get pregnant? I sigh, hiding the mix of confusion and relief. Largely by accident, the doctor replies in a clipped voice. We should do an ultrasound down there to determine whether you can undergo a needle extraction with a local or under sedation. I freeze. The ultrasound could reveal the gel blockage. Again, the idea pops into my head. Just admit the truth. It will be embarrassing and make me look like an idiot and liar in front of both of them. Somehow, I can't say anything besides, okay. Amelie's with me the whole time, watching quietly. Am I more embarrassed or relieved that she's sticking loyally around? Once the ultrasound is over, the doctor whispers something to her and then turns to me. I'm sorry, Mr. Fontaine. The blockage is in the wrong place to allow for a needle extraction. We'll have to do the biopsy. I look at her in slowly growing horror. Oh. Oh, shit. My brain goes to war. On one side is I didn't sign up to give up a bit of my bits, and on the other is if I only had the gel removed months ago, and finally, responsibility wins. Would you have a razor and some lather I can use? I joke gamely. The technician will shave you as part of preparations, the doctor replies in that same cold voice. You will need to sign a few forms, one regarding the sedation, the others regarding the surgical procedure. Back in a minute. She disappears into her office and shuts the door. I turn to Amelie with a wry look. Well, damn. You sure about this? She asks, her face unreadable. Look, let's put it this way. It's my fault you don't have a baby yet, and it's my responsibility to remedy that. And if I can avoid the super awkward conversation about why it's my fault, all the better. I'm glad you feel that way. But I'm still left wondering something. Why would Dr. Weiss hide the fact that you've got a problem from me? The breath freezes in my throat and I blink at her with glacial slowness like a tortoise. Oh well. And I panic. Staring down the barrel of something worse than a needle to my bits, I don't have the guts to answer honestly. I spit out, I don't know, almost reflexively, and feel crappy and relieved when she frowns and drops the subject. Phew, that was close. I'll tell her the whole truth someday, after my private parts. Maybe never, if I'm very, very lucky. I'm glad you're committed to this. It gives me hope. Another cryptic statement, she doesn't qualify. I hastily sign the papers, not even looking at them, wanting to get it all over with. The doctor whisks the papers away and sends me to the treatment room with Amelie. The next ten minutes, my private parts get shaved by a bored male nurse who bears an alarming resemblance to Homer Simpson. I avoid eye contact as a small part of me dies inside. I am absolutely not telling my daughter about this. Finally, it's time for sedation. I'm draped on a surgical table, 
shaved, scrubbed, and feeling more vulnerable than a multiple black belt who is a billionaire on the regular should. The anesthesiologist sets the line in my arm and monitors the machine as Amelie holds my hand. It's sweet. It's what I do for Caroline. She really does care about me. I'm one lucky SOB. It's more than I deserve. I'll always keep my promises to you, I say drowsily, trying to ignore the scalpels and theatrically large bore needles laid out on the tray next to me. The world's starting to get fuzzy. Soon I'll just have to tough through healing, and it'll all be over with. That's sweet. It really does help, Amelie says rather coolly, catching my attention. But you really have to work on telling the truth, too. My eyes can't open fully anymore. The alarm slowly seeps through me like cold water through a thick sock. Huh. I barely manage. She leans over further as she whispers in my ear. I'm completely at her mercy in that moment. I know everything. Oh, shit is my last thought as I drift off. Chapter 16 Amelie A look of absolute horror on Daniel's face the moment before he falls unconscious is the most disappointing and satisfying thing I've seen in a long time. Once he's out, Emily comes in, chuckling, having dropped her icy demeanor. So, she says, what do you want to do now? He doesn't need a biopsy, does he? She snorts and shakes her head. No, your big stud is teeming with viable seed, it just can't get past the blockages. She rolls her eyes. He thinks fertility specialists don't collaborate. Once he started calling around, he became the local gossip. And Weiss? How to deal with him? My lesson for Daniel is panning out well. I might even forgive him, if he never repeats this again. But the doctor who he paid off? What sort of punishment is good enough for that jerk? Yet if he hadn't gotten drunk and spilled the beans, I would never have suspected a thing. Weiss has taken an abrupt leave to parts unknown. He's running scared. Perhaps you should let him stir for a while. She checks Daniel's vitals and glances at his draped form. Hum, I can see why you're thinking of keeping him. I scoff and blush. Emily. She presses her lips and looks down. I'll stop. I lick my lips and look downward. I should have come to you in the first place. I should have waited for you to come back from vacation. If I had waited just a little longer. That's a slippery emotional slope, if only, if only. You can drive yourself crazy this way, break your own heart. I've been an expert in it my whole life. Thank you for helping me out, I tell my old sorority sister. The look on his face when he realized his con had blown up was more than worth it. She winks. So, now what? I'm not doing anything he doesn't want. I keep looking at him. He signed a permission form, but that's not the same as actual consent. She removes her reading glasses, tucks them in her pocket, and shakes her hair out of its ridiculously severe bun. According to my colleagues on the local mailing list, he's been looking to get the gel flushed out. Whether it was to get you pregnant or avoid fallout, that is not certain. I'm thinking both. I frown at him, weighing my options. Half an hour later, Daniel's eyelids flutter and then slowly open. He looks at me sitting beside him and blinks sleepily. Looks like his memory is coming back as his eyes widen. Ah, he manages after a moment. I still seem to have both my private parts. Of course you do. I smile faintly. His comeuppance has taken the edge off my rage. He starts to sit up and then winces. What happened? The doctor flushed your gel implants with bicarbonate solution, as you wished. According to her colleagues, you called most of them. My smile goes lopsided, watching his handsome face fall a bit more. I thought consultations were confidential, he grumbles, and I chuckle. They didn't use your name. It's a rare form of birth control here, and when she found it on the ultrasound, she knew who they were talking about. Wait. His eyes narrow, a mix of suspicion and astonishment. Did you conspire with a doctor to manipulate me into thinking you were taking some kind of testicle-based revenge? I look him right in the eyes. 
Did you conspire with a doctor to manipulate me into thinking you were fertile, while seducing me and playing head games for a bigger payoff? His mouth closes with a snap and finally, in defeat, he nods. Yes, he manages after a moment. I did. Then I realized you did not deserve it, and what a jerk I was being, but it took me too long. It's not a perfect apology or the perfect truth, but it's already a lot better. Did you like it when I turned the tables on you? I ask mildly with my arms folded. Not one bit, he replies with a sheepish grin. You really had me going for a minute there. Now you know a bit of what you put me through. And you have a chance to make it up to me. My mother was never in a position, emotionally or otherwise, to hand my father real consequences for his actions. If she had, maybe she would have had a happier life, even if he was too dim-witted to give up his bad habits. She could have at least had her pride, and some sense of control over her life. He swallows and nods. If I proved I have what it takes. If he's mad at me for giving him a taste of his own medicine, he's not showing it. I'm not sure what to do now, he admits as he gets dressed. I thought you would toss me to the curb if you found out. Tossing you out means tossing Caroline and she doesn't need that. I had to find another way to school you for lying. I help him into his shirt, he's still a little fuzzy from the drugs. I've certainly learned my lesson about lying to you, he chuckles, his eyes twinkling. Good, I reply. Because if you ever try to swindle me again, I'm telling your daughter. His mild look of dismay isn't quite masked by his amusement. He believes me. He'd better. I think as we walk out shoulder to shoulder. But a lady in my position has to be. Chapter 17 Amelie Christmas has come again and for the first time in years, I'm not alone. My hands are on my belly as I stand on the balcony, watching the storm clouds roll in, darkening the sky and giving Baton Rouge dusk at midday. It took months of trying the old-fashioned way before I conceived. But now, I'm looking forward to welcoming our first child by spring. So are Daniel and Caroline. It's funny how things work out. Dr. Weiss fled the country in a panic, so terrified of the consequences that he effectively exiled himself. If anything, he did worse to himself than I had even been contemplating. That very night, Daniel and I tore apart the bedroom in a bout of makeup, ten minutes after making sure that Caroline was sleeping peacefully. He spent that night in my bed, and he slept there every night since. It hasn't been perfect. But he's been lovely to be around, now that he knows where the line is drawn and what I won't put up with it. Out here honey, you're gonna love this. Daniel's voice chirps over the faint whir stamp of Caroline's early Christmas present, as they get onto the balcony too. I look at them, Daniel walking next to his daughter as she gingerly maneuvers her new exoskeleton out of the door. It's bulky and the control cap will take some getting used to, but she is definitely walking. These straps are itchy, she comments. Not a complaint. She's been feeling her legs more and more since healing from her last surgery, and she points out every new sensation with fascination and optimism. We'll have them lined, I promise, and she smiles and nods as she moves to the railing. Daniel steps up between us and slips an arm around each of us. I slide my hand into my purse and touch a button on a hidden remote. At once, millions of tiny lights blaze all over the garden. Oh wow! Caroline cries excitedly. Daniel leans over and kisses my temple. Not bad, he murmurs. I smile and lean my head on his shoulder as the lights shimmer in the pre-storm dimness. Christmas has never been the common sort. We're getting thunderstorms instead of snow, Caroline got her present in a laboratory instead of under a tree, and my Christmas Eve proposal came from a man that my father's family would never approve of. My mother would, now that he's learned not to lie. And that's all that matters. Merry Christmas, I tell my new family tenderly. The End Book 2 Snowden Chapter 1 Cheyenne What a predicament! 
My boss, Dr. Darren Grace, is leaning on my desk, his charcoal and gray suit straining deliciously across his sculpted back, one hard buttock hitched up on the heavy wood, close enough to touch. He's oblivious, of course, as he always is, but at least with his back to me I can look at him as much as I want. Yes, Crystal. Of course, Crystal. No, I'll be back in Boston as soon as I close the deal. He sounds strained behind the false cheer. No wonder, he's talking to the worst woman in the world. She's the kind of woman who can watch her father abuse his servants without so much as blinking. She's the kind of woman who wears her wealth and the wealth of her beleaguered fiancé and who sneers and sniffs her way through every interaction. And worst of all, she's the kind of woman who, three months from now, will make Darren the unhappiest man in the world. If I can't pardon her attitude, I'm sure not going to forgive her for marrying him. Not when he would be happier with me. I can't give him money, though. Crystal definitely can. She's wealthy. Her father is Darren's biggest rival in the American pharmaceutical industry. Their marriage is like an alliance of two powerful nations, and she's the princess on offer. The only thing she can give him is money, but I could give him everything else. If only. My eyes trace from the thick, rippling mane of his blonde hair down his shoulder and along the powerful arm bracing against my desktop. The desk is a boat, solid oak that probably outweighs him, so there's plenty of room for him to lean and me to work. Although who could work with a view like this? A what? No, I'm just bringing my assistant. It will probably take the afternoon to hash out the deal. After that I'll drive back, drop off my paperwork, and join you. His voice is warm and reasonable, but his annoyance at having to constantly reassure her is there. Of course, she's paranoid and controlling on top of everything else. In her heart, she probably acknowledges she doesn't deserve Darren, not one bit. He's gone quiet. He turned his head partway in my direction, and I catch a glimpse of a scowl. She's bad-mouthing me again. Crystal, there's no need to be concerned. He winces as her voice snaps faintly. No. Yes, of course, I'll be home in time for supper. It's only nine in the morning, we have plenty of time to get things done. She gave you a curfew? It's impossible to tell what gnaws on me hard, my pity for a man who deserves so much better letting himself be drawn to heel by a golden leash, or my frustration of having no chance with him at all. I tap away at the keyboard, reviewing the day's itinerary while pretending not to be distracted. We're spending the day in the mountains to close a deal on a few pharmaceutical patents developed by a Dr. Abrams, one of his dad's old partners. The man is as eccentric as he is brilliant, and he refuses to come into the city, so we're meeting him near his home, at Darren's hunting lodge. The idea of spending an entire day with Darren away from the office had my fantasies running wild for almost a week. I was lying awake nights, restless and tingling, my skin unsatisfied by the imaginary caresses of his powerful hands. It's ridiculous, of course, he's promised to another, and he never treated me as anything besides his assistant and confidant. But a girl can still dream. Or not dream. This frustrated desire has given me insomnia. I stifle a yawn, re-examining the specifics of the patents. Dr. James Abrams is very ill and refusing treatment. He has cancer, the same disease he spent his career developing new chemotherapy drugs for. He shocked everyone, including Darren, by insisting on staying up on his mountain instead of seeking treatment. So up onto the mountain we go to make a transaction before he dies, and the patents become up for grabs. Darren already explained that one of his rivals, maybe even Hiltman, will buy them and sit on them if we don't. I can't imagine anyone unprincipled enough to pull needed medicines from the market because it's more lucrative to sell other options. Apparently, a move like that is common in Darren's world. He's the only billionaire who is different, he has a problem with keeping medicine from the sick. As a result, I have no problem heading up the mountain with him in late October to back his play. Darren hangs up on Crystal with a grunt of disgust and turns to me, his beautifully curved lips twisting wryly. His eyes are an arresting deep gray like the sky before a storm. Come on, let's pack up and get out of here before she decides to tag along.
I laugh politely, shutting down my desktop and scooping up my briefcase. Ready when you are, boss. Underneath, I sadly wonder why in the world you are marrying her for the hundredth time. He's about to spend the rest of his years living in spite of his wife, instead of because of her, stealing scraps of happiness, friendships, and intimacy behind her back, and starving for them the rest of the time. I want to grab and shake him. Is this really necessary? Money isn't the best answer, not when he is already prosperous. He noticeably doesn't love that atrocious woman or her predatory pusball father. This just isn't typical, I think, putting my coat on. October has been unseasonably cold this year, and there is no way I'll go by Mount Greylock without an extra layer on. Darren, don't forget your coat, okay? He lets out a laugh. Yes, Mom. His tone teases me gently. I chuckle. If you get pneumonia and die, I'll lose my amazing job and a good friend. Come on now. He grins as he puts on his leather coat and belts it around his lean waist. Good thing I put the liner in. What is with all this crazy weather the last few weeks? We're jet stream. It dipped again and Boston got Canadian weather. I smooth the forest green wool swing coat in front and pull my matching hat on over my auburn braid, hoping that will be enough protection. It's 40 degrees and dropping instead of rising, and the wind's picking up. Good thing I've got the SUV. He gives my cap a playful tug as he walks past. Let's get going. I follow him, ignoring the hint of his spicy cologne riding the air. My fingers flex, itching to touch him, but I keep them firmly at my sides. Why are you going through with this wedding? You don't seem happy about it. It's not a marriage for happiness, I sigh, keeping my eyes on the road. It comes out sounding like an apology, and it should be. I won't ignore what lies in spoken between us. What is this marriage for, then? You don't need more riches. Crystal is a complete. I know. I cut her off with slight irritation. She's more a piece of angry baggage than a person, especially with her passive aggression and all the spoiling her father has done. Well, she's still a person. She's not looking at me. When I glance over, she's staring out the window. But she's a terrible person. Yes. It's frustrating. I briefly rub my face with my shifting hand and then settle it back on the steering wheel. She actually thought we were going to ditch her for the weekend. Hey, I'd be up for it, she laughed shyly. Not sure about using the hunting lodge to hunt, though. I usually hunt with my game cameras, you know that. I chuckle, but behind it, I'm getting more desperate. She's right. If I had control over the situation, I'd never see Crystal or her parasite father again. Yet if I do that, he'll send what he's got to my board of directors. I'm still the majority shareholder, but they can still make things difficult if he stirs them up enough. What Hiltman's got will certainly stir them up. It'll be like kicking a hornet's nest. And I'm at least half to blame for that blackmail material, because I was careless after my father's death. Cheyenne asked me about the trail cams. When I mentioned some of the better footage, she nods along. We're both distracted, there's a weight over us. At least she's willing to let the subject of my wedding drift away. The nuptials loom closer with each day. And with it, any chance that I can take Cheyenne for my own. At least, in any way that doesn't involve massive scandal and a messy divorce. Anyway, last fall, a windstorm came through and knocked a tree limb into one of my cameras. Wonder what is going on with the weather these days. It seems like the seasons keep overlapping. It's actually pretty troubling. Snow seasons the last few years have been too early, too late, or too heavy. Or there's been no snow at all, like two years ago, up until some blizzards in early March. Well, I hope we don't have any snow until the end of the month, she grumbles. I'm happy to be spending time alone with her now, with no one giving me trouble about it, except for Crystal, but she gives me trouble about everything. Chapter 3 Cheyenne It turned into a very long afternoon. 
Dr. Abrams is a tall, lean, slightly bent man with thinning white hair that escapes his watch cap in wisps and thin hands that constantly tremble. He's kind and polite to us both, listens to what we have to say, and does indeed eventually sign the papers. But it requires a lot of patience to listen to him ramble, half-drunkenly, about medical ethics. By the time we sign the papers, we've been with him for five hours. Abrams looks at the two of us and smiles. Saving these patents is what your father would have wanted, Darren. I'm glad to be of help. My head is pounding, and Darren's smile is faintly strained. Neither one of us complains. It's clear the old man is lonely and a bit addled, maybe from the pain or maybe from living alone on a mostly isolated mountain for so many years. Thank you very much, Darren replies politely. He's neither irritated nor bored, but from the set of his shoulders it looks like he's fighting impatience. I will send reports on our continued research. Make sure the resulting medicines go where they are needed. Abrams coughs wetly into his fist and my stomach jumps. I wonder how much time he has left, and return my attention to Darren. He shoots me a small, reassuring glance as he gets out of his chair and walks the old man to the door. It shuts behind them, their feet crunching on the gravel outside, their voices becoming fainter. I lean back in a massive leather upholstered chair and look around the lodge. Darren calls it cozy. It has a peaked cathedral ceiling, an entire front wall of insulated glass, and a kitchen with hammered copper accents and a massive farmhouse sink. Four bedrooms, two bathrooms, a sauna, a hot tub, the sprawling great room, dot all on ten acres of land. If Darren really thinks of this as modest and rustic, I wonder what his definition of opulent is. And it's warm, certainly warmer than my own apartment. There is not a draft anywhere. It has whole log walls, heavily insulated, and a geothermal heat pump to supplement its gigantic Russian brick stove. I'd love to remain here a while alone with Darren, to spend some real time with him. Neither one of us has anything or anyone worth rushing back for, not after work hours. I want to find an excuse to linger. Instead, I sigh and start packing up my laptop and papers. Everything's handled. I can at least go home knowing I helped Darren make a fundamental deal. But when he comes back from walking the elder doctor out, he brings with him a blast of arctic air. He's blinking rapidly, flakes of snow in his hair. What's going on? Ah, uh, I, he utters in a tone of mild concern. I doubt the sky is black and it's dropped 15 degrees since we arrived. The wind's way up and it's starting to snow. What the really? So much for lingering. We better get out of here before the road gets icy. Yeah, I agree. Help me get the lights off and the heat down, and we'll get moving. We start hastening around to shut the place down. It is at that moment, at the worst possible time, that Darren's phone shrills. He uses a retro telephone's jangling as his ringtone for Crystal. I tense up at once whenever I hear it. I keep turning lights off as Darren rolls his eyes and answers it. What is it, sweetheart? I'm kind of in a rush here. He pauses. No, the client kept us five hours. We're trying to get off the mountain before this storm gets underway. Can I call you back? Another pause. Crystal, the storm's getting worse. It is snowing. We really need to discuss this later. Give me an hour to get off the mountain. I'll call you then. That just seems to drive Crystal into greater aggression. Darren winces. Hang up on her, a crazy desperate part of me begs. Hang up on that spoiled, irrational cow and run away with me. It takes him another five minutes before she stops calling him back. By then the storm gray of the sky has thickened into a blank white. The wind moans and my heart beats faster. We might have some trouble. Finally, he turns his phone off. Now or never. Let's go. I follow him out into the swirling wind. I immediately regret it. The temperature's still dropping, stinging every inch of my exposed skin even before the big flecks of snow batter against me. White drifts start forming at the edges of everything as the wind catches the snow up against the furrowed logs and stone slab paving. Darren shields me from the wind as we push toward the distant dark hulk of his SUV. 
The storm hasn't just worsened, it's gathering strength as fast as an avalanche. I feel like if it weren't for Darren, the storm would otherwise have swept me off my feet. We slog up the path, stepping carefully on the now icy slate flagstones. My chest burns and my feet slips as the wind pushes me. It's so cold that I feel detached from my body, numbly watching myself struggle against the increasing cold, protected only by a thin winter coat. The walk seems to stretch on forever, as I get colder and colder under my flimsy coat. The snow is blowing sideways against my legs, bouncing over the rapidly freezing ground in rippling sheets that look like vapor, until they bite my calves. I push myself forward against them, and against the shove of the wind, and then Darren turns back to push me against the side of the SUV. We made it. I gasp for air, stunned, bullets of ice in my hair. Are you all right? He asks, but I can't speak. I hide against his chest, fingers retracted into my coat sleeves, and simply nod. I don't think it's wise to drive in this, he understates dryly as we watch branches topple onto the road and skid across it. Then an entire tree crashes down, blocking one of the lanes of the road. Back inside we go, he orders, ushering me back, protecting me from the wind at our backs. The howl of the storm, the hard patter of snow, and the cracking of tree branches grow to a deafening din all around us as we struggle the quarter mile back to the safety of the lodge. I'm scared and disoriented, barely realizing how much I'm shivering or how close his body is to mine. I don't feel my knees give. I pitch forward with a startled yelp. He catches my fall and gently scoops me into his arms. He bulls for the door, carrying me without effort, the heat of his labored breathing stinging my cheek. I hear the jingle of his keys and the clunk of the lock, and then we stumble together through the doorway into the quiet, sheltered space beyond. Holy shit! He gasps, kicking the door closed and latching it before bundling me over to the broad, overstuffed couch. Are you okay? He asks as he sets me down. I sit there, my ears ringing in the sudden quiet, and tentatively flex my fingers. They prickle and burn. All my exposed skin prickles and burns. I feel everything. He helps me out of my coat and the now sodden blazer beneath it. I'll put the kettle on. Get your boots off, sweetheart, and those socks too. I'll bring you a blanket. He ignores the ice melting in his own hair, his own leather coat now dripping, his breath exhaling in shivering fog as he moves around. I comply, fiddling with my bootlaces with stiff fingers. The warm air burns my feet more than my fingers, I whimper with pain as I remove my shoes and peel off my socks. My toes can wiggle. And at least my skin is red instead of white. He brings me a thick rose and green comforter and wraps me in it. My feet draw up under it, shivering, trying to warm up. Outside the storm pounds the windows wailing. He looks at the big main window, scowling. The road may be completely blocked. I'll call in to make sure someone knows we're here. Just let me get some hot tea into you. I nod numbly, waiting for the kettle to whistle, for the pain to fade, waiting to get warm. I'll try. But something's not right, my body doesn't seem to be warming up. Chapter 4 Darren I managed to get in three short phone calls before Crystal gets a call. The first to my caretaker George, who now knows to come plow us out once the storm passes. The second to my chief manager Beth, who will hold down the fort if we're stuck here for more than a day. And the last to my butler Jacob, who will prepare the mansion grounds in case the storm reaches that far. My phone rings in my ear, that same shrill ringtone alerting me. Back teeth hurting, I pick up. Well thanks a lot, Crystal. Now we're stuck. What are you talking about? She demands in her distinctive nasal snap. You said you would be over for supper. Have you noticed the blizzard outside? I ask dryly. She goes quiet for a few moments. I hear tapping away on a keyboard. It says there's a road closure on the mountain. She sounds genuinely astonished. Yes, that's right. It blew in as I tried to get you off the phone. I attested with strained patience. The tea kettle whistles for some lemon ginger tea. Is that low-class assistant there with you? Crystal demands. Startled, I drop the tea box on the counter, scoop it up, and stuff it back in the cabinet. Shit. What does she suspect this time? 
How does that relate to getting snowed in? Don't exaggerate. That freak storm would have caught you on the road anyway. She's right, and I grunt in acknowledgement. That's affirmative. Now answer my question. No. The lie comes out easily, shocking me, and the shock sends a strange rush of pleasure through me. I sent her home as soon as we didn't need her anymore. Why? Oh. Now she sounds uncertain. All right then. What do you mean, all right then? I'm stuck up here. Suddenly though, I'm feeling much less annoyed. I wanted a vacation. I'll take an imposed one. Especially if it's with Cheyenne. Even though this poses some problems of its own, and should news of my lie ever get back to her, not just what Crystal will suspect. I turn to look at Cheyenne again, and indulge in my fantasies once more. The storm can't possibly trap you up there for long. I assume your access road will be cleared as soon as they get there. Crystal sounds completely content, suddenly with the fact that I won't be joining her tonight. I can imagine why. This marriage is being imposed on her too, probably with her inheritance in the balance. But it's not easy for me to sympathize when she takes it out on me at every opportunity. As long as I'm trapped somewhere and she knows where, she's fine with it. And that makes me wonder about the damage done to her by being the pampered daughter of such a hollow, craven man. Fine, I grumble. I don't know when I'll get out of here. I'll call you when I have an update. After I call everyone else, of course. Fine. Do that. She hangs up in my ear, already bored with the conversation. Shoving my phone back in my pocket, I check the steeping tea. It's still too hot. I walk over to check on Cheyenne. How are you feeling over here? She lifts her head to look at me, and my heart sinks. She's very pale and still shivering. I can't seem to get warm, she mumbles, and my concern becomes a stabbing fear. Okay. Don't panic, uh, this is temporary. You just need time and some more heat. I carry her to the couch nearest the fireplace, trying not to give in to panic myself. Her skin is cold and clammy, and her hands and feet are red. I shuck off my coat, suit coat and shoes. She remains shivering under her comforter. Without thinking about it, I sit next to her and wrap the comforter around us both to warm her with my body heat. What are you doing? She's mildly surprised. She seems sleepy. That worries me more than anything. I left my heated blanket at home, so you get a heated me instead. The leather jacket kept my clothing dry. It takes all my willpower not to wrap my arms around her, and even then I'm tempted. I start to wonder. Why not? I'm not in this marriage voluntarily. Cheyenne knows it, and Crystal treats me like a leper. Why not rebel? Cheyenne lays her head on my shoulder, and my arm goes around her as if by reflex, cuddling her slight, shivering form against my side. Okay, there. Does that feel better? Is that a trick question? She's perking up. I could stay like this for the entire storm. Take Cheyenne as my partner, what an enticing thought. But then what? If we can sneak around, I will wind up hurting her by always leaving her on the fringes of my life. Or I can come clean, call off the wedding, propose to this woman who I actually want, and then... Then lose her anyway, because Crystal's father would release his blackmail material, and she would know the idiot I am when drowned in booze and grief. My grip on her tightens, and she slides an arm around me with a soft sound that's almost like a purr. The feel of her shy fingers through my shirt sends a fresh tingle through me. I cover her hand with mine and hold it over my pounding heart. This is too risky. I'll only disappoint her, hurt her, and lose her. Don't let go, she whispers against my neck. I should protest. What I want is to carry her to bed and sleep with her until my life, the storm, and the whole world goes away. But I can't afford it. Or can I? And so, undecided, I sit there with her in my arms, the quilt bundled around us, and a storm raging outside the lodge and inside me. Chapter 5 Cheyenne 
Darren holds me in his arms. As the warmth slowly seeps back into my body and numbness is replaced by the full spectrum of my sensations, this simple fact registers. My face tucked against his neck, I'm cradled with him beneath the comforter, and my skin is coming alive. I don't want to let go. His words echo in my ears, their almost desperate tone telling me he's been aching for me too. And suddenly, I'm fighting an inner war. He wants me as well. But he's marrying another, and has never let on about his interest before now. Why? The one thing that kept me from so much as flirting with Darren through the years has been his apparent lack of interest. Now I see that he's simply been hiding it. With the dam now open, I want to kiss him. How can he possibly force himself to go with that neurotic ice queen if he in fact wants me? It's pissing me off just thinking about it. The storm breaks through my thoughts. I hear the wind roar. I look to see what it's like outside. It is now almost completely white. The trees are nothing but grayish shadows. Some of them move. Darren's grip on me tightens protectively as some of those long gray shapes tilt forward and topple into the road. The sound of splintering wood rises over the storm, and a few chunks of wood slam against the armored glass. My lungs burn, I'm holding my breath. A moment later, the rumbling stops, leaving behind the hiss of blown snow sliding against the glass. The wind knocks some of the trees down, Darren mutters into my hair, and I let out my breath in a rush. Seems like we're blocked in completely. There's fatalism in his voice, as if he's accepted that we're trapped. I guess that's not too daunting. This place is fully stocked and has generators if we lose power. But I don't understand his serenity, until I see the soft gleam in his eyes. He's a good man. He doesn't want to cheat on his fiance or even duck her for more than a few hours. But now, he's being forced to do the second. He's here, trapped alone with me. How long can we hold out up here? I turn my face away from his neck so he can hear me. Some of the trees are now truncated, their jagged remnants rising against the swirling white like broken teeth. I'm frightened and conflicted, thought but a serene resignation is undeniably settling over me, too. His body is warming mine, driving away the chill that seeped into my bones in those minutes outside. And if I'm trapped, I'm trapped with the man of my dreams. Does Crystal know? I feel a stab of guilt. She may be divorced from any empathy but she's awfully high-strung and jealous, and not stupid. Maybe she doesn't care where her future husband's heart is, as long as she's got control of the rest of him. I slide my hand up his chest as the storm ebbs for a moment. Darren? You never answered my question. He gives me a smoldering look, as if he's going to kiss me. I eagerly lift my face toward his, and he hesitates. A week if we have to. We may lose power, but we'll be fine until the storm ends. I close my eyes. And we're here until the road's cleared. Which could be for quite a while longer. Yes indeed, he acknowledges in a low, throaty tone. Alone, I say needlessly, with just a bit of an edge on it. Yes? His hand slides up my shoulder and warmly circles the back of my neck. His breath catches as I roll my head in his grip. It's inevitable, I realize, feeling his low rumble of pleasure vibrate his chest. Even one night will be too long to wait. Both of us want this too much. Darren's phone shrills again. Oh come on, he growls. He gently lifts me from his lap sitting me back down in a comforter nest, now warmed by his body. I breathe in the soft whiffs of cologne and sigh, feeling his sudden absence as keenly as if a part of myself just got up and walked across the room. He answers at once. What is it, Crystal? He snaps, not even attempting to hide his annoyance. He listens for a moment, a scowl deepening on his face. No, that's really none of your father's business. Dr. Hiltman is one of the most unethical men in the pharmaceutical industry. If he's taking an interest in our business up in the mountains, it can't be a good thing. I understand that he is my future father-in-law. However, he has no business looking into how my company is run or into confidential statements made by our clients and trade allies. I have an obligation to my board to restrict that information. His shoulders tense and his tone is low and authoritative. He is strictly business. A pause stretches. 
I hear the storm, the soft rasp of his breathing, and that faint nasal twitter of Crystal's voice. The fingers of his free hand ball into a fist. No, I'm not at liberty to discuss which client I was meeting. That was the sole condition. Another pause. Don't try to manipulate me, Crystal. You're bad at it. My heart's beating quickly. Somehow, the Hiltman suspect the deal, about the rescued chemotherapy patents. That could be bad. They can't actually sue successfully for those patents, but they could tangle it up in legal red tape for years. And Hiltman would likely do it, just to spite Darren for beating him to the punch. Why is this so difficult to understand? Darren snaps into the phone. Has anyone in your life ever told you no, Crystal? No. Darren replies firmly, as if dealing with a child in mid-tantrum. No. If he wants that information, he'll have to ask me himself, instead of having you cajole me like this. He licks his lips and glances at me as she goes quiet. Listen, Crystal. I don't know why he's leaning on you for this information. The meeting was routine except for its location. He doesn't want to shout, he's not the kind of man that raises that rumbling voice of his to women. I get up wrapped in the comforter and stumble toward him, my legs still weak but functional. I didn't even get what I came for anyway, all right? I'll give you specifics later. I have to sort out how to wait out the storm here. He sounds astonished. Damn it, Crystal, could you stop being your father's puppet for five minutes? I'm close enough that I hear her hang up. He drops the phone and face palms, letting out a sigh of exasperation. I lay a hand on his back, and he straightens slightly. Turn the phone off, I suggest. But what about emergency services, and? He looks at his phone and then picks it up, staring at it. Turn it off anyway. My hand curls around his bicep feeling the warm muscle through his shirt as my fingers slowly slide up and down. They won't be able to get to us for hours, even if service lasts. He stands rigid, his back to me, his muscles tight. I'm tired of watching him suffer, while I only try to be a friend. That isn't what either of us deserves. I slowly walk around him, trailing my hand around his body so it ends up over his pounding heart. No one can get in at us here, I announce gazing up at him. He turns the phone off and sets it aside, his eyes never leaving mine. His hands brush my shoulders lightly, and I drop the comforter and move up against him. Neither of us speak. Outside, the wind's wail rises and falls as the snow patters against the roof and walls. And the lights go out. Chapter 6 Cheyenne the blackout swallows the interior of the bright warm lodge, leaving only the swirling gray brilliance of the storm washing over everything. I freeze, and Darren's arms engulf me protectively again. Small emergency lights flick on over the doorways, and somewhere in the basement, a backup generator rumbles to life. We both wait, listening, hanging on to each other. His hand cups the back of my neck and his heart pounds against my cheek. I close my eyes, breathing in his scent, allowing the heat rolling off his toned body to soothe me. It feels so good to be in his arms, even in the middle of all this craziness, it steals away my fears. Until now, my need for Darren was a romanticized, abstract thing, a craving for his embrace and fantasies of kisses. Now though, it is all too real, a hunger he stoked up and then satisfied. I felt him, and now I want more. Shit, he utters, surprising me. He raises his eyes awkwardly. What is it? I ask, a thread of apprehension working its way through my bliss. I didn't use protection. I'm sorry. I got carried away. Thanks to my engagement, I haven't been with anyone in months. I smile reassuringly. I had a hormonal IUD put in months ago. We're good. It was an optimistic decision at the time, one I was never happier to have chosen. It's not as if I had planned to seduce Darren. It's just that I wanted it to be someone I desired like Darren, and that has never happened. He gives a relieved sigh and kisses me. Oh good. I hold him gently and pull the comforter over us. The noise of the terrible storm outside doesn't keep me awake for more than a minute. 
I fall asleep with his warm weight covering me, so satisfied that I'm almost smug. You and your family are going to lose this one, Crystal. He's mine, no matter what you try. Chapter 7 Garen That was my first time, Cheyenne tells me in the dark. We're both still waking up, but her soft admission startles me the rest of the way awake. I lean up as she curls up on my chest. Yesterday. With you. Both flattered and sad, I start to stroke her hair. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. I keep waiting for the shame to register. I just took the stereotypical executive's road to perdition, cheating on my fiancé with my secretary. But the fiancé is Crystal and the secretary is Cheyenne. Dot and I am so much in love right now, I barely care how much trouble I'm in. It's okay, she responds softly. I was worried about never getting to have you. You can turn on the light, I reassure. Just only use the ones you need. I don't know how long we're stuck here, and the generator will run out of fuel eventually. The light flicks on, making me glance away the moment her lovely silhouette moves out of sight. The door closes, leaving me in darkness again while she showers. I'm starving. I scoop up my pants and underwear and step into them, zipping up as I walk out into the great room. The windows are unbroken, but the storm is still raging. We'll be here for at least a few days. I make us breakfast and serve it by candlelight. We devour the eggs, bacon, and English muffins while we stare at each other, long silences stretching between us, no need for words. This is where I belong. This is who I belong with. I want only her. Only her. There in our Snowden Haven, I only become more determined to make Cheyenne, and not Crystal my wife. For three days we discuss it, demonstrate it, and take our passions out on each other. For three days everything is perfect. But I still don't know how I'm going to free myself of Hiltman and his ice-blooded daughter. When Cheyenne and I go back to Boston, and that time will come, I can only give her a promise that I'll figure something out. Unfortunately, Crystal is the first person I will have to deal with. And I won't even get enough sleep. Are you paying attention, Darren? Crystal's nasal voice cut sharply through my thoughts. I gaze sleepily at her. MMH, sorry. Coffee first, active listening after. My head is pounding. It's 6 a.m., and I was up until 3. Not intentionally, my thoughts kept me awake. My thoughts, and Cheyenne's absence beside me in bed for the first time in three days. Crystal is as chilly as a ski slope at dawn. I have no idea when or even if she went to bed, but she's more pulled together than anyone has a right to be this early in the day. Dressed all in white, from her skirt suit to her stockings to her white gold jewelry. Her light blonde hair is up in a perfect chignon, her pale blue eyes are delicately lined, and they fix on me disapprovingly as I stifle a yawn. The reason she looks so good is that she got her attendant up at four to get her ready. Poor Ellen doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. I even said so, but Crystal, as usual, when I say something she doesn't want to hear, pretends that her ears aren't working and breezes past into another subject. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with you once we're married if you're this useless early in the morning. She takes up her coffee in its little bone china cup and sips at it as delicately. Yes, well, human beings sleep, I point out as I pour myself an enormous mug of mocha java. She fixes that irritated stare on my Red Sox mug, forcing me to repress a smirk at her petty annoyance with my taste. Don't keep wasting my time, Darren. I don't like repeating myself, she scolds with one of those arch little sniffs that already drive me crazy. When I first met her, having realized my fate already thanks to her father, she seemed fussy but all right, beautiful certainly and well-bred but neurotic, like a show poodle. Then we talked for five minutes. You're the one wasting your time barging in here before nine. This is my mansion, not hers, every bit of it claimed from the warm exposed brick to the light-filled breakfast nook we sit in now. All I did was let her in, but no more concessions. She shoots me a sulky look and sniffs again, sipping at her coffee. Why on earth do you make this so strong, 
she complains, changing the subject while still picking at me. I don't want my hands to shake for my manicure. I asked if you wanted tea, I point out, and take another reviving gulp from my mug. Anyway, I make it strong because I need it strong. I was up until three. Her delicate little frown deepened slightly. Doing what? Working, I lie. No way am I telling her that I spent the last evening pining for another woman. That would likely get me more shit than admitting to her that I spent the three evenings before that intensely making love to another woman. Cheyenne. Just thinking about her leaves me stiff. From famine to feast, and then back to famine again. I down another scalding swallow of coffee and shake my head. It's not the time with her that I regret right now, sitting here drinking coffee as quickly as I can tolerate it in an attempt to keep my eyes open. No, not at all. I'll never regret a single moment I spent with Cheyenne. I wouldn't change a stroke. It's returning to face all this crap that I regret. I regret not taking Cheyenne sooner. Before Crystal. Before any of this. Father called again, Crystal is saying, and I glance at her over the rim of my mug before draining it. That's why I'm here. He was very insistent. Shit. Well, I knew this conversation was coming after those calls at the hunting lodge. Yeah. He still wants the name of your client. The one who you went up into the mountains to make a business deal with. The acidic swells in her tone, turns the coffee bitter in my mouth. Why does he care who I sell the hunting lodge to? I ask, feigning irritability, using Cheyenne's well-thought-up lie like a shield. Thank goodness we talked about this before we left. Crystal blinks and sets her cup down. I thought that you were there on company business. The lodge is a company holding. I entertain clients there. Why is your father interested in my hunting lodge? I asked, keeping my tone mildly incredulous. Oh. She blinks rapidly as she takes up her cup again, as if to hide some strong emotion. Disappointment, probably. You're the one who keeps sending tidbits of information on me, on to Daddy. A moment later, she confirms my suspicions. Do you know a Dr. James Abrams? Oh, you snake. You really are his little spy. Yes, he was one of my father's old partners. Retired right after Dad died. Apparently he lives up near there. My father was curious as to whether or not you were visiting him. Her eyes search my face. I set my coffee mug down slowly. Why has Hiltman been keeping tabs on Abram's location? No, I was at my lodge. Last I heard, Abram's was in hospice in some shitty town up in the mountains. I hate going to those depressing places. James Abrams will probably die in his own bed, in his own cabin, on his own land in the mountains, on his own terms, as far as I know. But the fact that Hiltman knows where he is, and worries that much about my meeting with him, bothers me more than I can let on. Has he been keeping tabs because of the patents? Waiting like a vulture for Abrams to drop so he can snap them up? I wouldn't put it past him. Somehow, this feels like there might be more than that to it. Oh. I can't tell if she's relieved or disappointed. Her tiny frown is back, and she's fiddling with her coffee cup. Well then. I guess it was nothing, after all. If he'd like a look at the lodge, I offer, but she holds up a narrow hand dismissively. He never leaves Boston if he can help it. Her voice is crisp, matter-of-fact, and deathly bored, like she's exasperated with her father's eccentricities. He hates the countryside, in fact he's infamous for it. Refuses to go anywhere with fewer than a thousand people. Something about this rings an alarm in my head, but I can't make any connection. I'm just too tired. I see. Never mind then. Why get rid of the lodge? She isn't even looking at me anymore. Her duty's done, the truth pried out of me. I'm guessing she'll leave soon. This is my future. I suddenly feel exhausted. I can't keep writing it off if no clients actually want to go out to the mountain for the weekend. Many of them are like your father, very urban. Very civilized, you mean, she sneers delicately. 
Who on earth would want to go out somewhere where the only entertainment is shooting at animals? I've only ever shot the wildlife with a camera. My smile is entirely forced now. She pauses, blinking. Oh, I thought you went there weekends to kill things. No, I have trail cams I put up there and stuff. Is that one of the reasons she's so cold to me? You thought I was a trophy hunter. My mistake, she says, shocking me utterly for a moment. I guess I shouldn't have assumed that. For once she has actually left me speechless. Was that an apology? She sets down the half-drunk coffee and changes the subject on a dime. So, I trust you'll be attending our Christmas festivities this year, as we're to be married soon after. It sounds like a command, but her eyes look inquisitive. There's no way I am wasting my favorite holiday on her or her nightmare of a family. I'll find a way out of this. But for now, I need to keep the peace. Of course. Christmas has always been special to me. Growing up, it was a time for family and friends, a time when my father set aside all his business concerns and took us up to the lodge to celebrate in style. I remember waking up to wood smoke, cocoa steam, and the perfume of the Christmas tree all mixing aromatically in my nostrils. Replacing it with a cold, staid, formal meal with my captor and his jail warden sounds like a nightmare. Piltman can put a gun to my head, I don't care. Their farce of a celebration is the afternoon of the 23rd. I won't be spending it with them. What's more, I know already who I want to spend it with instead. As Crystal got up to leave, I blurt out, Why are you marrying me anyway? She shoots me a sharp look. What? You've never told me why you agreed to this arrangement. I honestly don't know, thinking about it now, if she knows about the blackmail. She shrugs so carelessly it infuriates me, but I manage to keep my small, curious smile. You're wealthy and unattached, and my family wants your assets. What else is there? My smile feels like it's frozen on my face. What indeed? I ask mildly as I get up to see her out. Chapter 8 Garen the first thing Cheyenne asks when she hears me on the phone is, what's wrong? Everything. But I can only tell you some of it. Hiltman has been keeping tabs on Abrams. I don't know why. I suspect he is plotting to snatch those patents, but there may be more to it. Crap. Okay. So now what? I hear the rustle of her puttering around. It sounds like she's already getting ready to come join me. I need to talk to Abrams again. But first I need make sure those patent papers are all filed. I can't let them sit. He sent his daughter, sniffing around for information at six this morning. You mean your fiancé? I can't help but notice the edge to her voice. Yes. I can't keep the conflict out of my voice either. Neither one of us wanted to come back down off that mountain once the plows came through, but duty called. For now, anyway. I look over at the half-empty cup on my breakfast table. It's been sitting there cold for two hours. I have avoided touching it, as if it might contaminate me. It occurs to me suddenly that Crystal has never allowed me to touch her, beyond a single tepid silk-gloved handshake. I don't even know what her skin feels like. I don't even know if she likes men. She already admitted she's only marrying my wallet and on daddy's orders. It does seem strange that they're both so obsessed with your potential meeting with Abrams. Her tone has gone thoughtful, and I let out a silent sigh of relief at the change in subject. I know I told you to take a few days off after everything. But I need you. I really need your help handling all this paper discreetly. I'll be there in 15 minutes. You sure you're all right? It sounds like you haven't gotten enough sleep. Her genuine concern makes my chest hitch painfully. I'll take care of it. Let's just get this done first. I must deal with those patents before Hiltman catches on. Fortunately, Cheyenne understands. Right. Put the coffee on, and I'll see you in 15. She hangs up, and I find myself smiling for the first time since the Ice Princess rang my doorbell at 6. 
It only gets better when I finally open the door for her. When she sees me, her eyes brighten. Her smile lights up my world. She hurries forward and then comes to a stop. She's eager for my arms, despite everything. I'm certainly eager for hers. We seem to realize at once that it's a bad idea back in Boston. I stand there aching for her. But the paperwork's waiting, and I know better than to distract myself from that. Finally, I step around behind her to take her coat. How are you doing? I didn't ask earlier. I didn't sleep, she murmurs, shame nipping at me. I missed you too much. I close my eyes, nodding, not sure what to say. I didn't sleep either, not daring to admit more. Same reason. Let's not get the filing over with, she resigns, stepping back into her old sterile role as nothing more than my assistant. I nod again and lead her upstairs into my office where the folder of signed papers waits. The preparation for the legal filing takes 45 minutes to complete and another half hour to take to my lawyer downtown. Once Jacoby is done with it, I propose Chinese takeout to Cheyenne, and she agrees. So, what are you doing for Christmas? I ask as we bundle the steaming boxes of takeout back in through my door. Not much of anything, she admits awkwardly. She's already told me that she has no family to speak of. Want to spend it with me? It comes out even before I mean it to, and we both blink at each other, startled by my audacity. She opens her mouth, probably to ask me why I'm spending Christmas with one woman when I'm marrying another. She simply asks me why. I lead her into my kitchen, snatching Crystal's cold coffee off the table and setting the warm bag of food cartons in its place. You know how special Christmas is to me. These people, not who want to be my relatives, aren't. You are. Then why? She can't even bring herself to ask the full question. Maybe she's worried the answer will break her heart. I'll explain what I can about this messed up engagement when I can. Soon. Any time I have in my life, I would rather spend with you than them. Something in my expression makes her soften, and she slips into the seat Crystal vacated hours ago. I'll think about it. I need to at least know that there's a good reason you're marrying someone you don't even like. I take out the cartons one by one, lining them up to buy time. I find the disposable chopsticks and separate a pair with a hard snap as I try to find the right words. Blackmail, I finally admit simply, Dot and I watch her eyes widen. What? Crystal's father is blackmailing me into marrying. They want my money and my holdings, and since Hiltman's attempts at a hostile takeover have failed, he figures he'll get it the old-fashioned way, by forcibly tying me to his family. I grab a couple of black stoneware bowls out of the cupboard, as she stares at me in disbelief. What happened? Did you get her pregnant or something? Or something? Let's just say that he's found some skeletons in my family closet, and he'll use them to ruin me if I don't follow his wishes. It's a relief to tell her, even though it makes her unhappy. What she doesn't yet know is that I can never tell her what Hiltman actually has on me. So that's it. You're not two-timing her, you're being forced. Her expression goes from shock to a mix of anger and sympathy. I wondered for so long. This all seemed so out of character for you. I. I set down my chopsticks across my bowl and look over at her. I intend to find a way to counter his blackmail so I can do what I want. Be with who I want. And I reach over and I give her hand a squeeze. Her smile trembles and her eyes get too bright. It might take time. The wedding may go forward. If it does, I can still get out, but the divorce will cost me half my fortune. As I gaze at her earnestly, something shifts inside of me. She's not leaving. She's not judging. She's not even asking for the uncomfortable specifics. Good thing that. She squeezes my hand back, staring at me. Thank you for telling me. I've got no idea what they have on you, but there has to be a way out from under this. You know I'll help you all I can. You're already helping, I mutter thickly, choked up suddenly. You didn't take off the moment I told you the truth. 
She strokes my hand reassuringly. You really thought I would? Thinking and worrying are two different things. I don't want to lose you. I plant a kiss in the center of her palm. You won't lose me, she promises, her soft eyes looking up at me lovingly, unless you leave me waiting too long. I won't, I say earnestly. I'll find a way to fix this. I'd chuck my whole fortune to have you. She smiles softly, dot and invitingly. You know, dot the food can wait. We don't make it to my bedroom in time. This seems to be a habit with us. Do whatever you want to me, she whispers, and I grin wickedly at the invitation. Chapter 9 Cheyenne I wake up in a warm darkness, made cozy by the hot bulk of the man breathing softly beside me. I blink at the dim ceiling for a few moments, delicious lassitude mixing unpleasantly with a creeping sense of conflict. The other woman. I never wanted to be in this position, sneaking around behind the back of a girlfriend or wife with a faithless man. But here I am, waking up beside a guy who is marrying someone else in two months. As I lie there, I split into three and begin to argue with myself. I love him, says one part of me, and he loves me. He's trapped into this marriage, and he's trying to get out of it. Then he'll be with me. Then there's the cautious part of me that always kept me safe from predatory men. Men lie to get in bed all the time. You know that. Could he be just taking advantage of your crush on him? And there's the angry, rebellious part that repressed itself for years while thinking that Darren did not want me. What gives this skank the right to take him from me? He wants to be with me. I'll wreck her life if she tries to interfere. I press my lips, swallowing the lump in my throat. I should go back home to my own apartment and make sure that Darren doesn't become the center of my world when I'm only peripheral to his. I linger, knowing the whole time I shouldn't. I can't sleep, and I don't want to wake Darren, who seems exhausted. I'll never tire of cuddling with him. Could you just be mine instead of hers? I don't have a fortune, but we'll be happy. And you won't have to tie yourself to those horrible people. Then I sigh into my pillow. I watch him sleep for a while longer, but pulling myself together wins out, and I reluctantly slip out of the bed. I shower, do my hair, fix my makeup, get dressed, and the whole time Darren sleeps. When I come out of the bathroom, as polished as when I arrived in his penthouse four hours before, he's still snoozing. I wander around for a while, too distracted to drive. It's an old Boston mansion from the Gilded Age, not quite as grand as some of the New York ones, though still opulent. I walk past marble columns, embroidered hangings, a Van Gogh sunflower I examine for a few moments before realizing that, yes, and it's an original. Darren has always been honest and kind. He was only a little bit wild in his youth, which given rich young guys is probably saying something. I can't imagine him actually wanting to do anybody any harm. And yet, doubt squeezes in again. What blackmail material could be so juicy and damaging to force him into a marriage? Or is he lying about being blackmailed? What could he have done that he doesn't want anyone to know about? Perhaps it can be sorted out. I walk past a ten-foot-long landscape painted from the peak of Mount Greylock, trying to reassure myself. Maybe things are as he said, he's being forced, and he's trying to get out of this situation. Darren will find a way. He's not just powerful and wealthy, he's clever and he's good. And he loves me. Maybe I should trust him and help him where I can. And yet as I walk those deserted halls, doubt and frustration gnaw at me. I never wanted to be in this position. May I help you? I look up and see a lean, spiffy man in white gloves and a dark suit, his red hair slicked back into an immaculate gleaming cap. I'm Jacob, he says with a polite smile. Head of staff here. You are Miss Cheyenne, correct? Yes, I say, offering a hand. I'm the one who looks after Darren in the office, as you do at home. He shakes it briefly, his glove barely transferring warmth. Pleased to meet you. May I assume that our employer does not wish to be disturbed? I wouldn't worry about him calling for anything until around supper. My smile is just pasted on as my heartbeat picks up. 
He was up working until three, and then... Then Miss Crystal came, I'm aware. The smile goes awry. I'll have supper served with a pot of coffee then. I remember the Chinese food we left, and wonder belatedly if this man cleaned up the cartons. And what he knows or at least suspects. You seem troubled, he observes, making it clear once again he doesn't miss much. You seem a bit lost. Is everything all right? His dark blue eyes are kind. I take a deep breath and spill a little truth. I just, I'm wondering about some things going on around here. He nods, his eyes fixed on me keenly. Miss Crystal's primary concern is executing the will of her father, I suspect. You should know that she offered me several thousand dollars to provide her with information on whether our employer had any female visitors. The delicate way he walks around the subject makes it obvious, he knows everything. And yet he only seems concerned. What dot did you tell her? I smiled, accepted the money, went to our employer, and told him everything. Since then he's been feeding me a set of fictions to keep her happy. He looks at me speculatively. Why is he marrying her, Jacob? I burst with breathless desperation. She's awful. Her father is worse. It doesn't make any sense, nodding, he ushers me into a nearby office. We stand by the window, which looks out on a sleek but yellowing lawn laced with thin snow. What you must understand, Miss Cheyenne, is that our employer has skeletons in his closet. He has never been a bad man or a cruel one, never committed any crimes, never done any real harm to anyone. He's quite as he appears. But when his father was murdered, he went slightly mad for a while. I brace myself. Darren has never spoken of his father's murder, except in the vaguest of terms. I know it pains and enrages him to dwell on it, so I do my best never to bring it up. After the case went cold and his father was buried without the poisoner being found, Darren, I fear, became a bit self-destructive. Without delving too deeply into his private business, he made a few reckless decisions then when he wasn't fully in control of himself. Unfortunately, any record of his actions would very likely cause a scandal among his shareholders if it became public knowledge and do both his business and personal reputation irreparable damage. How did Hiltman get his hands on the information, though? I doubt that any of the staff would actually take one of his or his daughter's bribes on Jacob's watch. It's most likely that he hired someone to buy the information from the other persons involved. The scandal generated more rumors than was easy to contain, and any competent investigator could have put the pieces together. Jacob scowls briefly at that, his eyes locked on the line of bare maples beyond the lawn. And if he follows through, marries her, and then gets a divorce, she gets half his fortune and pretty much wins anyway. I peer in that direction and see the far-off hawk he's watching, clutching the top of a dormant maple. It's exactly as you say, he concedes. I don't envy our employer, whatever his indiscretions. I look over at this elegant, seemingly compassionate man, and wonder the same thing I caught myself wondering about Darren. Can I trust him? For now, I simply need to know one thing, he says quietly, gazing at me, with regards to your presence here. For your report to Crystal? I lift an eyebrow, somewhere between wary and conspiratorial. Yes? His smile is tight, polite, and a bit amused. Well, our employer is doing more work at home, since he began looking for a buyer for his hunting lodge, and he will be requiring my presence here more and more. It comes out smoothly, like I rehearsed it, and I wonder at myself. He lifts his chin, and his smile becomes a touch more genuine. His eyes twinkle. Very good then, he says. As he sees me out, he asks, Have you considered visiting for our annual Christmas party? I stop to look at him curiously as he stands with his hand on the door. Won't he be eating with the Hiltmans? I know he wants to spend the day with me, but I have no idea how he plans to pull it off without their intervention. He chuckles brief and dry like a cough. I doubt he will spend his favorite holiday with anyone he does not care for. Have a good evening, Miss Cheyenne. Traffic is thick as I drive home. I fight my way through it, my boxy gray Volvo taking over streets made slick and muddy from meltwater. The wind has blown the leaves off the trees, 
the gutters are full of crimson and gold where the snow doesn't cling. Parting from Darren saddens me again, but I need time to think, and that means time alone. When I'm with him, I can only think of him. Maybe I should stay away for a while. I turn off the main boulevard onto the narrow side street where my subdivided brownstone awaits. Still ahead of me, I have all the chores and errands saved for my days off. I decide to do my chores first. I don't want to deal with any more people right now. Someone has parked in my spot again, a black sedan with New York plates and a parking ticket already fluttering away under its windshield wiper. The tow truck is probably coming already. The building manager, Miranda, watches everything around our building like a tiny Cuban hawk. I circle around and find parking a block away. Even though I am well prepared for the winter day, I feel cold on the short walk back to my house. I tell myself I need time away from Darren, but even as I just left him not so long ago, his absence yanks at me. Chapter 10 Darren. Where were you until late morning? Crystal doesn't even look up from cutting the thin slice of turkey on her plate, but her voice clearly has a hard edge. I fight not to roll my eyes as she, her father, and a menagerie of cousins and widowed aunts peer at me expectantly. These interrogations are constant, forcing me to lie elaborately and with the virtuosity of a much less moral man. So far it has been working while I'm behind the scenes with Cheyenne to free myself. I slept in. I give her a patient smile. Sorry, darling. I slept in and Cheyenne was in my arms. Your location. She has all the warmth of a parole officer. The blood tests. I told you yesterday at breakfast, remember? My voice stays light. We made love four times between yesterday afternoon and today. Four. Times. You've never so much as given me a peck on the cheek, you walking ice sculpture. The blood tests? She looks confused. Yes, the genetic screening compatibility tests and all those things you asked for. My voice is endlessly patient. Oh, she says quietly and sits back in her chair blinking. Very good then. Nothing. You're just daddy's little spy. I search for a gravy boat on their dining table, which is a single 30-foot slice of California redwood. Their entire mansion screams of Las Vegas-style excess, but then there are also strangely barren spots like this table. No gravy. Shit. And whoever made this turkey sliced it well, but it's as dry as a stack of paper towels. So how soon until you get those test results? Piltman brays from across the table. He's the opposite of his nervous, prissy daughter, sprawling in his chair, bald-headed and pale-suited, with his chin sunk into his jowls. I stab my knife into the stack of dry turkey breast slices and glare up at him. Two weeks. I want that grandson. His wet smoker's chuckle sounds like a sink backing up. I'm sure you do, I reply, and one of the cousins, a teen girl, lets out a thin giggle. When I glance her way, she busies herself with her meal. She's spindly and nervous like Crystal, and I wonder if her parents plan to use her to rope in some other stranger's fortunes as well. Two weeks for a full panel. Inconvenient. Crystal eyes me as if I'm somehow responsible, then sniffs again. At least it will be done before Christmas. Maybe you two should get started on that kid now, Hiltman urges with a predatory smile. Give me a little Christmas present. I eye him. This conversation is ridiculous. I'm not some animal you're bringing in for stud. He brays with laughter again. Ha ha. You are if I say you are, kid. You are if I say you are. And the others start tittering as well, all except for Crystal, who simply sniffs and stares at me with machine-like coldness. I must get away from these people. I decline after dinner brandy and cigars with Hiltman and leave as soon as I can. On my way home through the wet streets, I feel sick to my stomach, and not just from the bad cooking. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm never going back to that gilded shithole ever again. I have already decided that I'm never letting those people ruin another of my holidays. In my desperation for a distraction, I find that I'm not driving home. 
I've changed direction on instinct. I'm headed for Cheyenne's. I ring Cheyenne's apartment on the crackly old intercom and wait impatiently until she buzzes me in. Her elevator is broken again, and I take the stairs up to her floor two at a time. She greets me at the door in a pair of violet pajamas with tear streaks drying on her cheeks and the smell of takeout pizza in the air. I hug her tight. Looks like you weren't having the greatest Thanksgiving either. No, she mumbles into my chest, her arms sliding around me. We eat pizza on her couch as her tears dry, and Alice's restaurant plays on the TV. I tell her about my insane Thanksgiving dinner. She starts to cry again. I missed you, she says. My heart sinks. I've already decided. I'm done, I announce softly. I'm spending Christmas with you like I said. It will be you, my friends, even Abrams if he wants to come. What about Hiltman and his daughter? I'll hold it at the lodge. Hiltman won't go anywhere with fewer than a thousand people, and his daughter hates the woods. We'll throw the party on the 23rd and then stay over and have Christmas properly, as a couple. I hesitate, but only for a moment. Some of my friends are familiar with my craziness after my father died, but not everything and not how far I went. Nobody got hurt, and nobody has hard feelings. Not but there will be plenty of hard feelings if my night of ridiculous behavior gets back to my board of directors. What about the blackmail? She asks softly, curling on my lap as she gradually relaxes. Still working that out. I might just take it all on the chin, but... I hesitate again. Cheyenne's the one I want to keep this from the most, even more than the board members. Some things aren't easily forgiven. I'm still hoping Abrams will respond to our request for a meeting. I stroke her hair slowly, then sensually, gripping it at the nape, and then sliding my fingers back through it. Her head starts to loll submissively in my grip, and I see her eyelids getting heavy. Good girl. Just let me take care of you for a while. Do you think he's afraid that you're on Hiltman's side? She looks up at me with those wide, innocent eyes, and I sigh through my nose. Maybe. But something's definitely up between him and Hiltman, and it seemed to make him pretty wary of everyone from Boston. She pouts thoughtfully. Send him an invitation to your Christmas party, and catch him there. It's in his neighborhood, and with the way he talked our ears off, he's lonely. He'll appreciate the invitation no matter what happens. Good idea. I tilt my head and catch her eye. Do you have any friends you would like to invite? A few, but that's pretty out of their way. They'd have to carpool. She's watching my face. I'll arrange transportation, don't worry. This sounds good, it sounds right. It sounds like something normal couples do, and I like it. I want more of it, far away from the gilded world of horrors I just left. I want to introduce you to my friends, and not just as my boss. She licks her lips, and a pleading note enters her voice. Please don't make me keep hiding what we have. It's not for much longer. The disappointment in her eyes cuts me. I kiss her eyes closed. I promise. She lifts her mouth to mine, and we kiss tentatively, feeling for each other across an unexpected and alarming gap. She's losing patience with me, and I don't know what to say. So I take her into her bedroom and slip out of my suit and tie her eyes. I do my best to tell her with caresses just exactly how I feel about her. We drowse in each other's arms, ignoring the chill of the room. A hard rain falls while we sleep. She rolls over to watch it hit the window, and I curl up behind her, burying my nose in her loosened hair. Everything is perfect again. I know it can't last. The moment either one of us speaks aloud, the bubble will burst. I brace myself for it, and a moment later, she states hesitantly, I need to know that you're going to leave her. It's a quiet plea for reassurance, but it feels like a slap. I wonder what she must think of me, being with her for a month with no clarity that she'll ever be more than the other woman. I kiss her shoulder. I'm going to leave her. When? I close my eyes, quiet for a moment. She knows the facts of the matter already, all except for the specific dirt Hiltman has on me. 
but maybe she doesn't really understand my feelings on the matter. I murmur in her ear. If I had just approached you sooner, we'd be together, and none of this would have happened. I live every day with that regret, and I'm sorry that you have to. I can see a faint reflection of her face in the dim rain-spattered window, her expression thoughtful and sad. That's not an answer, Darren. I can't give you a date, I mutter regretfully. They have me by the nuts, and without enough dirt on Hiltman, I can't shake them loose. It's as vulnerable as I've ever been with her. I feel uncomfortable. To my absolute shock, she rolls over at once and looks at me unflinchingly. Then we've got to get that dirt fast, because I can't live like this either. I love you. And I won't be the other woman and let Crystal put her hands on you. I remember Crystal, and her strange attitude of suppressed loathing toward me and everyone else around her. I don't think she actually wants to, I comment blandly. It's just a business arrangement to her. You know, I really wonder about her, she muses thoughtfully. How voluntary is this marriage really? She doesn't seem to care. Then she's either drugged up or lying, and a very good actress. You don't not care about a move that defines your entire future. That's a very good point. I nuzzle her hair as I gaze out over the rain-swept lawn beyond my curtains. Maybe I should ask her. But I'm not relishing the prospect. Crystal is cold and throws up walls whenever I try to talk about anything intimate or personal. I've always thought that she was just a skank. But perhaps there's more to it than that. Maybe it's not me she hates or the world, but her situation. What else can we do? Cheyenne looks back at me urgently, a plea in her eyes that burns me worse than anger. I could deal with her being pissed off at me, yelling at me, but seeing the raw pain, unclothed in anger, breaks my heart. My mind just keeps going back to Abrams, I admit. I haven't come up with anything more. Except maybe just giving up and running off with Cheyenne. Selling the business and just leaving. What about him? I'm not sure why, but Hiltman seemed extraordinarily worried by the prospect of my talking to the old hermit. I slide my hand down her bare arm. So much so he set crystal on me, until he got a satisfactory lie about whether or not we had talked. If he's so worried that you'll talk to Abrams, it's likely about those patents, she reminds me, but that doesn't feel completely right to me. The patents themselves will take years to do him damage. I've done the calculations. He probably has too, if he even knows what Abrams has. Lightning flashes. I nuzzle the top of Cheyenne's head again and stare out at the storm, my eyes taking in the rain, but my mind is up on that mountain again. There must be more to it than that. Abrams knows something that Hiltman once kept private. I'm going to find out what that is. But meanwhile, we must keep our plans very, very quiet. Just like everything else between us, she sighs, and I hug her gently. But then, quite unexpectedly, her skin mists over in a cold sweat. Are you okay? I ask worriedly. I feel a little queasy, she mumbles, swallowing hard. I need water. I nod, but an invasive worry tugs at me as she slips out of bed and heads for her small bathroom. Even the sight of her pert little bottom swaying as she walks doesn't do much to dampen it. When she comes back to bed, she sighs and nestles against me. Better? She shakes her head. Baby pizza so late was a bad idea, she mumbles. That's probably it. I try to convince myself, but the worry doesn't go away. Chapter 11 Cheyenne How bad is it? Darren's deep, concerned voice floats through the bathroom door as I push myself off my knees. My throat is burning, and my mouth tastes like a soap dispenser. He's been here overnight three nights in a row, showing up in the evening, making love to me, sleeping over, and then making me breakfast. It's been wonderful, even if the place is too small for two, it's the one place we don't have to worry about intrusions. Neither Crystal nor her father would set foot in my neighborhood, the wusses. But this morning, the idol's been completely shattered. My appetite has reversed itself, and I can't make it stop. Cheyenne? Darren calls again as I'm rinsing my mouth out. 
My tender midsection heaves again. I almost choke. Damn it. Bad. I manage finally, my chest feeling thick and sore. Throwing up is one of my least favorite things in the world. It's been a week since we first lay in this bed, pledging to chase up Abrams and get whatever information he has on Hiltman. All three of our follow-up emails have gone unanswered. But we're still trying, because there's nothing else to be done about this unless Crystal or somebody else in the know spills the beans on him. That doesn't seem likely. Crystal remains unapproachable but nosy. Nothing has come of my research on Hiltman's relationship to Abrams, and now I'm sick. I have been nauseated every day since Thanksgiving, so much so that I suspected food poisoning. I missed my period. But I have an IUD. What in the world is going on? Maybe we should take you to a doctor. Darren taps at the door again. Could you let me in? I don't want you to see me this way. I wipe my mouth awkwardly, my chest heaving. I reach back and flush the toilet, then lean over the sink to splash water on my face. I'm a mess. I don't give a shit what you look like. Let me in. He taps insistently and I finally sigh. Fine, but don't say I didn't warn you. The door opens and he moves into the room. I awkwardly mop at my face with a fistful of toilet paper like a sniffly teenager. You're pale as a ghost, he notes in a worried tone, and I nod up pathetically. Maybe the doctor is a good idea, I mumble as he helps me get cleaned up. Okay. Do you need anything before we go? He keeps an arm around me as we move slowly out of the bathroom. A sweater. My mind races. I hope he doesn't notice I'm covered in icy sweat. All right then. He gets me to my bed, and I sit down while he rummages through my closet. My head pounds and my muscles hurt from throwing up, but I gamely throw on the fuzzy purple pullover he brings to me. Do you have a fever? No. I can't give voice to my fear yet either. Let's just hit the doctor's office. I'll call over to see if they can fit you in. Otherwise, I know someone else. He pulls out his cell phone. How did we get to this point so fast? He has my doc's number. I have his house key. And I may have his baby in my belly. I'm scared, I say impulsively. No specifics. It's enough. He puts his big warm hand on my back, rubbing it soothingly. It's gonna be okay, he assures me. Neither one of us knows if that's true. But I feel better anyway. We drive to the medical office through a thin flurry of snow, passing half a dozen fender benders in the thick traffic. I huddle in the passenger seat and wrap my arms around my belly, wondering what to think of myself. Well, here I am, about to become a single mom because my boss has been cheating on his fiancée with me. I feel like a walking stereotype, dot and an idiot. I can only hope, as our tires skid on the thin gray snow that coats the road, that Darren is as good, as kind and as attached to me as I've been thinking. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm going to do. The waiting room is empty. Only desperately sick fools like me venture outside. Dr. Grebe is tall and sharp-nosed with a strong jaw and narrow intelligent gray eyes. I sit there in that familiar pale blue gown and tell her about my symptoms while Darren paces audibly in the waiting room outside. You think you might be pregnant? She finally asks. I shift uncomfortably and nod. I don't understand how, though. The IUD has been in less than a year. Should still be good, right? She furrows her brow and checks my chart. Says here the implant was a success. The lab verified it a month later. It doesn't make any sense. Getting an IUD was a decision fueled by the desire to avoid this exact scenario. I didn't know when I would finally meet someone worth sleeping with. Just because it hadn't happened by the time I decided to get the implant didn't mean that I never would. So I didn't worry about pregnancy all those times I was with Darren. Well, we don't know if you're pregnant for a fact, but you certainly are showing all the classic symptoms. We'll know more when your blood and urine panel come up. The guys at the lab claim they just cleared their backlog, so it shouldn't be long. It didn't take long at all, but it felt like an eternity. 
With my heartbeat pounding in my ears, all I can do is ask, so why didn't the IUD work? Well, I'll have to check, but my suspicion is that if you check for your IUD strings, you won't find them. You may have expelled the IUD during a recent period. Have you been able to feel your string recently? A flush of embarrassment heats my face as I wonder if I messed up. Had I even checked in the last dizzy month? I thought I felt it after my last period, but a lot has been going on. I consider what stress does to my body and with how stressful it's been, first without Darren and then with him, but with no guarantees. My periods have been especially difficult lately. Wouldn't I have noticed? Not always. If your period's bad enough, the cramping and pain of expelling the IUD wouldn't feel unusual. The doctor tilts her head and peers at me, then brings me a cup of water. I sip it while I'm pregnant with Darren's child clangs around in my head. And he doesn't even suspect. I have no idea how to tell him. That must be what happened. So what happens now? It feels like my head is floating off my shoulders, and the noise of my heart is too loud. That depends on you. Do you want to keep the baby? She's watching me carefully. I wonder if she's considering giving me a sedative. I should first talk to the father about that. I take a long shivering breath, my chest hurting. Maybe I do need a sedative, but I'm too queasy to ask for it. Let me know what you decide, she says kindly, and I nod and practically stumble out. If he begs off of being with me now, I don't know what I'm going to do. I ask him to drive us out to the nearest park. What is it? he asks me very gently. I'm pregnant. Silence stretches between us. Tears threaten and I swallow them back like bile. The IUD? he asks quietly. The doc suspects an expulsion. I couldn't feel the string when I checked. I don't know whether to apologize or not. Oh. His expression closes, and his gaze flicks over the spidery limbs of the trees with their payload of sparrows. An accident, then. A hot lash of anger rushes through me. Of course it was. He startles a bit, then nods. Sorry, that came out wrong. I'm still stinging, and he's still quiet as he drives us back to his mansion. As he pulls into the driveway and the iron gate closes behind us, he finally says, I have to think about what to do. But meanwhile, I can't say anything to anyone, right? No way to keep the bitterness out of my tone. Now I'm ten times the dirty secret than I was before. He pulls to a full stop halfway up the drive, turning to reason with me. If Hiltman and his daughter find out you are pregnant, they will have that much more leverage against us. He sounds so terribly sensible, but right now, in this moment, with the world caving in on me, I have to fight not to tell him to piss off. What do they have on you, that you do everything Hiltman says? He huffs out a breath. If I told you what a stupid shithead I was right after Dad's murder. As his words trail off, I remember what his butler said and lean back into my seat, closing my eyes. Leaving me to guess won't do anybody any good either, Darren. The look of mild panic that this big powerful man gives me deepens my despair and worry. I need him to be honest and strong with me. Instead, he's reminding me of an oversized teenager. Look, I just found out I got you pregnant. Can't the rest wait? I roll my eyes closed, my heart sinking. Fine. Of course it's not fine. But it becomes even less fine when we drive up to the parking circle and discover Crystal's white rolls parked at the top of the drive. Crap. I'm sorry. I'll find out what she wants. Do you want to relax here for a minute? He's asking, not telling, but I understand the implication and nod to let him know that I won't be causing a scene. He parks behind the rolls and gets out. At the same time, Crystal's small, bald driver comes out of his seat and opens the door for her. She comes out wrapped in ermine, her head up and her eyes flashing in our direction. I sit in my seat exhausted, nauseated, and hurt, fighting anger and fear. I watch the two through the windshield as they approach each other and start arguing. I can't bring myself to move, get out, or speak, I can only watch them. Why is that woman in your car, she demands. She is my assistant, remember? 
I know you have trouble telling our employees apart, but this is getting ridiculous. He keeps his voice surprisingly even. What's she doing coming to your home in the front seat of your private car? She demands again, pointing at me as if I am the culprit. She's been sleeping with me for a month. That's what he should say. She's been sleeping with me for a month, we love each other, and I really want to punch you in the teeth for getting in the way. Instead, I just keep watching and listening as Darren struggles to rein in his temper. Where in the world should I put her, the trunk? He shrugs at her, his voice rising with disgusted astonishment. Get rid of her, Crystal snaps. Have someone else drive her home. We have to talk about the wedding. What about the wedding, he demands, finally sounding defensive. Send your assistant home first and we'll talk about it. Her voice rises stridently. Don't, I think frantically, unable to call out, unable to speak my truth aloud. We have to talk about the pregnancy. The baby. My heart sinks as Darren's anger dies down to sullen embers right in front of me. Fine. My eyes close on tears. Coward. I have never felt so alone in my entire life. Chapter 12 Darren What exactly is it that you want from me? I growl at Crystal from across the living room. The fire crackles furiously beside us as she folds her arms tightly. My father wants to know why you spend so much time with your secretary instead of with me. There's something strangely placid and neutral in her stare. He expects an answer. Your father seems to think that he owns the both of us, I reply, and see a flicker of something in her eyes. He's wrong, you know. She swallows and glances away. He's practically does. Enlighten me. A knot explodes in the fireplace with a bang and a shower of sparks. I glance over at it, then back at her. If you think that he has a gun to your head now, and you resent it, you need to consider that he's only had you like this for a few months. Her eyes meet mine, and I see that flicker again, like a lantern in a snowstorm. I've been in his custody for over twenty years. Something clicks into place inside my head. I take a good long look at the woman in front of me. Are you marrying me to get away from him? I no longer want to send her away. I want to understand what's going on. She surprises me with a low sad laugh. Don't tell me you care. I've been trying to figure out why you're complying with this when you so obviously don't like me or the situation. Is he forcing you or are you just that desperate? She walks toward me past me over to the window where snow has begun to fall. My mother killed herself because of him, she murmurs as she lays a hand on the glass. It was soon after your father's death. I will never know what he said or did to drive her over the edge. But I know that she gave him twenty years of loyalty, and he repaid her with pain. He has no sons, so he uses me to trap you and secure his legacy. She folds her arms, her back to me, poised like a statue. You didn't answer my question. But I now know more about her than before, and what I am learning sends a chill of horror up my spine. I ask again, is he forcing you to marry me, or are you going along with this to get away from him? Her smile is her usual flat, polite curve of the lips, but her eyes are full of despair. Both. I am beginning to glimpse that cold light of truth. I press on. Have you ever thought of just leaving? I would be perfectly willing to help you. She surprises me again with a laugh, this one loud and sharp and almost mocking. She turns around, smirking emptily, the despair never leaving her expression. Thanks for the thought. But, there's a reason my mother killed herself instead of just leaving him. He controls all the money in this household. I don't have any money to help me get away. And it gets worse, she voluntarily continues. My father kills people who aren't convenient to him. Or he kills their loved ones. I have difficulty believing her. I always knew Hiltman was a jerk, but I never figured him for a monster. It takes a while, but I speak again. I'm sorry. I've misjudged you. He's threatened to kill you if you don't comply. Tears pool in her eyes, the ice princess melting. 
Not me, she corrects almost gently. My girlfriend. Oh. Shit. Holy crap, no wonder you never wanted to touch me. I thought you didn't like me personally. No, you're fine, except you're not her, and he's forcing you on me. She dabs at her eyes with a silver lace hanky. She's the only one I want touching me. It's nothing personal. Oh yeah. I get that. I feel completely at a loss. I've been a jerk. I'm sorry. Now I have two desperate women to worry about, with Hiltman menacing all of us. My father thinks you're going to try and get out of the marriage. He will distribute the video footage, if you do so. And I'll be in trouble. So she did know about the blackmail. It all falls into place. She's keeping a chokehold on me, because her father's yanking her chain mercilessly. Your dad can't get away with everything he's been doing, I mutter. Not forever. Again, that despairing smile. He can't be stopped, and so I must obey him, she says in a tiny wintry voice. But I'm happy you care enough to try. There's no point encouraging her to rebel. I don't know who exactly he has killed or how or even why. But my suspicions sicken me. I know now why she's terrified of him. So, what do we do now? What do you want to do now? she asks, probing. I guess you should reassure your father that the wedding's still on, I say quietly. It's clear the extremes to which Hiltman will go to get his way. But instead of scaring me, it gives me hope and renewed determination. Hiltman has murdered someone. Maybe several someone. That's ten times than what he's got on me. If I uncover the details, he's mine. And I'm free to marry who I want. I think I know who knows. Abrams has helped me before. Will he again? The Christmas invitation. Maybe that will be enough. Tell him I have a prior commitment for Christmas. She blinks. He won't like that very much. Then don't tell him. Pretend you don't know. Blame me. Don't let him blame you. I try to smile at her reassuringly, but she looks away, expression troubled and arms still folded tightly across her chest. Two minutes after Crystal leaves, I'm pacing in my entryway, with a headache deepening in my temples. Cheyenne won't answer her phone. My call goes to voicemail three times. Maybe she's taking a nap. She's had a terrible day. Or perhaps she just needs some space. But I have news, and worries and 10,000 tons of guilt for sending her away. I have to talk to her. Ten minutes later, I'm driving to her house. Chapter 13 Cheyenne I haven't talked to my mother in the ten years since her custodial rights were revoked. She tried to shoehorn her way back into my life three years ago, sending me message after disjointed message after finding my college email address. She lost track of me once I graduated, but I have her current phone number. I sit here in my nightie bundled in bed, tears on my cheeks, and stare down at her number in the old message saved on my phone. I don't know why I saved her emails. I don't even know why I'm thinking of calling her. What the heck am I going to say to her anyway? I mutter, drawing my hand back from the phone as if it were a mousetrap about to snap off my fingers. Hi mom, long time no talk. Are you sober enough to remember this for once? I laugh hysterically for a moment. Just wanted to let you know you're going to be a grandma. Kid's going to be fatherless, just like me. I don't let myself think about her most of the time, I'd never had even one conversation with her when she wasn't drunk. So why then do I feel the need to talk with her now? Am I really this desperate? I should be used to being lonely by now. I scoff sadly and close my eyes. A part of me remembers that this is just one disappointment, I don't know if it means that Darren's going to abandon me. Another part of me remembers that I'm tired, sick, in pain, and hormonal. I could be blowing this way out of proportion. But it sure feels like a disaster to me. Thinking back to my teenage years, I remember learning why my mother was so drunk and broken. The coward who knocked her up and left her, 
the father I will never know, disappeared at the first whiff of fatherhood, ruining her chances at a good education and a better job. I swore growing up I would never get myself into same situation. I wouldn't let a man plant his seed and leave us. I wouldn't raise his baby alone with my life ruined and all my prospects with it. Now look at me. Despite my best intentions, it seems that that's exactly what I did. I'm pulled in multiple directions. It would be easy to tell my doctor I don't want the pregnancy. It would be easy to self-indulgently fall apart, turn off my phone and sleep through the rest of the week. Instead I take some deep breaths, trying to clear my head enough so I can at least get some rest. This was just bad luck. I wasn't irresponsible. Darren wasn't either. It hurts. What does Hiltman have hanging over him to turn him such a coward? I breathe deeply. Maybe I am looking at this wrong. I go to the window and gaze absently at the falling snow. Darren's being here made the cramped old place feel warm, like a home, for the first time since I moved in, instead of only a place where I stash myself until my debts are paid off. Boston winters are brutal. I've always spent them alone, depressed. Darren keeps promising me I won't have to spend this one alone, dot but he let that ice princess drag him away just as he learned we're expecting a child together. I could just quit, I say aloud to the empty room. Quit this half-relationship with Darren, quit my job, and quit Boston. Go someplace warmer and kinder, give my love to a man who doesn't talk a big game, and then disappoint me the moment things get difficult. But the idea of that sends a stab of pain through me so intense that I put my hand over my heart. Our honeymoon period lasted all of three days before reality set in, so it's not just infatuation. I said that I loved him. I meant it. He said he loved me. I know he meant it too. Is love enough? Especially when the Hiltmans have him trapped. I wipe my eyes and go put on tea, hoping the peppermint will calm my tummy. Then something unexpected happens. Standing there, my mind running back through the wonderful, maddening last several weeks, asking myself, can I really walk away from this? And quietly crying, suddenly my tears dry up. My cheeks are hot. My heart is pounding. I'm shaking. I drop the tea ball into the steaming water and feel my nails bite into my palm. With some detachment, I look curiously at my hand and realize I'm clenching my fist. This feeling is so unfamiliar. I'm furious. No, no, no. I am not running away, I am not falling apart, and I am not backing down. The Hiltmans have my man trapped, and I'm going to fight for him. I have Abram's phone number. I'm not supposed to use it, but all our attempts to set up a meeting aren't working. I dial it with trembling fingers, my jaws clenched. This is James Abrams, comes his familiar voice. I don't recognize this number. Dr. Abrams, this is Cheyenne Bell, Dr. Darren Grace's assistant. Please don't hang up. There's something hard and strident in my voice. I don't tone it down. Miss Bell, what's this about? He sounds startled but not unkind, and he hasn't hung up. I know you've probably got some really good reason why you haven't answered our emails. Ordinarily, I would respect your privacy and leave it alone but right now, I'm out of options. I'm afraid I don't follow, he says carefully. I'll cut to the point then. Right now, Dr. Brian Hiltman is blackmailing Darren to marry his daughter. If he succeeds, he will very likely ruin not only Darren's life, but also mine, Dot and our babies. The long silence that follows has me tapping my feet uncontrollably. That's actually quite horrifying. I wouldn't put it past the man. I hear him open a bottle and take a swallow from it. And I'm sure you're being honest, as I'm sure you would not purposely embarrass someone you're crazy about. Sorry, say what? The way you look at him when you think he's not looking. I noticed. He did too. There's almost a gently teasing note in his voice. But I'm not sure why you're telling me this. Because I need your help. We do. I. Well, I know you know something about Hiltman. Don't you? Something that could hurt him. Something he wouldn't want getting out. I sound like I'm begging. I can't help it. 
Another agonizingly long pause. I might, he says. He sounds wary. So you're looking for some way to counter Hiltman's blackmail? I close my eyes. Please don't let me be making a terrible mistake in trusting him. Yes? I may have something that can help you. I don't want to get your hopes too high yet. But I may very well have a lovely Christmas present for the both of you. There's something strangely hard in his voice and cold beneath the kindness. I'm left wondering about it as he hangs up, and I put my phone back in my pocket. I'm just sitting down at my tiny kitchen table with my mug when the intercom crackles. Darren's voice pushes through the static, he sounds worried. Apologetic. For a moment I do nothing, my heart in my throat but my back straight. I take a swallow of tea. Darren's at my door thirty seconds later. I didn't know he could run that fast. I open it to find him out of breath, snowflakes in his hair. I worried you wouldn't let me in, he admits in a raw voice, his powerful body filling the doorway, but his eyes vulnerable. I take a deep breath, stepping back to let him in. I thought about it. You'd have deserved it too, after sending me off like that. I turn my back to him, sit down and wrap my hands tightly around my mug. Not gonna offer me a cup? he asks, looking hurt. Tea water's hot. You know where the mugs are. He nods and brews himself up a cup without complaint, stirring in some sugar. You know I didn't have a choice, he says. I scoff audibly. Of course you did. You could be honest and confront what he has on you. You just found out that I'm pregnant with your child. That's more important than covering yourself. He comes around in front of me. Wow. Okay. How are you expecting me to handle this then? I take a scalding swallow of my tea to keep myself from snapping at him further, wipe the water from my eyes, and steal myself for what I feel has to happen. I want to know exactly what Hiltman has on you, and why you let him control you this much. His chest hitches. No. Why? My voice cracks. Do you think I won't leave you over all this crap, just to protect myself? He struggles to control himself for a moment, and then says in a slow, measured voice, If you knew, you probably wouldn't want me anyway. My heart sinks, but I lift my chin. Darren, if you don't take that chance and tell me, I guarantee you I will want you out of my life. He huffs slightly, his eyes avoiding mine. That's blackmail. No, that's reality. I'm pregnant. This changes everything, and you know that. The least you can do is tell me why I have to go through all this crap. The tea tastes good. The nip of pain in my tongue takes my mind off the nausea. I take another sip and wait. Finally he sighs and nods his head, taking his mug and settling into the seat across from mine. Fine. Chapter 14 Cheyenne I'm the one who found my father's body, is how he begins, and immediately my gut clenches. I force myself to encourage him to continue. We never really were all that close when I was young, you know, not until I was old enough to join the family business. Then things got a lot better. He always wanted me to take over for him, and even if I wasn't much of a son to him, I was his heir. He coughs and then takes a swallow of his tea. Nobody was expecting any trouble. I mean, of course, my father had enemies. Hiltman started going after my family business way before Dad died. He tried to bribe his way onto the board twice. He even tried a hostile takeover. I lick my lips. Was he the only one? I don't think so. Dad was pretty private about the business, but he warned me about five or six men, not just Hiltman. He scoffed including two guys on the board. Oh. Great. That's a lot of powerful people to watch out for. So what happened? That was before you and I met. I had already received my doctorate and was working at the company full-time. He sets his mug down and stares down into it. My father and I were spending more time together outside work. That night he asked me to come by late for cigars and drinks. He said he had something to talk to me about. He kept his gaze on the table. I let myself in. He didn't greet me at the door. 
That was new. A little alarming. Each little sentence sounded like it was being yanked out of his chest by force. I closed my eyes, leaning back in my chair. I didn't expect him to start with this. But maybe I should have. This is the source of whatever craziness he got caught up in afterward. I don't remember finding him. That's the weird thing. You'd figure I would. I even gave a statement to police, and it was accurate, but I have no idea what it says. I want to reach out to him, but I know that even if he isn't deflecting, he's telling me all of this because he wants to justify or excuse whatever happened next. What's the next thing you do remember? He smirks self-deprecatingly. I was drunk. It was my father's wake. Abrams was there in shock. Hiltman showed up. I remember the two of them got into an argument on one of the side room, but I never knew what it was about. I just know that Abrams left town the next day, like he was afraid of Hiltman. Maybe he was, I muse. Mysteries aren't my strong suit, he admits. Not outside of a biochem lab. But did you ever suspect that Abrams knew something, before now? It's strange looking at Darren this way, seeing him confused and vulnerable. It doesn't make me think any less of him. If he was being an emotionally closed jerk, like a lot of guys in his tax bracket, that would bother me. I wasn't thinking straight about it for a long time, and then I was trying not to think about it at all. But anyway. There I was at the wake, when my father's partners started arriving. They knew that the company was now in my hands, and though the legal papers had yet to be signed, they wanted to make it clear that I had their loyalty. It was pretty touching. I found it curious that they also brought along their families, including four daughters around my age. My eyebrows start to climb. These are the same guys currently sitting on the board? He winces. Yeah. Okay, so dot how stupid did he get? Under the circumstances, but now I'm really getting worried. Go on. Well, I was really down. The girls were all friends and they noticed. I don't know how many drinks it took or how long or how much coaxing was involved, but next thing I knew we were making plans to meet afterward. I ventured slowly. You and dot all four girls. Yeah. He gets up suddenly, downing his tea in a desperate bid to make this all disappear, setting the mug aside and going to the window. After a moment, I follow him. I just wanted the pain and outrage go away. The police knew my father was poisoned, but they called it a suicide. The bitterness on his face alarms me. Do you think someone paid them off? Absolutely. So do my father's friends. Problem is, there's no proof. His shoulders were so tense. Okay, no wonder you were off the rails at the wake. Still, I don't like it. He looks back at me anxiously. So you forgive me for it then? My eyebrow goes back up. Go back to the part where you sleep with four of your board members' daughters in a hotel room the night of your father's funeral. He cringes. All right. I'm not gonna say we didn't have a good time. I nearly spewed out my tea. What? He winces again, but this time I can see the tips of his ears turn red. Yeah, well, like I said. Not my finest hour. You idiot. Glad to hear it. So what happened? Besides the lots of intercourse? The joke's so weak his smile wavers. I roll my eyes. Right. The uh tape. Imhum. I look him right in the eyes. Did you get her to erase it? No. His eyes avoid mine. Oh, for pity's sake, Darren. What happened to it? Six months later. One of the girls contacts me to say that her phone was stolen with a copy of the video in it. Clearly a contract job paid for by Hiltman. He goes back to looking out the window, focusing on things far away. That's a monumental indiscretion, I comment. He grunts. I know I'm twisting the knife, but a tape? Really? So, either you marry his ice princess daughter, or he sends the board a video of you boinking and doing drugs with four of their daughters. I still haven't touched him. I'm not sure if I want to comfort him or smack him. There's more to it than that. 
He holds his breath and turns tentatively back to me. He seems relieved that I haven't laughed at him or thrown him out on his ear. But then he truly shocks me. Either Crystal marries me or she faces even worse. He's threatened her girlfriend. Found out today. My jaw drops. There's a gun to her head. No wonder she's so angry at you. He smiles sadly. Yeah. That's what I said. So now I have you, our baby, and Crystal and her girlfriend to consider, not to mention my own reputation. Oh. I look down, dreading what I know I am about to say to him. You know, I know today has been a lot, but this is important too. I don't think I can do much more of this sneaking around. Today hurt, Darren. You mean my sending you home to talk to Crystal right after we found out that you're pregnant? Yeah. I put my hand on the glass, feeling the cold radiating through it. I'm suddenly quite tired of this place. I want to go back to the lodge, I say quietly. Things were simple up there. Me too, he murmurs, and very gently, hesitantly, Darren lays his hand on my back. Once I find a way to fix this, we can spend as much time up there as you want. But can you fix it? I don't tell him about the call with Abrams yet. He told me not to get my hopes up, so I don't want to do that to Darren, either. I can, and I will. I've let Hiltman drag me around by the balls for too long, and now it's hurt you. So I must. I turn and face him, standing close, looking deeply into his eyes. I can't wait on this much longer, Darren. And you know that if you let Hiltman drag you into this marriage, he will have everything you have. He closes his eyes, tired, and nods. I know. In anger and love, I start crying again, just tears rolling down my face which stays stony with determination. When, Darren? Christmas, he determines. I'll have us both free of this mess by Christmas. A few moments later, I pull myself together enough to speak. Okay, I murmur finally. I'll hold you to that. Chapter 15 Darren Merry Christmas. I'm feeling it for the first time since the holiday season started. Christmas gifts have been sent out, including a large box to Crystal and an envelope to her father. I fill the trunk and backseat of my SUV with packages and treats for Cheyenne and my friends who will be joining us at the lodge. It's all decked out and ready to go. My staff spent the morning cooking, cleaning, trimming the tree and making it as much like the Christmases of my youth as they could. I'm psyched. This is going to be awesome. It'll be a steady 40 degrees all day according to the weather reports, the roasts have come out perfectly, the tree is trimmed, and all my trail cameras are in place, the footage ready to share. And best of all, in spite of everything, Cheyenne is beside me. How are you doing? I ask her softly as we wind our way up the mountain. She's looking queasy again. Morning sickness is beating her up, though she rarely complains. I'm okay. You sure? I could slow down. I ease off the gas. She lets out a sigh of relief. Thank you, she murmurs pink-cheeked. I was getting dizzy. I've got a little box burning a hole in my front trouser pocket, making me wish the party was already over so I can corner her alone. I promised her I would resolve this all by Christmas, and though it might cost me my business, I'm going ahead with it. I'm keeping my promise. I'm calling Hiltman's bluff, and I've made sure he can't hurt his daughter either. He'll rage at his Christmas party today, alone. And even if he releases that tape, I'll find a way to bounce back. Better to take that hit than to lose Cheyenne. I had to be very clever in taking care of business in these weeks leading up to my party. I made sure to arrange things so that if anyone gets hurt, I'll be the only one. It will be hard to celebrate, and even harder to propose, with the board member's reaction to the tape looming over me. I'm hyperware of Crystal's warning about her father, and how Hiltman scares Abrams so much, he hides on a mountainside under radio silence. I'll absorb the danger, too. You've been quiet for a while. What are you thinking about? Ah, about the surprise I have for you, I tease her. She is my reason for everything I'm doing. What kind of surprise? You'll see, I say with a hint of glee, and the surprise and curiosity on her face is like a flash of sun through dark clouds. 
It took weeks to clean up from the Thanksgiving snowstorm. Between plowing off the snow, clearing debris, fixing power lines and everything else broken. The very landscape was changed, the broken off trunks of trees jut from the earth all over the mountainside, showing golden flashes of fresh wood at their tops. It's foreboding, yet it reminds me of those wild three days as well. Wow. I didn't realize the storm did this much damage, she observes. How in the world did I not hear half a mountain's worth of trees coming down in pieces all around us? I grin widely. We were busy. She blushes and looks down, lips quirking in a smile. Oh. Um, right. She has no idea what's coming. She's simply decided to trust me, which is wonderful, because she knows that I'm risking everything for her. Today's going to be full of surprises. So how many people are we expecting? Four besides us. I sent Abrams an invitation, but who knows with him. She smiles vaguely. He might show up with a nice Christmas present for us. Hope so. I'm baffled by his radio silence. Maybe he really thinks Hiltman and I are in cahoots, or that Hiltman simply blackmails me into working for him. It's all speculation at this point. My father's old partner remains a mystery to me. Maybe one day I'll know his story if the cancer doesn't take him away too soon. We're the first ones to arrive. The lodge is lit up with Christmas lights, and I see the tree twinkling behind a large front window. Fresh tracks from Jacob's car show that he and the rest of the staff probably left just minutes before. Looks like everything's ready to go. Want some eggnog? Little rich for me right now. Maybe some sparkling cider. She takes my hand as I help her out of the car. I guess I'm off booze for now too. I glance away with an awkward little smile as I lock up the SUV. Oh right. The nog comes in leaded and unleaded, but rich food and drink is increasingly off my dear Cheyenne's menu. Just in time for the holidays, poor thing. The Christmas party's an early afternoon affair as everyone's off for the weekend and it becomes deathly cold up here at night. I wanted to ascertain that I was conveniently out of town when the Hiltmans held their own party. Nobody, neither staff nor friends, questioned why I wanted the party up here in the lodge. I guess they all heard me talk about my Christmases in these mountains often enough that it came as no surprise. As for my staff, I sent them home for the weekend with vacation pay after they finished preparations to make up for the extra trip out of town. They went home with gifts and bonuses. Only a skeleton security crew is on duty until after New Year's. And if we do go home between then and now, Cheyenne and I will make the most of that extra privacy. If things go as I plan. You think you'll be able to eat? There's turkey. And goose and roast beef. I tend to go overboard on my holiday spreads. Yeah, I'll be fine. I pretty much know what makes me sick now. To me, it seems certain foods get to her more than others, and mostly before mid-afternoon, so I'm not sure how she keeps track of it all. I unlock the door and lead her inside. The house is aglow from candlelight and colored Christmas lights. So strange to be back here, she comments as she looks around. The place looks almost otherworldly, and so does she. I watch the gleams from the Christmas lights bounce down her braid as she takes off her coat. Is it? I hang both our coats up in the closet. Well, more like, strange to be back here knowing a bunch of other people are coming. I kinda see this as our place. Somewhere I don't feel like sharing. Her eyes search my face as I return to her side. I kiss her. Being outside has chilled her skin, but her lips are warm. Well, just remember, they're going home in a few hours. We don't have to. She slides her hands up my chest and tucks her head under my chin. Are you sure that Hiltman won't give you trouble for missing his dinner? Luncheon. I've already missed it. If he wants to give me trouble, he can do so. No more jumping on his say-so, especially since I'm the one paying for it most. I look her in the eyes, hands on her shoulders. I blocked his number. Her eyes widen as this sinks in. He'll get back at you for that. Yeah, I know. He'll also get back at me for telling him I'm not marrying his daughter. I'm certain of it. I may even lose my business. 
My smile goes grim as I slide my hands down her arms to take hers. But, she looks stunned, somewhere between impressed and horrified. But Darren, you know what he'll do. Cheyenne. I look intensely into her eyes. It was never really about the board finding out. The hardest part was telling you. It had been. I knew then that there was a gun to my head, whatever Hiltman planned for me it was nothing compared to losing not only the woman I love, but also our child. But that didn't make confessing about just how dumb I had been, how impulsive, how I'd been all over four other women, and on film any easier. I don't understand. What could I do that was worse than losing your business and your reputation in the field? She gazes at me in bewilderment. It never occurred to her that I would simply face the music if I couldn't resolve the situation. Cheyenne, losing my business still leaves me a billionaire. My dad's no longer around to disappoint. And not having the business will free me up to be with you and our kid. I stroke the back of my hand down her cheek. If the alternative is losing you, I'll take that hit. She seems utterly surprised, poor thing. I feather a kiss onto her nose. Then she lets out a squeal and hugs me tight. That's better, I pull her close to me. She's quiet, her shoulders shaking with emotion. Her tears soak through my shirt. But I know that at least one of them is from relief. Chapter 16 Cheyenne Anyway, so Darren's like halfway down the slope by the time I untangle myself from the drunken girl, and he's laughing the whole way. He was still giggling when I met up him at the bottom of the slope. The big red-haired man with the lumberjack's beard, Mike, if I remember right, laughs to himself and takes a swallow of his heavily spiked nog. I was not giggling, Darren says as he fights down a case of the giggles. I hide my smile in a swallow of cider. It's been a pretty good party so far. Aside from the one the office holds every year, I've never actually been to a Christmas party before, and I worried that I would be awkward, or worse, sick. But I managed to clear a plate of turkey and trimmings, though I declined any gravy or butter. Darren introduced me to his friends as his girlfriend. I introduced him to Gail and Andrea as my boyfriend. I'm still happy about that halfway through the meal. He told me that he was willing to take Hiltman's bullet to his reputation for me if necessary, and now he's proving it. I'm the luckiest girl in the world, even if I'm queasy, tired, and worried about my boyfriend's future. Who did the drunk turn out to be, anyway? Morris is a slim, almost delicate-looking black man with gold-rimmed glasses and a meticulous manner. He's a neurosurgeon who went to college with Darren. I don't know some girl from Jersey whose boyfriend had ditched her at the lodge. She thought that I was him in disguise or something. Mike shrugs and reaches for the gravy boat. Well, at least she didn't follow you down the slope. That was awkward. Darren is stirring eggnog into his coffee while Morris watches in mild horror. Gail laughs, tossing her black curls off her shoulder. Hope she found him. She and the small, green-eyed Andrea snicker a bit together though he probably regretted it if she did. Yeah, I have no idea how someone that tiny could be that fierce. It was like being attacked by an angry, drunk koala. Mike and the others share a laugh as I smile and glance out the window at the road. No sign of Abrams. I'm so disappointed that I can't laugh along. I was so hoping we would find something to keep Hiltman from bringing the hammer down on Darren. Darren was a big dope once, while he was at his weakest and most broken. He shouldn't have to pay for it by being ousted from his own company. But it sure did seem like there's no way around that now. Hiltman is a vengeful man. Everybody knows it. But here Darren is, laughing and talking beside me as if none of that mattered. I don't know if he's fearless or simply that committed. To me. Which is amazing but I still feel terrible about this. I don't know how this is going to end. I even worry for the Ice Princess Crystal, a big change for me. Darren has promised me that he's taking care of everything, but I'm still not quite sure how. Have you ever been skiing, Cheyenne? Mike is asking me, and I smile and shake my head. Not since I was a kid. I used to go, 
I start to explain, when we all hear tires screech outside and someone turns at high speed onto the lodge driveway. Darren is between me and the door at once and strides toward it with his back straight even as we hear a car door slam and a rapid heavy tread crunch across the thin snow. A few moments later, someone pounds on the door forcefully. Darren pulls it open. Standing there, red-faced from rage and too much alcohol, is Hiltman. I am more afraid now than I thought possible. You little jerk, he snarls, shoving a finger into Darren's face. Darren doesn't flinch. For just a moment, Hiltman's aggression wilts slightly, uncertainty flicking across his face. His face darkens again. Darren backs up to let him in, as everyone stands from the table. He lurches forward, still aiming his thick finger at Darren like a gun. You didn't show up, my daughter is missing, and I read your letter. What the hell do you mean you're not going forward with the wedding? Do you know who I am? Do you know what I can do to you? Holy crap, Morris breathes. Is this the piece of work you were telling us about? Thought he never left the big city. Another car pulls into the driveway, this one neatly and quietly, only the crunch of slush and the purr of its motor audible. It comes so soon behind the other, I wonder if Hiltman was followed. I wonder what further complications are about to walk through our door. I thought so too, Darren sighs as Hiltman blinks his small eyes at him. You told these people our private business, he demands with all the anger of an abusive mother once the police are at the door. How much did you tell them? Everything. Darren folds his arms as the older man looks around at us nervously. The video, the blackmail, even how you forced your own daughter into this sham of an engagement by threatening her lover. Hiltman steps closer, his face turning purple. Where is my daughter? Darren stares back at him coolly. Out of your reach for good, that's for sure, along with her sweetheart. A car door slams outside. Footsteps. But they don't approach the door right away. They walk away first and then stop. I hear a creak and a metallic rattle. Hiltman starts to shake, his hands bawling into fists. How dare you? I'll ruin you. I'll have that video sent to your board as soon as I get home. Go right ahead, Darren says quietly. A what? Hiltman's voice screeches with outrage and disbelief. You can't possibly tell me that. That I don't care. Darren chuckles mirthlessly. Do it, you jerk. Go right ahead and do your best to ruin my life. I'll bounce back. Not if you're dead. Hiltman roars. There's a collective gasp. Hiltman looks up and then around at everyone, a look of panic on his face. You know, if I should die unexpectedly, this room full of witnesses will have something to say about the threat you just made. The corner of Darren's mouth curves up. Hiltman goes pale, and his lips flap as he scrabbles for a comeback. Someone knocks politely on the front door, three taps. Everyone turns to see who it is. Darren reaches past Hiltman like he's a problem child to open the door. Oh, hello, Abrams greets the party members from behind a small pile of silver-wrapped presents. Am I too late for the party? His smile is mild and calm, as if the man he's nearly killed himself to avoid isn't there at all. No, of course not. Thank you for coming, Darren starts, a moment before Hiltman explodes. You? You should be hiding up on the mountainside somewhere. You've got a lot of balls facing me now, you coward. I'm lost, Andrea groans as Darren steps back to let the two square off. Dr. Abrams, Darren's dad's old partner. Apparently yet another person that Hiltman's pissed off, I point out in a purposefully dry tone, and she nods as Darren comes to slip an arm into mine. I'm terminally ill, you fat old bully, Abrams grumbles as he walks in, pushing past his aggressor. He's in flannels and jeans, the fabric hanging on him, a utility knife sheathed on his belt. What are you going to do, kill me? Hiltman splutters. I'll have my revenge. It's too late for that, Abrams replies. Oh, you can go ahead and lash out again, get someone else killed over your wounded pride. There's no point to it now, though. I'll go to the press. No specifics. Whatever he has on the old jerk must be pretty good, because suddenly Hiltman goes as white as a sheet. 
You wouldn't dare, but Abrams only laughs. Try me. Seems like you've lost control, Darren chuckles in total disdain. Perhaps you should have rethought your approach. I, Hiltman looks around in a panic, and then his gaze settles on me. On Darren's arm around me. I'll send the tape to her. She'll leave you, he blurts, grasping at straws. Too late, I exclaim cheerfully. I already know. He told me himself. Are you the only one here who can't handle having his secrets exposed? He starts to curse at me, but when Darren moves toward him, Hiltman backs up toward the door vowing to get revenge on them all. Drive carefully on the way back to Boston, Abrams cheerfully advises as he steps aside. Those mountain roads are awfully darn slippery. Hiltman storms out with Abrams' laughter following him. Abrams shuts the door on the cold and the screech of tires. So, any turkey left? Darren, surprised at his own calm reaction, offers his old friend some eggnog. It's a much livelier party now that we have something to talk about besides old stories. I'm really glad you came down, I tell Abrams, who smiles cheerfully. He's got more color in his cheeks now, and chatters animatedly with us. Maybe it's Christmas cheer, or maybe it's hope now that he's returning to Boston to get treatments. Maybe it's vindication, since he and Darren laughed Hiltman off the mountain. I don't know, and I suspect I never will. But that's all right. So what happened to Hiltman's daughter anyway? Abrams asks. I'm curious too. Put her on a plane to New Orleans with her girlfriend. I've got some property down there. It's way out of Hiltman's realm of control. We talked about her giving me some dirt on her father in return, but she's too terrified. Abrams laughs. Glad she's out of sight for a while, this may be messy. But don't worry, I know more than enough to make sure that Hiltman faces some sort of justice. It may not be in time, Darren admits, but Abrams just reaches over and pats his arm. Have a little faith. I don't think again about his reassurance until 40 minutes later, when we are interrupted by red and blue lights flashing outside. Darren and I look up in confusion as Morris quips, didn't think we had the music up that loud. Darren opens the door for a highway patrolman who takes off his hat as he comes in, shaking off the cold. Just came by to inform you folks, the road down the mountains closed going east for at least an hour. What? Why? Darren asks as Abrams cheerfully goes for another cup of eggnog. There's been an accident. Pretty bad, the guy went through the guardrail and down the mountainside. The cop looks more tired than troubled, frown half hidden behind his mustache. Accident? Darren suddenly sounds a lot more serious. Yes. One fatality from what we can tell. Doesn't look like anyone else was in the car. He scratches his mustache, dark eyes narrowing. You hear a car speed past here about an hour ago, driving erratically? We have reports from your neighbors. We all look around at each other while Abrams quietly sips his nog. Was it a luxury car? Darren asks quietly. Silver rolls from what I could tell. Real shame on top of everything else. Why? Darren sighs. I might know who was in that car. A man showed up here drunk roughly an hour ago. He threatened us and then sped off before we could stop him. The cop lifts an eyebrow. Who? Dr. Brian Hiltman. I know the cop will interpret his breathlessness as shock. But it isn't. It's the same thing I feel as I glance back at Abrams, who still serenely sips his holiday cheer. It is the dissolving of a burden that weighed us down, the same with Abrams and Crystal and over so many others. But even after the cop goes on his way, I'm left to wonder. I work up my nerve over a dessert of pumpkin pie. Abrams is just finishing his and looking at his watch. Dr. Abrams? He looks back at me cheerfully. May I help you, Miss Bell? You didn't tell us what dirt you have on Hiltman that sent him running scared like that. The corners of his eyes crinkle pleasantly. Well, it was plenty. But I don't speak ill of the dead. It's enough that we're free of him. Darren sighs. I've got mixed feelings about that. I imagine that's quite natural. You're a decent man, after all. Far more decent than I. 
He goes for his coat and hat and puts them on as we stare at him. You have a Merry Christmas now. He's still wearing that serene smile as he walks out. I want to call after him, but I don't know what to say. A toast, Darren chuckles as he raises his glass. To the single weirdest guy I've ever met in my life. May he have many Christmases to come, I hope there are no taxidermies inside those gift packages. I manage to join in the laugh and the toast, dot but as Abram's car pulls out of the driveway, I can't stop wondering. The feelings linger for almost an hour. Darren follows up the gift exchange with a ring box, dot and all other thoughts leave my head in a surge of unbridled joy. Chapter 17 Cheyenne This is the first Christmas Eve morning in a long time when I haven't woken up alone. I can understand Darren's ferocity in bed as much as mine. Last night was the first night we were finally free to fully commit to each other. We had a lot to celebrate. And a few things to forget. Now, in the quiet morning, I start remembering all over again. After drunk and raged Hiltman stormed out for his date with destiny on the ice slick roads, Abrams apologized for keeping silent for so long. He planned to return to Boston for cancer treatment, and preparing for it had taken up all his time. He explained that though he loved the mountain, he didn't feel like dying just yet, just like he didn't feel like letting Hiltman's threats keep him away from his hometown. I don't know why Hiltman threatened him, maybe it was about those patents. We may never know. The accident that left the road back to Boston blocked off for an hour was indeed Hiltman going through the guardrail at full speed. The police gave us some answers about an hour after Abrams left, when they took our statement on Hiltman's drunken driving. There was no indication that he had ever so much as pressed the brakes in his race down the icy mountain. The car was scattered in pieces all the way down the mountainside, too mangled to check if the brakes had failed, or if the brakes were cut. Say by an old man with a knife on his belt and nothing left to lose. I slip out of the warm cave of bedclothes, shuddering. We'll never actually know what happened. It still chills to think that someone's death could improve a lot of people's lives so much. But that's the fact here. Crystal phoned soon after her father's death. She and her girlfriend were already on Darren's private plane, but they were returning home as all danger to them had passed. So, too, had any risk of her father destroying Darren's reputation or his relationship with his board. All the danger, all the shackles, had disintegrated when Hiltman had taken a drunken header off the mountain. My mind goes back to Abrams. Five years in self-imposed exile, hiding from Hiltman, dot and then unexpectedly he decides on treatment back in Boston. It is as if he knew Hiltman was going to die. Perhaps my theory is closer to the mark than I'd like to think. Still, it's over, and that's the important part. Good riddance. Darren and I have both faced enormous injustices. Mine from my mother, from other boyfriends, from the world. Darren's from Hiltman and from his father's murderer, if they're not one and the same. Left alone without loved ones, we found each other. Darren was willing to sacrifice everything to make me his. And now I will be, gladly and without doubts, because I know what I'm worth to him just as he's worth the world to me. I pull on my coziest flannel shirt and leggings and pad out into the great room to see what's happening. I'm flabbergasted. Jacob was supposed to come by this morning to help clean up after the party. But aside from all the leftovers we put away, everything's still decorated, and the trash bin full of torn packaging still sits by the door. Nobody's been here. I check the time. It's almost noon. Where are they? The light coming in from outside is strangely dim. I notice that there's an awful lot of snow sticking to the main window. In fact, the lower two-thirds is completely blocked. Wait. Darren. He's out of bed so fast he doesn't bother with clothes, distracting me thoroughly for a few seconds. What is it, oh? He blinks slowly at the wall of snow outside as he comes to a stop. Damn. Yeah, about that. I look at my fiancé and decide against yanking open the door to check if we're snowed in completely. I, uh, think we're two for two on being stranded up here. Yeah, looks like. He grabs his phone off the counter. Four feet in eight hours, 
and it looks like half of it slid down the mountain at us. At least the power isn't out. I'm not even scared this time. I'm just amused. Oh well, at least we have a lot of leftovers. I venture, biting my lip as I look up at him. He chuckles, looking down, his chest heaving. Guess so. And then he looks up at me with a twinkle in his eye. I did say I wanted to spend Christmas here with you. I lift an eyebrow slightly and then move toward him, letting him gather me against his naked chest. You did, didn't you? Yeah. He kisses the top of my head. Just as long as they dig us out by New Year's. I giggle as he leads me back to bed. The End Book 3 The Biker's Girl Chapter 1 Kitty It's close to midnight when I make my way up the steps to the Martin Farmhouse's pillared, wraparound porch. I'm bundled up against the unseasonable cold. The nights have started dipping below freezing already and it's only November. It worries me, for a lot of reasons. But right now those worries are far from my mind, and I'm trying not to laugh as I approach the door. I knock on the door and then glance around, smiling. My neighbor down the road has six acres in a long tree-edged strip that runs back up into the hills. She's a military widow from New York City, who decided to retire to the countryside, only to discover that we have our own challenges out here. Mrs. Annabeth Martin is the kind of sweet old Christian lady who would give you the clothes off her back if she wasn't worried about modesty. She's easily scandalized, tends to pass judgment on people quickly and is a strange mix of paranoid and naive. I try to be a good neighbor to her, but I always hide the pot and booze before she comes over. My breath steams past my scarf, as I wait for the shuffling footsteps that have started up on the other side of the door. I busy myself by looking around and hoping that I'm wrong about what I suspect I'm going to see when I get inside. The chuckle that sneaks out of me is half ironic. Annabeth called me apologetically about a friendly stray dog she took in tonight, who turned out to be destructive and not at all housebroken. Since I'm the local vet and run a private animal shelter, I'm the only person in 50 miles that she could turn to. So I only grumbled a little on the way over. She has two sons who come up from the city on weekends to help look after things, but the land's still looking pretty scruffy. No one has raked the black walnuts off the drive in weeks. The green rinds with their black innards have been torn open by squirrels and left scattered everywhere. The front lawn is adrift with dead leaves. I turn back to the door as the footsteps get closer, and hear the bolt clack as it's thrown. The inner door opens partway, and through the storm door I see a puffy-haired Annabeth in a fluffy pink robe and big gold cross necklace. She beams as she sees me and hurriedly lets me in. Come in dear, come in. He's right in here. Watch your step. She has spread out newspaper on the floor, and I pick my way down the hall as it rustles underfoot. So where did you find this dog? She leads me down her hallway into the kitchen, stopping by the closed door. Well, he's been coming around begging since the late summer. He doesn't have a collar, so I thought maybe I could win him over and see if he wanted to become my new dog. It got so cold tonight that when he cried at the door I let him come running in to warm up, and he seems to want to stay. But he's really a handful. Eats a lot, tries to break into the cabinets, jumps up on the table, pees where he pleases, chews things. It's like he's never lived with a family at all. Not to mention that Mittens is terrified of him. Oh boy. I am now 80% certain about what, and who, is hanging out in Annabeth's kitchen. Apparently nobody warned her about one of our neighborhood, characters. All right, well, let's take a look at him and see what we're dealing with. The musky smell of something a lot stronger than dog urine hits me as I walk into the kitchen, and I'm careful to watch my step. The culprit, looking fat and very proud of himself, is sitting on the breakfast nook table panting and grinning. I fold my arms and scowl at him, though I can barely keep from laughing. Um, Annabeth, sweetie? I say as the beast on the table squints happily and chuffs at me. That's dot not a dog. What do you mean he's not a dog? Isn't he one of those African dogs that don't bark? She sounds genuinely baffled. No, I'm sorry. You see, this is Randy. 
and he's definitely not a Basenji. I eye Randy as he gives me a saucy look, and then starts wagging his tail exactly like a damn dog. No idea where he learned that trick, but it, along with his relative friendliness toward humans, apparently got his paw in the door over here. Well, what is he then? He plays, he doesn't bite us, he loves the food we give him. Poor Annabeth is looking at me like I have sprouted another head. I sigh. Annabeth, I'm gonna suggest that you open the back door and let him out. I'm sure he'd be happy to winter with you and have you feed him. And no, he's not gonna bite you, at least not until he's on the couch and you want him to move or he gets too excited while you're playing. But it's so cold. Will he be okay? I'm dying here. I'm literally leaving my body as we speak. I shoot a glare at Randy and swear he's laughing at me. He'll be fine, I promise. He'll catch up with his pack and they'll winter down in the foothills. My neighbor goes very still. Randy is a coyote, Annabeth. A spoiled, lazy, sneaky little poop of a coyote, who has discovered that if he acts like a cute doggy, humans will feed him. I eye Randy up and down, seeing that he's at least five pounds overweight and has a thick, glossy winter pelt. It's a pretty damn good ploy, actually. A coyote. She stares in amazement. But he's so friendly. Yeah, he is. Humans have food and have a huge soft spot for cute and friendly mammals, and he's figured that out. But look, Annabeth, even if he has discovered humans are easy marks, Randy's a wild animal. He will use your entire house as a toilet, and he will eat your cat. Oh no, not mittens. She covers her mouth with her hands, eyes wide with horror. I nod gravely, satisfied that she'll think twice before taking in any more homeless dogs. Good thing too because next time I'll probably come in here to see her new pet has antlers. Annabeth really is a city girl through and through. I arch an eyebrow at Randy, who chuffs again and wags his tail. Forget it, man, nobody here's buying it anymore. His tail lowers and he yaps at me in irritation, but there's still an edge of smugness to it. Shithead. Cute though. I'm on my way back to my truck a few minutes later having calmed my embarrassed neighbor and left her with a bottle of enzyme cleaner. Randy is sitting on the hood of my truck when I reach it, panting and grinning at me. Fattening up for winter on the old lady's dime, huh? You big mooch. I can hear the high howls of the other coyotes echoing along the upper slopes. They've caught his scent and are probably wondering where he was all night. I keep clear of biting range as I walk around to the driver's side door. Go on already, go find your pack. They're gonna be pissed you didn't share all your snacks. He sneezes, then jumps off as I open the door. But instead of running off, his ears prick up suddenly and he looks down the road. I frown and turn on my headlights, just in time to see a feral cat scramble across the road maybe 30 yards away, with a dead rat in her jaws. Her belly hangs loose enough to flap, she's still nursing. Damn it. Another late litter. Normally I wouldn't have to worry too much, as local autumn kittens would typically be weaned and have a fighting chance by the time things started freezing over. Not to mention I'd normally have three more weeks to put together the insulated shelters I distribute around the area for the strays every year. This time though there's been no such luck. And as I grab my flashlight and start tracking the feral through the woods, I feel my worry growing. I'm the shy type. Most of my friends growing up had four legs and that's still the case now. That's why I got my veterinary degree, why I sunk so much of my inheritance into the private shelter, and why I get pretty upset at the thought of frozen kittens. I take photos as I go so I can find the cat's nesting spot again once I return with supplies. Finally, I spot the kitty climbing up a dead tree, disappearing into a big hollow about 10 feet up. She's picked a good spot. The trunk's thick enough to insulate and protect her babies. But there are a lot of abandoned and feral cats out here who either won't be as used to the outdoors or who won't be as lucky in finding a good spot. Deciding to bring some food and insulating bedding scraps for Queen Kitty tomorrow, I take a photo of the tree and then turn to go home. This is a problem that I am going to need some serious help with it. Finding feral litters, sheltering and feeding those we can't relocate to my shelter, distributing the shelter boxes, and doing it all in under a week. 
covering miles of road and over a hundred acres. My heart sinks. Normally I can get all this done with no problem. My work hours are low, even with the shelter to run and the veterinary needs of the valley to take care of. But with my normal workload, the upcoming holidays, the kittens and socialized ex-ferals already in the shelter, and with freezing temperatures arriving three weeks early. Maybe I can hire some emergency help. It's not like I don't have the cash. People around here don't know that I'm working not because I have to, but because I love what I do. I actually inherited more money than I know what to do with, but I just don't feel right not contributing to my community. Call it my Yankee work ethic. As I'm driving up the road, I see the coyotes flood across the lane behind me, with Randy's fat body leading the way. Nice to see he's back with his family, but they need to go back up their hillside now. There's another reason to fear for the cats and their kittens, the cold is driving the coyotes downhill too damn soon. Yeah. I have to fix this. My house is just up the road. I only drove my truck because it has the big kennel in the back, and my dog catching gear. But I'm not going home yet. I pass the small stone farmhouse and the sprawling barn beyond it, which houses the clinic and shelter. I drive right past my own driveway, headed for my neighbors down the hill on the other side. The ravens will still be up. They don't roll up their welcome mat until three. Jake and the guys owe me and I'm sure they wouldn't say no to making some extra cash. Annabeth would freak out if she knew I was going to the local biker gang and resident pot growers for help. She has this image in her head of what it means to be a biker, and she can't shake the idea that they're all dangerous men instead of the tough but friendly guys they actually are. But they have never caused me problems, and since I'm the one they go to when their dogs get sick or have puppies, we have a pretty good relationship. I hope it's good enough. There's an acre-wide strip of trees acting as a buffer between their land and mine, which is home to a lot of wildlife. Beyond it, their high hedges mask their property from the road, but I can see the glow of the house lights through them now that the branches are bare for winter. My stomach flutters a little as I pull into their gravel driveway and the dusty lot beyond. I hope Jake is home. Big Jake Steele is half the reason I make excuses to come visit. He's the hottest man I have ever seen in my life. Huge burly, a wild man in leathers with shaggy black hair and a brutally handsome face with intense green eyes. He has a gravelly voice that turns into a slightly awkward purr when he is trying to be less intimidating, and the way he looks in his jeans makes it impossible not to stare. Of course I've never done a thing about it. But a girl can look, dot and a girl can dream. I see his huge shape fill the doorway of the house as I park my truck and my stomach flutters even harder, but I smile even more. Chapter 2 Jake I'm on the couch polishing off my second beer and third coffee when my right-hand man Maury comes in and tells me that Kitty is pulling into the parking lot. A smile breaks over my face, some of my exhaustion lifting off of me like a weight. I'll go meet her. You guys keep feeding the dogs. Dad has been having a rough night tonight. Nightmares. I took care of him until he felt well enough to want privacy, leaving him with two of the dogs and his bong. But it wore me out, and I was feeling pretty down, right up to the moment I heard Kitty was here. Some of us come back from our time as soldiers with little scars, and some with big ones. Some on them are on the outside for everyone to see, but some, like my dad's, are mostly within. I got my purple heart for taking IED shrapnel and have some scars on my leg and a little limp. My dad never feels safe and screams himself awake sometimes. The open road, our club, the pot we grow and smoke, the friends we make on the road and off, and each other, that's what we have to heal us. It works pretty well, that and dad's dogs. I throw on my jacket on the way out the door, and look out to see Kitty's truck headlights splashed across my front yard. She cuts them off and gets out, then heads for me, waving. I grin and raise a hand. Evening. Hi there, she calls up, and I try to fight my smile down, but the sight of her warms me. She's small, sweet-faced and very curvy, with a dynamite rack that even layers of clothing can't hide. She's got fluffy curly hair the color of honey, eyes nearly the exact same shade, and a smile that's contagious. 
It's pretty rare for me to meet someone that I want to hang out with all the time, cuddle silly and be with all at the same time. Usually I just want to do one or two of the three when I meet a lady, but Kitty is special. Too bad that if I proposed I'd probably scare her off. She's sweet, shy, and tiny. I'm roughly the size of a truck, hung to match, and keep company with ex-convicts. I know she knows I would never hurt her, but the logistics alone would take some work to overcome. I hate being stuck just watching and wanting, but the fact that she's an awesome friend eases that frustration a bit. She gets along with everyone, we trade favors all the time, and my dad loves her because she takes care of his dogs for him. But lately, I can't even finish with a woman unless I'm thinking about Kitty. She smiles up at me, and it warms me on this cold night even as I stand in front of her with my jacket open. Hey, do you have a few minutes or is this a bad time? No worries, sweetheart. Come on up, I've got a beer with your name on it. I step back, holding the door open for her as she bounces up the stairs. Immediately, happy barking starts up in the back of the house, and the whole pack scrambles toward the door at once. They know her and love her. Some women become crazy cat ladies. My dad calls himself a crazy dog guy. We laugh over it. But these rescue dogs, mostly pit bulls we save from a fighting ring, give dad a reason to get out of bed when he's having a rough time. I do whatever it takes to help him. The crash that disabled him and left me in charge of the bike club also made his PTSD worse. So, early last year, when he told me being around dogs helped his mood, we went looking for a puppy for him. Now the compound has seven. Four brindle and white pits, a roddy, a husky Tibetan mastiff mix named Chewbacca, and Laughing Boy, a coyote dog hybrid whose dad Randy keeps visiting the neighborhood. They crowd around us, their tails wagging uncontrollably as I lead Kitty inside. Hi, boys. Hi, Maggie. Her voice is bright as they press in to get their hugs. I kind of wish I could line up with them and get a hug too. It really is a bunch of guys in this household, even the dogs. The whole crew is a sausage fest except for Maggie Grew, the oldest pit bull and mother to the others. Just sort of worked out that way. Kitty disappears halfway into Chewbacca's russet fur as she hugs him, and he pants happily. Damn, she's adorable. Like me. She likes to wind down with a coffee and a beer in each hand on cold nights. I pour her a mug and pull a long neck out of the fridge, and then come back into the living room to find her on one of the big blanket-covered couches that line the room. Chewie has his head in her lap, and she's already got a grooming brush in her hand. So, what can I do for you, sweetheart? I ask as I flop onto the couch kitty corner to hers. Two of the pits, Bo and Maggie, hop onto the couch next to me, and the others settle around our feet. I need your help, you and the guys. You know cold season has come early. That's big trouble for the local feral cats, and I have to prepare for winter three weeks early, and as fast as possible. Her face is serious, as she works on the endless task of combing out Chewie's fur. Yeah, I notice the coyotes are passing through the neighborhood early. The cold's driving all their prey downhill. I frown as I set her drinks on the coffee table in front of her and set the bottle of chocolate syrup within reach. You seen Randy around? She snorts and reaches for the coffee first, setting aside the brush for a bit. She squirts syrup into her mug and stirs it as she talks. Yeah. He's fine. He conned Annabeth into thinking he was a stray dog. She's been feeding him on her porch for weeks on top of his hunting with his pack. He looks like a sausage in a fur coat now. I let out a bark of laughter, imagining it. That damn coyote is hilarious, but he's also a menace. If he can't eat your pet or livestock, then he tries to eat their food, and when he's done with their food he tries to mate with them. The result is a local koi dog problem that gave him his name and led to Kitty offering free spay-neuter procedures for local pets. Laffy, who knows the word Randy, keeps pricking up his ears as we talk. He was part of a half-German shepherd litter of six. Kitty takes an experimental sip of her makeshift mocha, and then a larger swallow. The last few years, even with the spay and release program for the feral cats, we've had at least ten litters every autumn in the woods around here. 
A few of the queens will be smart in their choice of nests and will just need some help with food, but some will need to be completely relocated. I nod, frowning a little. It's a busy time for us. We've just got the autumn pot crop in, and the whole thing is drying under the greenhouse tents. But I know I can't say no to her. Besides, if enough of the boys help out, we can handle the whole mess in a few days. And after that she'll need help socializing kittens, which is hardly work at all. Ten litters. And you've got room for them. I lift an eyebrow. I don't know how she gets as much done in that shelter as she does. She must have either a pile of money I don't know about, or some kind of magic. She has a website, volunteers, people doing adoption days for her in cities and towns up and down the coast, but and she just expanded her facilities again last year. Oh yeah, unless it's like 10 liters of 12 or something. Then I might have a problem. She gives a little nervous laugh. Chewy whines at her, desperate to regain her attention, and she goes back to brushing him. I know I can get some of the guys to help out. We have to have at least four of us dealing with the curing process, but that leaves six guys to help you out. 7. I heard my dad's voice in the doorway, sounding tired but determined. We look up to see him walking in with his cane, his grizzled face looking calm but focused. Dad and I resemble each other so closely that I pretty much know what I'm going to look like in about 25 years. Little grayer, little jollier. Only the cane gives him any real appearance of being old. So what's going on? He asks, limping over and plopping into his overstuffed chair across from the couch I'm perched on. He has his bong in his grip and loads it from an Altoids tin while he listens to her explanation. Kitten season, she starts, and goes back over what she told me. He nods along, then takes a long hit and holds it before passing her the bong. She hesitates, before taking a hit. Annabeth would be shocked to see me smoking like this. Annabeth shocks too easily. This would help her plenty with her arthritis, and besides, it's been legal for years now, I say, noticing Dad shoot me a look to tell me to shut up about the old church lady. He's got a soft spot in his head for war widows, and it's not like Annabeth isn't a nice person. But the truth is, she's called the police on us 20 times in just the last year, and all for dumb reasons. Guns we don't own, drugs we don't run, suspicious people, noise complaints about our motorcycles in the middle of the afternoon. The cops are sick of her, but they can't really explain to their boss why the local, wealthy, innocent war widow keeps calling in a panic if nothing is going on. She does shock too easily, and she prejudges people. But I can manage her. I'll just get permission to search her acres myself. She owes me a favor now. She shoots my dad a placating look, and he nods with a faint smile. Anyway, point is, you'll have plenty of help, I'm confident in promising. When will you need us? She flashes me that heartwarming smile again, eyes full of relief. Mid-afternoon tomorrow would be great, or the next day if you have trouble pulling things together on time. I nod and revel in that smile, and in how she's looking at me. It makes a guy a little too hopeful. But I'll manage. I always do. We'll be there tomorrow. No sweat. Now how about you pass me that bong, and we'll make plans. Chapter 3 Kitty The next day, the weather is a little warmer, but the freeze has already taken its toll. Plants are withering and sagging, their colors going dull as they transform from living things to standing mulch. My heart sinks as I load up my truck with a mix of traps, insulated shelters, bedding scraps and food. The sight of the mess reminds me again of how little time we have. I know the ecosystem around here pretty well. I'm not a full-fledged naturalist, but since I'm looking for lost and feral animals in the near wilderness, I decided to educate myself long ago. That plus experience has taught me that once the cold sets in enough for the plants to wither, the prey animals dig in or migrate. That meant three less weeks for the feral mothers to fatten for winter and wean their kits to do the same. It also means that the other predators will be hungrier. Coyote packs eat cats and certainly they eat kittens. A bear stuffing its face for hibernation will be under even more pressure now and will, if hungry enough, eat the cats, the kittens and even the coyotes. 
In late fall and early winter, nature around here truly turns red in tooth and claw. And then, everything freezes. I'm just glad that Jake and the guys are going to help me. I need it so badly. And the cats do too, though of course no cat ever would admit they needed some human's help, if they could admit anything at all. Once everything is loaded up, I tarp and tie the whole stack against the rain that's threatening, and slip inside to start up the truck and get on the radio that the guys use to communicate. The moment I turn it on I hear the ravens chattering on their helmet mics. Hey guys this is Kitty signing on. Hey sweetheart, purrs Jake his voice in my ear making my toes curl so hard inside my boots that they crack. So we're parceling out the seven plots of land you pointed out, while you search yours and the church ladies. Watch that kid, Jake's dad grumbles and I fight back a laugh. He has a crush on Annabeth. I for one think they would make a great couple. They're about the same age, he's a vet, and she already knows about living with someone with PTSD. But she's the one who mistakes coyotes for dogs and war vets for criminals. I'm not sure how we can get her past that. It's a cute idea to contemplate though. But if I'm thinking about improbable acts of Cupid, well. I'd rather start with me and Jake, even if that is a little selfish. He's wonderful though. I don't care that he and the guys sometimes got into bar brawls. They're good people. He's a good person. And sometimes when he looks at me, I forget for a little while that I'm shy and have the history of the average nun. Sometimes I wish I'd end my nights crushed under him, feeling things I've never felt before while he groans in my ear. I shake myself out of it after a few dreamy moments. We're parceling them out yeah, but we'll have to do them two at a time. We'll sweep northward along the road from town all the way up to the winter snow line. The cats won't go up above there, that's bear territory. It gets easier to give out instructions as I go, the words detach from my throat and some of my shyness dissipates. Each team will do a plot on opposite sides of the road. We'll skip over my land and Annabeth's and continue up the road on the other side once we get there. If you find cats, you mark the spot and call me there. I'll check it out and figure out how to proceed from there. Ferals don't go far from the road. If they ever lived with humans, then they like to stick by us. If they don't, roadkill and the rats, mice and squirrels that our gardens attract are usually the cat's main prey. Early in my rescues I would hike miles away from the road searching, but I never saw any signs of cats. I'd only ever find a lost dog or two, some curious bears and Randy, who would follow me for miles for treats and attention even though he'd only get his way sometimes. So now I concentrate on looking closer to civilization. How mean are these cats gonna be? Jake asks and I sigh sitting back and thinking about it. It really depends. No queen cat is going to like strangers around her kittens. But if she was dumped out here after she got pregnant, she should be pretty desperate to get indoors and will trust humans more. If she was born out here, she'll be wary at best and fight like the devil to protect her kittens. I'm not kidding. I have scars from desperate queens who only figured out days later once they and their kittens were well fed, warm and safe, that I never meant them harm. Let's just say that it's good that all you guys like wearing leather anyway. The guys laugh and make a few rowdy comments about dangerous women in bed. I laugh too. I'm not very good at being a lady and I don't ever bother around them because that's not what they expect. It's not even what they're comfortable with. I'll just have to dial it back when I talk to Annabeth about searching her land, raunchiness upsets her. Everything upsets her. I wish that I could find a way to get through to her about how unnecessary that all is, but she lives in a very black and white world. Sometimes I worry that I'll make one single misstep, she'll overreact and she'll start calling the police to my house as well. But then things like the mishap with Randy will happen, and I'm reminded that she's mostly just a slightly dotty but sweet old woman. While I wait for the first call to come in, I prep another of the cat shelters. They are wooden boxes that are roughly the size of a plastic tote that I've waterproofed, lined with insulation and put in smallish high entrances. The design sheds snow and rain and is tough enough to discourage predators. It has bolts screwed into it for anchoring the shelter, either on the ground or in the crotch of a well-developed tree. I stuff several handfuls of straw into it, for even more insulation. The wooden shelters are popular and not just with cats. 
Checking them weekly through to early spring, I found foxes, badgers, owls, a nesting pair of ravens, squirrels, mice, rabbits, and randy. Twice. Twenty minutes into the search, the radio crackles. Think I've got one on the edge of town, Jake mutters. I get on the radio, at once. Okay, I'm rolling. How far from the road? Not even a block. It's on the plot where they had the gas station fire. Think she's sheltering in an old oil drum. My face falls as I lock up and start the engine. Those things have no insulation and are full of toxic crap. I'm on my way. I focus on the drive down the hill toward town, which becomes visible once I go around a slight bend. I can see the lot in question, still slightly charred, every bit of bare ground thick with dead weeds. I park near Jake's motorcycle and look around. Jake is sitting back on his heels on one corner of the shattered blacktop, near a scorched stack of oil drums. His hair licks at his shoulders like a black flame in the wind, and I have to pause and just stare at him. Beautiful man, I think as I allow myself to look my fill for once on the way over. What have you got? I ask when I'm about two-thirds of the way across the lot. He looks back over his shoulder and puts a gloved finger to his lips in response. I close my mouth and slow down, looking cautiously past him. A fluffy gray tail drifts back and forth near his boot. I peek around his other side and see a thin, young long-haired cat, with a loose belly rubbing herself against his hand. Well I'll be damned. I got close and she just came right over. Indeed she had, and now she was purring audibly and clinging to his ankle. Someone must have dumped her here. Poor baby. I crouch down with him, and the cat shies away for a few moments before coming over to sniff my outstretched hand. Her friendliness is both lucky and heartbreaking. She trusted humans and look what humans did. Do you think we can get her to come with us? He asks softly and I nod. I don't know how she'll handle us trying to do anything to her babies, but we can try. The corners of my jaw hurt as I let the kitty walk around me, sniffing me. She is purring like a motor, in fact, she seems almost frantic to get our attention. Is this normal for strays you pick up? He asks, his low voice full of fascination. She's practically climbing up his pant leg in her quest for warmth and a good petting. Sometimes. Her owner probably dumped her when she turned up pregnant, and she's done the best she could out here ever since. There's a lump in my throat that won't go away as I turn back toward the truck. The cat panics as I straighten and runs up to me, meowing loudly. It's okay mama, I'm not going far. But she won't have it. She snags a claw in my pant leg and then jumps down and runs toward the barrels. Now what? I mutter, and Jake joins me in following her. Oh yeah, she's definitely on board with being rescued, Jake drawls as the cat leaps up into one of the barrels, which holds a thin little nest of rags and newspapers. The desperate mewing inside tells me that she's at least managed to keep her babies alive through the first freezes. His shoulders block my view into the barrel and I have to resist a sudden urge to jump onto his broad back for a closer look. Hey big guy, I can't see through you. I'll count him. Hand me your flashlight. He reaches back and I press it into his huge gloved hand. I wait, trying to ignore how he looks up close in his tight jeans and failing in the worst way. He's half bent into the barrel with the queen cat meowing at him nervously, but she doesn't hiss and I stare at the way the denim molds to his muscular cheeks and bulging rock-hard thighs. Shit. I need to focus on what I'm doing here. Two, three, four, five. Five kitties. Little bit skinny and shivery, but they're all still alive. You got a carrier big enough for all of them? I smile. Yeah, I brought the big ones along with the other stuff. Do you think we can get the mama cat to cooperate? He half straightens and looks over his shoulder at me, eyes dancing. Are you kidding me? He replies with a smirk as Mama Cat hops out of the barrel with a kitten by the scruff and starts carrying her over to my truck. It's a lucky find, a healthy docile first litter, even if a little chilled and hungry. None of them particularly like the kennel I bring, as it smells faintly of dog. But once they feel the warm air from the heating pad I slipped in there, Mama starts hauling her kittens into their temporary new digs by the scruff. We watch until everyone's settled, and I sigh, noticing dried blood on some of the bedding. It's a wonder that she didn't draw predators. Maybe the rust and chemical stink of the drums masked the birthing scent. 
Whatever the case, I barely have time for the chill to start sinking through my gloves before we're strapping the crate into my passenger seat. Mama Cat apparently knows what a car ride is, because she's already yowling in irritation. The kittens start mewing, and I giggle a little as I make sure they're secure. So where do you need me? Jake draws from behind me. I feel his eyes on me and blink. He's not checking me out, is he? But no, of course not. That's a silly idea. I should tell him to get back to searching. The weather's going to drop below freezing again tonight and the threatening rain could turn to snow in a day or two. We can't really spare any time. Well, I need to get the babies here settled in one of the isolation rooms and get them and mama fed and watered. After that I'll be ready to go out and gather more. But, I hesitate. I don't really need his help handling this litter. But, if you feel like helping me settle them in, you're welcome. I'll grab some thermoses of coffee for the boys while we're at it. Warmth creeps up my cheeks even as I say it. I'm being selfish and silly but, I want him with me. He answers almost too quickly. Sounds good. And a few thermoses of rocket juice sound good too. I fight back the urge to beam at him like an idiot. Yeah. Hopefully all the relocations go this smoothly. Chapter 4 Jake. Get it off me. Tony yells, spinning in an awkward circle, while a furious cat clings to the back of his jacket and swats at his ear with one paw. He looks a little bloodied. If it wasn't for the look of sheer panic on his face, I would burst out laughing right there. The culprit is a tiny but furious mama cat, pure white, with her teeth sunk into Tony's collar. The burly bearded redhead twirls in place, trying in vain to grab her to pull her off and getting his hand scratched for his trouble. All right, all right, I grump, pulling on the heavy gauntlets Kitty retrieved from her truck and walking over to him. Hold still already. You try holding still while an angry cat's trying to tear your earlobe off, he yelps, 200 pounds of biker defeated by 6 pounds of fuzzy fury. I do my best to ignore my doubled-over dad, who is laughing silently with tears streaming down his face. Poor Tony is humiliated enough, and if I pay too much attention, I'll start laughing too. The other guys are looking at the sky, all except for Kitty, who has just wrangled the last of the kittens into the carrier. They're tiny too, and mewing for their mama, but at least now they're out of that deadfall and safe on top of one of the heating pads. How can anything this little be this fierce? She's one of the smaller breeds, maybe a Singapura mix. The babies are well-developed, but they're bitty like her. We have to get all of them inside. She looks up at poor battered Tony and winces. Do you guys need a hand? Nah, it's fine, I've got her. I move up behind Tony, who has finally managed to keep still, and grasp the kitty around her midsection, at which point she turns her head and hisses a warning at me as she digs her claws into both of his ears. Ah! He grunts between gritted teeth, and I gingerly pluck them out of his flesh. Come on, kitty, I start, and then she suddenly turns on me in a blur of claws. Damn. I manage to keep hold of her midsection as she twists in my grip and starts lashing all four sets of claws in a blur of desperation and attitude. Hey. Knock it off, damn it. I yell, holding her at arm's length as she starts furiously chewing on one of the gauntlets. This one's either completely feral or traumatized, Kitty frets, preparing to open the door to the kennel as I walk the little spitfire toward her. I can actually feel the pressure of her little teeth through the thick leather, though she can't break through and get at my skin. Yeah, you've got that right. I think she's convinced we want to eat her and her kids. I crouch down beside Kitty and quickly thrust the little hellcat inside. She calms down immediately refusing to stay violent in close quarters with her kittens. I barely manage to pull the gauntlets out before she bolts for the door. Kitty manages to close it before she can get back out. She's really panicked and she doesn't quite seem to know what to do. I think she's very young. Kitty sounds even more worried now. I grunt in satisfaction and straighten. Think Tony's gonna need the liquid bandage for his ear. 
I watch a little jealously as Kitty gets Tony to sit down, then cleans the blood off his ear and sprays on the liquid bandage. He winces slightly, but the bleeding stops at once. I take a peek inside the kennel, and the little hellcat hisses at me, but she's laying down now, her handful of tiny kittens snuggled against her, nursing. We made sure that's all of them. It's a small litter. Not sure if any of them were stillborn, it's been at least five weeks since the birth. But at least we can save these ones. She shoots me an apologetic look as she packs up her medical gear. No, looks like they haven't even been here very long. She must have moved them. It's getting dark. With a hell of a lot of work, we've rescued six litters. Five queens and their litters, plus four orphans we managed to get the other mamas to accept. Forty cats in all. I'm exhausted. The boys are talking Miller time, and everyone's craving pizza and a smoke. We'd better call it for the night, Kitty agrees, though I see the guilt and apprehension on her face. She's so sweet. She's a vet, but even so, she doesn't seem to have fully grasped yet that she can't save them all. I'll put these guys in an isolation room and get them food and water. Then I need a break. I eye her. And then you'll be giving every last one of them a checkup between now and when we go back out again tomorrow afternoon. I let my disapproval creep into my voice, and she blushes and lowers her eyes. I have to at least do the basics before I can make room for more animals tomorrow, she ventures, and I shake my head. Not alone, you don't. And first let's get you warmed, caffeinated, and filled with some dinner. I give her a pointed look, and she blushes deeper and nods. Okay. You won't be hearing me say you have an easy job anymore, I admit later. My belly's full of meat top pizza and dad's hard cider, and I'm walking into the shelter with Kitty, determined to make sure she doesn't work too hard. The complex is separated into two sections, the converted stables in front where the veterinary clinic is, and the converted barn, now the shelter. The latter is sectioned off into a series of nurseries and isolation rooms, with a grooming center in the back corner. Cats that have already been properly socialized lounge all over the main play area, running up to us and meowing for attention. I give a few a good petting as we make our way toward the first of the isolation rooms. Hey Tank, hey Mikey. I scratch the pair of former Tomcats on the belly as I go by. I love socializing the fur balls, especially when they're pretty friendly to begin with. I'm not a cat whisperer like Kitty, so I'm not so great with the nasty ones. Kitty looks in through the transparent door at the first group we saved, and I come up behind her. Gray Mama has devoured all her food and is sleepily nursing in her heated bed. The litter box has been used, showing this cat's comfort with domestication. She looks up and meows at us, tail drifting calmly. I don't think we'll have any problem finding homes for this Mama cat and her babies. They will barely need any socialization at all. Just the health stuff. She moves on to the next isolation room almost at once, using a triage process. Some of the other litters are in a lot worse shape, and they need to be helped first. Oh yeah, she's a sweetheart. Damn shame that some jerk put her out. The next isolation room has Hellcat in it. She hisses angrily at us and lunges at the door as Kitty crouches down. Watch out for that one, though. She's got one hell of a Napoleon complex. You see it in small dogs, too. They get scared by everyone being so huge, so they show a lot of attitude. She points at the big, heated shelter bed where her tiny litter of three is curled up. But now that she's calming down, she's more consistent in taking care of her babies. See how their bellies are all round now. Yeah, guess she could give more milk with clean water and a meal in her belly. Hellcat hisses at us again, but there's less enthusiasm to it. This one's gonna take a lot of patience and love, Kitty. That's okay, I have plenty of both to spare. She smiles at the feisty cat, who finally relaxes enough to peer at her before heading over to her empty food trays. She paws at one and lets out a tentative meow. I noticed, I say, fighting the urge to play with her sleek braid. I can't keep the tenderness out of my tone and after a moment's pause, she turns back to look at me. She looks up into my eyes, and for a long breathless moment, 
I can't tell whether she wants me to kiss her. I stare at her and finally manage, can I ask you a personal question? Um, she murmurs, leaning against the door to face me fully. Sure, what is it? Her cheeks are so pink. It's ridiculously adorable. How come you don't have guys breaking down your door to go out with you? I've actually wondered that for years. I can't stop smiling now. I may be making the world's stupidest mistake, but I'm happy about it. She's silent for an alarmingly long time. Then she murmurs, oh, as if surprised by my question. I am well, they just don't. Her smile trembles, and I see pain in the backs of her eyes and want to snuff it out at once. I scratch my neck awkwardly as I straighten up. I hit a nerve. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's just that I'm shy, busy all the time, and um, dot not conventional looking. She swallows and goes quiet again, and I feel a surge of anger and grief on her behalf as I think about the ugly treatment that must have caused her shyness. But at least she's not outright saying she's not conventionally attractive. No, you're not conventional looking, but I like that. I think you've run into a lot of idiots over the years who think women should only look one way. As in, bony underwear models with artificially big chest. I'm amazed by how many guys get fantasy and reality so mixed up. But their stupidity is my gain in this case, if I'm very lucky. Yeah, she replies in a small voice, but now the note of despair is gone, and she's looking up at me with her big beautiful eyes. Well, for the record, you're beautiful, all right. No joke. I don't want to hide my feelings anymore, even if I'm overstepping things. Hell, I don't think I can. Thank you she murmurs, and her expression's a little bit baffled. I can't help but crack a grin. It's not charity. It's the truth. I just never said a damn thing because I didn't want to scare you off. We're standing so damn close. I want to pull her into my arms. She looks up at me and then moves forward slightly, heat in her eyes. You don't have to worry about that, she says in that soft, warm voice. Your buddy Annabeth doesn't like me too much. I murmur, wondering how much influence her neighbor actually has on Kitty's opinions. It doesn't seem to be much, but... Annabeth's scared of who she thinks you are. She's built up some mythology about you and the guys in her head, and it's filled with stereotypes. But I'm not her. I actually know you. She reaches out, just the tiniest gesture, her eyes shy, her fingertips brushing down the open zip of my jacket. You're the first guy that I first thought to go to for help. That should probably tell you something. That gets me right in the heart, and I move up against her, taking her in my arms. It does, I murmur. Chapter 5 Kitty Jake lifts me off my feet a little as he kisses me. As nice as I find that, it's absolutely necessary. He dwarfs me. And when he hugs me tight against him, I'm actually glad of my extra padding. I'm still in shock that he's attracted to me. All this time I thought he only cared about me, like I was part of his weird extended family. But then his mouth comes down on mine, and I can't think of anything at all outside of the feeling of his lips on mine. I sigh, blushing down to my toes as if I'm 14 and my mom just caught me smooching the neighborhood bad boy. But then again, it's been a while since I've had a proper kiss and no kiss I've ever received has been as proper as the one I just got. I'd rather go back in for seconds, but whoever's out front is leaning on the doorbell now like it's some kind of emergency. We both look over at the flashing signal light that accompanies it, and I shake my head. I had better go see who it is. Damn it, he grumbles, good-naturedly given the circumstances. I can completely sympathize. Yeah. I grumble back as I head back out the door toward the house. The doorbell keeps buzzing and buzzing, and I bite back the urge to yell at whoever it is. Of all the damn times for some jackass to interrupt me, I growl under my breath as I stomp around the corner of the house. Annabeth is standing there, awkwardly holding her coat closed over her housecoat, her hair in curlers and her eyes full of fear. My anger fades away immediately as I catch the panic in her face, and I hurry over. Hey, what is it? Is everything all right? 
That's what I was going to ask you, she gasps out, looking me over. Those bikers have been coming around your property, and I saw one of their motorcycles parked in your driveway and just thought. My heart sinks. Damn it. Annabeth honey, it isn't like that at all. You know how I asked you if I could search your land for kittens tomorrow? She calms slightly. Um no. Wait. Yes. Yes you did bring it up, that was a little after lunchtime. Then she blinks at me in confusion. But what does that have to do with those criminals? Did they do anything to you? Are you in trouble? Do you need to come over to my place to hide? Oh Annabeth. I want to hug her tight and beat her with a pool noodle at the same time. Idiot. Lovable idiot. No honey no. Just look. I needed help. A lot of help fast. Jake and his men owe me because I take care of their dogs, and so I asked them. Annabeth blinks at me slowly, and for a moment I think that it's all going to sink in. They were helping you rescue kittens. Five mama cats and forty-five kittens. You can come by tomorrow morning and see them for yourself once I've had a chance to give them all checkups. If you have room in your home for a coyote, well, that you keep telling me Mittens wants someone to play with. Her eyes light up, and I feel another little tentative bit of hope. Well, I would like to see the kitties. But not while those bikers dotter around. I really don't know about using them as volunteers, sweetie. I never liked that you go over there so much. They're dangerous people. Annabeth, look, I know that your heart is in the right place, I start beseechingly, because I'm tired of this and want to go back to Jake's arms. It was a good day, even if we didn't rescue all the cats out there. That kiss made it so much better, and in its wake Annabeth's disapproval stings. But what she snaps. Her eyes seem fixed on my mouth suddenly. If you're about to patronize me don't. I think you know me a little better than that. I sigh and her defensive look softens. Well what is it then? She's staring at my mouth. I'm certain of it, and her scrutiny makes me squirm inside. I calm myself by counting to ten before answering. Have you ever even had a conversation with any of them? Jake's father Spike is a vet and very. Of course I haven't spoken to any of them, Annabeth cuts in quickly. They're too dangerous for a woman to be around on her own. That's the whole reason I'm so worried about you right now. I rub my face, too aware of the chill and the way my lips still tingle, sensitized by the touch of Jake's mouth. Look, even if you don't trust them, you can trust me. Have I ever steered you wrong? She puts her chubby little hands on her hips, and I suddenly realize that I'm in for more of a lecture than I expected. Well, you know, normally I would trust you. But this time it's pretty clear your judgment is off, sweetie. My heart starts beating faster, part from worry about what she's going to do and part from fighting the urge to just smack her silly. All those pointless unprovoked phone calls to police, dot and now she's acting like something's wrong with me too. What do you mean? Your lipstick smeared and you've been alone in the barn with that, that gang leader. What is this? Are you completely crazy? The man is a criminal. She even flaps her arms a little for emphasis. That's when I reach my limit. I'm not normally an aggressive person, especially with Annabeth, but the tide of anger that rises up inside of me feels like a volcano about to blow. Annabeth, stop making stuff up and believing it's true. The man's got nothing on his record more serious than blowing through a stop sign, and you can check that for yourself. She huffs at me angrily, her eyes flashing. You just think this big Jake is cute so you want to cover for him. I don't have to cover for him. I have a barn full of rescue kittens that says he's not what you think he is. I actually raise my voice a little. And the ravens go out of their way not to disturb you, even though you've used the police to harass them for years. In fact, if Jake's dad didn't think that you're cute, Jake probably would have told you where to shove it by now. She pauses blinking, and her hands slip off her hips in her surprise. Spike Steele thinks I'm CEO oh, never mind that. I'm worried about you, Kitty. Those men may be nice to you now, but they're only waiting for you to let your guard down. They've been waiting for years? To do what? Annabeth, please. I'm cold, and I have a lot of work to do on those cats. Can't you just, I break off. 
I'm so tired of this. Oh, don't talk to me about your responsibilities, you ridiculous girl. You know, that's not why you're so eager to get back to what you were doing. As soon as you disappear back into the barn with that gang's leader, he'll be kissing off the rest of your makeup, I just know it. I freeze, staring at her. Uh oh. For once, her crazy theory is actually half right, which will probably make her feel even more justified. Okay, that's it. I'm going to have to ask you to get off my property and go home. Her jaw drops. She seems oblivious to just how far out of line she's being, so blinded by her good intentions that she's not looking at the effects her actions have on others. We stare at each other, with me fighting the regret welling up inside of me. Finally, she turns on her heel and hobbles away, not looking back once as she heads up toward the road. I watch her until she disappears into the gloom and shake my head, my heart in my shoes. I feel like I've just lost Annabeth as a friend, but that isn't the worst of it. I know this isn't the end of this, and I'm suddenly very, very worried about what she might be planning. Chapter 6 Jake After that kiss, even the crap with Annabeth can't kill my mood or ruin what's blooming between me and Sweet Kitty. We've brought in every litter we could find over the last couple weeks. Now we're dealing with a long process of checking, grooming, immunizing, feeding, and socializing, a grand total of 78 kittens, 9 mama cats, and 1 injured Tom. But I don't mind one bit of the extra work, as long as I can spend time with her. I have to take it slow with this little lady, which is excruciating but delicious all at once. It's not enough that she has a crush on me and wants to sleep with me because she thinks it's what I expect. I want her to want it so much that I can coax her past some of her shyness. We steal kisses while we work in the shelter, while the boy's dad and I help her get her Christmas lights up, and every night before we both bed down. It's hard to ignore someone who camps out across the road from your house and watches your comings and goings with a pair of binoculars and a video recorder especially when she keeps sneaking onto our land and setting the dogs off barking. It would actually be funny and cute if it wasn't awkward as hell, leaving Kitty and I feeling even more like we have to sneak around. In a way though, the sneaking around makes things even more amazing. It's forced us to draw things out, making us limit the things we can do with one another, as if we're teenagers sneaking around behind our parents' backs. I get hard as a rock just thinking about kissing Kitty. Meanwhile, I've got a wannabe spy in pink chenille and purple wellies sneaking around my bushes. She's back again. Dad's eyes are dancing. He's the only one of us who is happy about this development. In fact, his mood has picked up a lot since she started coming around and giving him an excuse to confront her. Outside, by one of the windows, I hear a rustle and a yelp as our visitor trips into a hedge. I grumble and set down my beer. I'm getting the hose. Three of the guys start snickering, and Dad laughs and levers himself out of his chair. No, no, don't you go doing something we'll feel guilty about in the morning. I'll go talk to her. If it's a date she wants, why can't she just get your damn phone number and stay out of our bushes? I'm still grumbling, but it's more good-natured. Across from me, Lars, a new pledge with an agricultural science degree, is turning red and choking into his hand, blonde hair flopping across his face. I'll see if I can convince her. My dad pulls his fleece-lined jacket on and zips it before going outside. He's humming and tugging on his gloves as he closes the door. I shake my head and stop fighting my grin. This crap is annoying, and we're going to have to find a way around it. But right now, Dad's happy. Something that hasn't happened often enough lately. He's also providing Annabeth with a perfect distraction as I grab my own jacket and slip out the back. It's a week before Christmas now, and the weather's gone from crisp to ball shrinkingly cold at night. A thin crust of snow covers everything, reflecting the moonlight with a pale bluish glow. Everyone's got their lights up, as much for road safety in this dark stretch of mountain road as its ability to pierce the gloom and because it looks pretty. Even our big front hedges are covered in twinkling multicolored lights, which look like thousands of psychedelic fireflies. Since we started doing that two years ago, 
the drunken holiday drivers who take a wrong turn through our hedge have gone from a few a year to none. The lights are still on over at the shelter, meaning that my sweet little lady is still hard at work. Big surprise there. I head to the shelter door, wondering where the heck Kitty gets her energy from. She claims she takes a lot of naps scattered throughout the day, and it leaves me wondering if I should try that myself. But I still catch her yawning as I walk inside. She's crouching at the open door of one of the isolation rooms, holding her fingers out for Hellcat. That angry little kitty, along with her babies, is discovering the joys of being warm, clean, free of fleas, and well-fed. Kitty yawns into her fist, eyes squinting closed, and the white ball of razor's fluff and attitude spies me and comes bounding over. I don't know how it is that over the last few weeks, Hellcat decided I was hers. Maybe it was because of all the time I spent here, or because I let her kids climb on me, or maybe because I don't put up with her shit. But I crouch down, and with a few scrambles and leaps, she's perched on my shoulder, kneading the leather and purring up a storm. Hey, Hellcat. I give her a good scratching. Now that the fleas and filth are gone and she's had weeks of good meals, she's gone from ratty as old couch stuffing to a fluffy white fairy kitty who could still destroy a person if she wanted to. I look up at Kitty and give her a smile. Hey, Angel Cat. Hey, Jake. She always looks a little flushed and bright-eyed when I'm around her these days, like she can't quite believe the direction things have gone between us. She's so overwhelmed by everything, every kiss, every touch, that I've slowly come to realize that before me she was totally untouched. Yet another reason for me to take it easy and slow, and to savor every moment with her. First times only come around once, and I really want to take care of her. So what's the latest? I stifle a yawn. The damn things really are contagious. Well, I have homes for 39 of the kittens and two of the mama cats. We're breaking up the families as little as possible, but they all have to get the rest of their immunizations and get sterilized before we send them out. I'm hoping to get the first round of kittens to their new homes by the 23rd. That's nine going home. These guys have gained an average of seven ounces, which is a little behind the curve. She reaches over to pet Hellcat, who purrs and leans into her hand. Her three babies came to us the size of hamsters, and we're doing our best to help them gain weight. So far, so good. Any of them turn up with any real health problems. The yearling tomcat, a skinny black thing who had stuck by his mother, had a badly healed back leg that Kitty had been forced to correct with surgery. He is hobbling around on a cast now, and is already a pound heavier. His is the worst problem I know about, but you never really know for sure until you have the test results back. Labs are notoriously bad at sending reports back on time in rural areas, especially during the holidays, or so Kitty tells me. Well, besides the fleas and a late-season tick or two and the one litter passing around some low-grade sniffles, we're okay. Some of them have scars, some needed their claws trimmed, and some still need their teeth cleaned, including Hellcat. She rolls her eyes as Hellcat's kittens climb onto her shoulders, claws digging into her green and red ugly Christmas sweater. I laugh. That's gonna be an adventure. How do you plan to manage it? Maybe I'll get the kittens used to it too, so she'll see them go through it and come out all right. She may attack my legs again while I'm doing their teeth, but I'll wear my over-the-knee boots. You should wear those anyway, you look good in them, I say in a teasing voice, and she laughs and ducks her head. I catch her chin with two fingers, very gently, and coax her head up. I'm not kidding. I purr at her, and watch her eyes dilate as her knees get just a bit wobbly. She's like a love-struck teen. It's adorable. I am smiling down at her, and ready to lean in for another kiss, when suddenly the lights go out. The darkness that drops down over my vision is so profound that for a second I think I've gone blind, but then I realize what has happened. The distant heavy clunk that accompanies our plunge into total darkness tells me that this is more than a blown fuse. So do the faint curses I hear outside and down the hill at our place. Shit, Kitty growls as we both pull flashlights off our belts. A moment later, the emergency lights kick on, sending a faint amber glow over everything. Blackout. Great. 
It's another part of winter that has come far too early, the regular, usually short failures of our power grid. I put a hand on her shoulder to help her steady herself. What heating system is this building on? Natural gas hydronics, both in floor and through radiators. The gas isn't interrupted, so we'll have heat as long as we can run the thermostat. The problem is electricity, lights, thermostat, computers, phone charging, and most of my lab equipment run on building power. She takes several steadying breaths. What about your generators? The ones for the shelter are new, though I have to check their fuel levels. But the generators for the main house are both offline. I didn't have time to get them fixed before this early winter crap happened. Not on top of everything else. She can't keep the frustration out of her voice. Okay, look. You keep getting the cat sorted out as best you can. I'll go kick on the generators for in here and check your fuel levels, then go over to the main house and start bringing us back some food and bedding. We can sleep in here tonight, keep the cat's company. She blinks at me several times, then says haltingly, That, that sounds good, Jake. I don't understand why she's staring at me wide-eyed, until we bundle Hellcat and her boys into their room, and I am on my way out the door. As I step out into the cold night again, it suddenly hits me. I just told her that I'm staying the night with her. And she just agreed. Holy shit! I walk around toward the generator shed with a big smile on my face, not feeling the cold at all. Chapter 7 Kitty It shouldn't come as a surprise to me at this point, but Jake sure knows how to take charge. Three minutes after he walks out, I hear the rumble of the generators starting up, and suddenly the lights flicker back on. I smile, heart still pounding a little over what I just agreed to so easily. He's staying the night. And apparently, he wants to stay the night in relative comfort. I'm shocked when Jake's idea of bringing some bedding back starts with an entire guest room mattress coming through the shelter door, with Jake grunting and shoving at the far end. I run forward to help, and we pull it through onto the heated concrete floor between the isolation rooms. The free-range cats are meowing at us and milling around the room, unused to the lights going out so early. They are just as confused as I am. But when Jake sighs and straightens, turning to face me, I see his exasperated expression and know he has some news. What is it? I ask him as he frowns and glances back at the door. Well, I've got some bad news. The temperature's dropping fast as hell, and as it turns out, we had a transformer go out between here and town. That means it will be at least until morning, before anyone can get out here. Maybe another half day after that to get the new transformer in, fix any problems the failure caused, and move on. Now, I can run you some fuel from our stockpile if you need some for the generators, but we'll still have to stretch it. Make sure that it gets used for heating, cooking, vet equipment, stuff like that. He snorts, seeing the half a dozen cats that have already hopped onto the mattress and flopped down. You make it sound like it might be days. I couldn't keep the worry out of my voice. The heat was functioning, but the thermostat was not, and neither were the heater's electronic components. Not without power. Well, they don't like the bad publicity of making local people go without power on the holidays, but that doesn't mean they won't let a small number of us slide because they're short-handed for the same damn reason. He looks at me, his face full of concern. You're worried about running out of generator fuel and not being able to fire the heater. My heart sinks. Growing up I was so sickly that I stayed home a ton and my cats were often my only real company. I got attached. Now, thinking of all these kittens we've rescued who are now at risk of freezing all over again, I start to shake. Oh shit. Hey 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 don't do that. Don't freak out. Jake steps forward and pulls me against his massive chest, the scent of leather, sweat, and a hint of pot mixing in my nostrils as I cling to him. It'll be okay. I let out a small sob of frustration and anxiety, and bury my face against him. The early winter, Annabeth, getting all the cats ready for adoption, trying to find them homes, it has all taken its toll. Now the blackout has added to that, and even though Jake is here with me, I'm at the end of my rope. But as he holds me, his heat starts sinking into me and my body relaxes a little. 
His arms settle around me and he strokes his hand over the back of my head until I relax even more, and the tears stop pushing at the backs of my eyes. There you go, he murmurs as a set of sharp claws starts making their way up my leg over my hip and up my side. I blink and look down into a pair of wide blue-green eyes. The Siamese kitten lets out a giant meow, and Jake starts laughing silently, shaking against me. It'll be fine, he purrs in my ear as he plucks the kitten from my clothes and sets it on his shoulder. I promise. We keep working, using as few lights and electrical equipment as we can. Now and again I hear the heater kicking back on, as it fights the chill seeping through the building's brick walls and thick insulation. When I get overwhelmed, which keeps happening because I'm so tired and stressed, he's right there for me. Eventually, I recover enough that I can start looking forward to this whole, staying over thing again. I could be reading this wrong. He could just want to keep me safe in the middle of this whole mess. There are some real creeps living close enough that you never know who might try to take advantage of something like this. Now and again one of them decides to slip up into the hills during a storm or blackout to see who might be naive enough to leave their doors unlocked. Jake could just be acting chivalrous. Except? Except as my heart calms and I nestle against him, I can't help but notice the throbbing boulder pushing into my belly. His jeans are doing nothing to hide it, and I can feel him clearly even through my layers of clothing. It's almost alarming how huge he is, and I suddenly realize one really big reason why he's been taking it so slow with me. Well damn. I am suddenly blushing from my collarbones up, and trying not to giggle. What is it? He rumbles curiously. He lets me go because more cats are yelling for food, and we move to remedy the situation, filling bowls and topping off the water fountains. As we work I'm still struggling not to giggle. Come on what? Well sweetie, I just figured out that you're packing the Washington Monument. Give me a second, I'll be fine. Um. It's nothing, I'm just trying to see the funny side of all this. That's probably a good thing. He chuckles as he tears open another bag of cat food. The chorus of meows is so ridiculous that I wish I could spare a bit of power to record it. Good thing cats don't give a shit if it's dark. I bet the dogs are panicking. They'll just need to know where everyone is. Especially Chewy. I can't hear his booming barks from over here though, so I suspect Spike's taking care of him. Then I hesitate. I should go check on Annabeth. Shit. He grumbles but then lets out a sigh. You're right, she's up there alone. He turns a look my way. I guess you don't want me coming with. She'll freak out. I don't like being out there alone in the dark but, if I have any more drama tonight I'll just be done. I frown. I don't want to take one second away from Jake and my work to deal with Annabeth. The lady has managed to alienate me a hell of a lot these past couple weeks no matter how good her intentions. Duty calls though. I've always been a good neighbor, even when Annabeth doesn't deserve it with her annoying but well-intentioned snooping. Okay. But ah, uh, while you're over there, could you ask her to stay out of my bushes? Dad likes it, but they need to go on a real date instead of that. You know. He nuzzles a kiss into the top of my head. I chuckle a little as I bundle up and grab my big flashlight. One lingering kiss later, and I reluctantly walk out into the cold. The whole area looks eerie, with no lights on. Now and again, the slice of winding highway downhill lights up through the pines with brief flashes as a set of headlights races past. There are generators humming away in the gloom up and down the hill, and as I step out into the road to get a better view, I see that Jake's place and Annabeth's both have faint lights in their windows. I smile with relief. She must be fine. But I know I should still check on her, so I start trudging up the hill, carefully hugging the shoulder of the road. A sharp bark catches my attention and my head snaps around. I see the faint pale shape of a fat coyote standing on the other side of the road, right before the blind curve just beyond Annabeth's house. Oh hey Randy, I start before being cut off by the rising rumble of a motor as a dark shape races toward me, blocking the coyote from sight. Damn. I throw myself into the woods just in time, a speeding SUV with its lights off roars past me just inches from my legs. 
The hot wind from the machine throws me off balance and sprays bits of dead leaves and road grit into my face. I grab a tree and hang on, panting in shock as the drunk driver goes weaving down the road, brake lights never even flickering. Oh gosh, I almost died. If Randy hadn't gotten my attention, but I can't even finish that thought before I start sobbing. A little while later, I hear heavy booted footsteps approach. They stop near my flashlight, which lies a few feet away from my shivering balled up form. A gloved hand picks it up and flashes it around. I squint as the light falls over me. I know it's Jake by his scent as he stows the flashlight and scoops me into his arms. I cling to him and just let him carry me back to the shelter, my chest hitching and my cheeks cold from tears. It takes me a long time to recover, and by the time I do, he has my coat, vest and boots off, and he's cuddling with me in the nest of comforters and pillows he's piled onto the mattress. He kicks off his boots as he cradles me, sighing into my hair. You okay? he asks finally. Did you fall? No, I mumble as I tuck my head under his chin. There was a drunk guy driving with his headlights off outside in this mess, and he almost hit me. I leave out the bit about Randy, because that part is a little too weird for me, and I'm not calm or stoned enough to tell it yet. Geez, he mumbles horrified. Any idea what the car looked like? Black SUV, no lights, barely touched his brakes. No idea who it was, but I doubt they're actually from around here. I hope anyway. If I ever actually caught whoever drove that vehicle, I would probably beat him up. Jake, despite being gentle with me, radiates protective anger right now, and I know he would be perfectly willing to back me up when it came time for that beating. And that could land both of us in jail, so, that not a good idea at all. Maybe, if I ever find the jerk, I'll just sue him silly. I can certainly afford a good lawyer now. And anyone who drives a new SUV with no lights down a mountain road has to be rich enough that replacing it wouldn't be a burden, so I don't feel at all bad about the idea. I'll have my guys go looking for that idiot in town tomorrow he growls, and I feel a strange mix of flattery, shock, worry, and horniness. Jake wait. If we do anything about this guy, I want to find out his name and address so I can serve him with a lawsuit. It's such a city girl thing to say that I'm a little shocked as the words come out of my mouth. He blinks down at me, then nods. I can understand that. But if you want to sue, you'll have to file a police report. It'll be asked about, especially since you almost got seriously hurt. He's petting my hair slowly, meditatively, dot and then he's slipping the band off my braid and gently undoing it. A tingle shoots down from my scalp and all the way to my toes. I let out a low gasp. I don't know how Jake manages it, but the safety I feel in the circle of his arms is the perfect antidote to my crazy brush with death, and all the adrenaline it's shot into my system. That terrible moment, when I was almost crushed to death by the SUV is fading into the back of my head like a quickly receding nightmare. I lay my cheek against his chest and hear the soft thunder of his heart in my ear. It's time says something inside of me, and apprehension mixes with anticipation, tightening my guts and leaving my heart pounding. My cheeks are so flushed that my tears dry quickly, leaving my skin tight in their absence. We kiss for a long time while he runs his hands through my loosened hair, and my fingertips explore his chest and shoulders through his shirt. The territory is growing more familiar, but exploring the planes and curves of his muscled body never gets old. Now here he is. Am I ready for this? I had better be. The roller coaster is ticking up the first slope, and the ride is about to begin. After a while, he drags his head up and loosens his grip on me. My flesh aches a little where his hands rest, I may have bruises later. He seems a little ashamed of that, asking at once, you okay? It takes me a few dizzy moments before I can form words. I smile up at him while I do my best. I'm more than okay. By a lot. A tired grin flashes across his face as he lays his head on my shoulder. Good. Me too. Chapter 8 Jake the road crew from the power company manages to get the power back on at mid-afternoon the next day. Kitty and I look after the cats and each other until then and spend the rest of our time in bed. 
she's sleeping peacefully when the lights come back on. I squint up into the sudden brightness and sigh, reluctantly sitting up. The generators need to be turned off, and everything needs to be checked, and she's been working too hard. I won't disturb her. My skin actually tingles as I pull on my jeans. I haven't gotten laid this thoroughly in years. It's enough to make even me a little wobbly. And it definitely puts me in a good mood, even as I plod around in the cold without my coffee or wake and bake. I hope everything's all right down at our place, but I'll have to check after I take care of things up here. The guys will have things covered at the clubhouse. But I do take a look down the road after turning off the generators and restoring main power to the heating system. My eyebrows rise as I catch sight of activity down the road. Well, that explains why the power's out. There's a repair crew working a quarter mile down from the clubhouse, currently hauling a mangled truck and the chunks of the power pole it shattered up the slope with winches. There's a coroner's truck just beyond that is closing up to leave. The transformer didn't blow. It's lying on its side at the edge of the road with traffic cones and a ring around it. I can only imagine how fast that truck was going when it hit the pole, or how drunk the driver was. It chills my blood to see. I know he or she has to be the one in the body bag I glimpsed. It must have taken them the whole morning to pry the body out of that wreck. Worse, there's a second vehicle upended against a tree just a little down from there, a black SUV. My mind does the math, and I realize that it has to be the person who almost hit my kitty last night. I can't feel too bad about that. I'm just glad they have the new pole up and the new transformer connected. I do hope they get the wreckage dragged away before Kitty's up and around outside. She doesn't need to see this mess. One thing annoys me as I turn to go back inside. Annabeth's pink dressing gown and purple coat and the gleam of her camera are once again planted right on the edge of my property recording. At least this time, she's pointing her camera toward the cleanup. But I'm sure that in her head, we're somehow responsible for both the drunks and the blackout. Shaking my head, I plod back toward the shelter in a pile of work, and my sleeping sweetheart, whom I would pounce on for another round if it wasn't time to deal with the cats. Duty calls. I'm really looking forward to that. Two days to Christmas, and everything's as ready as it's going to be for those nine cats to get to their new homes. Kitty has made sure that people know where they were found, telling everyone that the local gang of tough guys actually helped rescue these furballs. She says that it's just as important for the locals to know we're good people as it is to know that we're badass, and she's right. It's not like we're defending turf in the big city and our cash crops legal and licensed now. If Annabeth could see us now, I think proudly as I watch Chewie patiently endure a fluffy black kitten clambering over his face. People are never just one thing. Kitty herself can be tough as hell when she needs to be, and me, I can be a pretty cushy teddy bear when I'm with the right people. I don't mind any more if it gets out. I'm not 20, and the people I need to respect me already do. Besides, if we ever have kids, I don't want them to be afraid of me, right? I pause, blinking over at Kitty as she stuffs the last of the stockings. I just thought about having kids with her. Whoa, shit. It's a question for the future, though, not for now. I know that. We're not expecting it, but come three in the afternoon, when our adopters are supposed to arrive, we find ourselves with a line running all the way from the shelter to the back of the parking lot. Lots of kids, lots of families. It almost looks like an entire neighborhood has come down for kitten therapy. My family was in town, explains Aaron Chu from in town on his way through the door. They heard we were surprising my wife with a cat and two of her babies, and they wanted to see the other kittens. He looks a little surprised to see a big biker at the door and cranes his head around to try and look past me into the shelter. Is this the right place? Suddenly the tiny black-haired cherub holding hands with him giggles and points at me. I hear the tiny picking sound of my clothes being used as a ladder, and then a small purring weight settles on my shoulder. The guy relaxes considerably, and some of the other kids laugh. Ah, uh, yeah, I'd say you're in the right place, 
I say a little sheepishly as Hellcat plants herself on me and headbutts my ear. I step aside. Come on in. Where did they all come from? Kitty breathes as the main room of the shelter fills up with folks from town and out of town. We were proactive and shut the cats in the various isolation and interaction rooms so that none of them could sneak out while people were going in and out. But neither of us expected this kind of crowd. Looks like everybody's got their family in town for the holidays, I reply in a slightly baffled voice. So far two families have left with their kitties, while everyone else is hanging out drinking hot drinks, chatting and playing with the cats and kittens. It's nice, especially since four of them have already signed up to adopt kitten pairs when they're ready to be rehomed, and two more are interested in adults. Whatever is going on, I'm grateful for it, and from the look on her face, so is Kitty. But it's quickly getting a little exhausting after everything that has happened. The crowd has finally trickled out, the kittens have gone home, two volunteers have signed up to help at the shelter, and there's a small stack of adoption applications sitting on the counter by the time the sun sets. The guys and my dad are hanging out, eagerly waiting for pizza, Kitty's brewing the coffee, and I'm digging two long necks out of the mini fridge when we hear a hard, authoritative knock on the door. I can't help but stiffen, as do some of the guys. That's a knock from a cop. Anyone who has ever had friends on the wrong side of the law knows it well. Kitty looks up in alarm, and I move to get the door, but she shakes her head. I'll get it, she says firmly. It's probably a good idea. I look like trouble to the average cop, even though the locals know that Annabeth is full of shit. Kitty practically has Cuddle Me tattooed on her forehead. People tend to trust her at once. She hurries over to the door and opens it, and two hulking uniformed cops look in past her with awkward but curious expressions. No hostility. Maybe a little confusion. That's an expression I've gotten used to from these guys, and I relax. Hi, Kitty, says Sergeant Evans, the gold shield who usually gets pulled into looking into Annabeth's complaints and smooths things over. His wife is one of Kitty's volunteers. He's a chubby good-looking black guy a few years older than me, and he gives us an apologetic look. We, uh, had a series of call-ins about you having a lot of people over. Kitty gets it too. Annabeth? Evans's partner Thompson is a big blonde, almost as big as me, with a mustache that a cowboy would be proud of and a solemn manner. Fifteen times, ma'am. Okay, well, come on in out of the cold and we'll sort this out. There's a faint rustle among my guys, but her calm manner my own, and the cop's apologies do a lot to ease everyone's minds. Kitty lets them in and putters around getting them coffee, pausing to ask, so what is she worried that I'm doing over here? She noticed a line out your door this afternoon, and the entire motorcycle club parked over here, and became convinced that you were selling contraband. Her exact word is drugs, but I know you all don't mess with anything outside your legal grow. That was the deal, when we backed the raven setting up over here. Evans takes his mug of coffee with a nod and a smile. Thanks. Anyway, we promised we would check it out and make sure nothing illegal was happening. Thompson's head turns as he hears a lot of mewing. I'm detecting suspicious activity in these visitation rooms, E.V. I'm gonna go check it out. My dad starts coughing into his fist and a couple of the guys fight smirks as the big blonde cop goes up to the first room's transparent door and peers in, but and then immediately crouches down. His solemn expression doesn't waver. Evans fights a smile and coughs once. Hey. Ah. Uh. Anyway, what was actually going on this afternoon? Kitty smiles, and the whole story comes tumbling out her adorable mouth. The early spring her asking the ravens to help rescue a bunch of autumn litters and their families, Annabeth being more confused than usual and trying to adopt a sneaky coyote. There was more coughing and harumphing and teary eyes at that, even from the cops. She goes on about how we're trying to get all the cats' homes before winter is over and that the first bunch got sent home today. The adopting families had their extended families, friends and neighbors around for the holidays, Dot and so 43 people had come through the shelter doors. 
She leaves out the crash, the blackout, and us falling for each other. After explaining everything else, she says simply, Look, I think I know how to settle Annabeth's mind. Can you get her to come in here and be a witness to your investigation? She looks at Evans. Thompson is halfway into a kitten room and being attacked by snuggling balls of fur, and he looks thoughtful. Yeah, I think I can arrange that. Just, he looks back at his partner, and his belly shakes a bit with amusement. Give me five minutes. What have you got in mind, baby? I ask as Kitty walks back toward the kitten rooms. Well, everyone's past quarantine and is immunized, and the big crowd's gone except for you guys, who know to shut the outer door. She starts opening all the doors. Kittens and cats come spilling out into the main room, meowing and looking around, a few going hopefully for the food bowls. You good in there, Sergeant? She asks Thompson, who is now seated on the floor in one room's doorway with a pair of stripy kittens on his lap. We're A-OK, -okay, comes the solemn reply, accompanied by mewing. This is the cutest thing I've ever seen, Dad chuckles, his eyes dancing. Hellcat is investigating his lap, having tired of my shoulder with all my walking around. Give it five minutes, Kitty replies cheerily as she tops up the fountains and food bowls. It's not even three minutes when we hear a pair of familiar voices approaching the door outside. No, it's not dangerous. There are no violent offenders in that building, ma'am. I've checked the Raven's records myself. You mean, Kitty was telling the truth about that? Annabeth sounds incredulous. Yes, ma'am. Kitty moves over to me and slips my hand into hers. It's a first in front of the family, and my dad glances our way, but his smile just widens a little before he looks back to the door. Well, I know something illegal has to be going on, and I'm coming in with you with my camera to capture this for posterity. Kitty's such a nice girl. They must be manipulating her, or forcing her somehow, but they're using their land for something unspeakable. More choking and snorting, I press my lips together against laughter. The doorknob turns, and we all do our best to calm down. Well, ma'am, I will tell you that what the folks you saw coming here to pick up is pretty popular. Might even be a little addictive. But I wouldn't call it illegal or dangerous. Unless you're a canary. Evans pushes open the door and lets Annabeth in. She's still chattering as she comes through the door, camera plastered to her determined little face as she aims it around accusingly at everything in sight. I have no idea what you're talking about. Kitty said that she had a lot of kittens to take care of and needed the ravens for help, but how many kittens could she possibly be? Her camera sweeps across the floor and takes in dozens of furry upturned faces. Oh my God. Her voice breaks into a squeak like an overexcited kid's. Oh my God, there are so many babies. I laugh and squeeze Kitty's hand as I look down at her. We're both relaxing as we watch Annabeth confront the most adorable clue bat to ever exist. She's already on the floor, camera still running, while trying to coax a few onto her lap with her free hand. Oh my goodness. Annabeth's still squeaking, as Kitty's shoulders start to shake with suppressed laughter from watching her reaction. Oh my goodness, I've never been so glad to be wrong in my life. So glad she figured that out, Kitty says quietly, and I kiss the top of her head. People are going to start noticing that we're together, but I'm okay with that too. If Annabeth's no longer freaking out, the pressure to sneak around is gone. It's a nice Christmas present. Not as nice as being with Kitty in the first place, but people can get two gifts in one season and appreciate them both. Thompson reappears with a pair of stripy orange brothers in his hands, one seated in each palm with room to spare. Yes, ma'am. I think we're just glad to clear the air a little, so everyone around here can have a quiet holiday. Evans eyes him. You know, I was the one who went back out in the cold and negotiated this while you were off duty playing with kittens. I was on duty, Thompson replies placidly. Nearby, Dad's approaching the weepy-eyed Annabeth with a box of tissues and a jingly ball. Well, he doesn't waste any time. I smile, glad he's taken his odd courtship out of my damn bushes. Evans drains his coffee. How do you figure? Dad duty, the big blonde rumbles. 
I told Kara that if she turned in every homework assignment for six months, we could revisit the whole getting a kitten idea. She did it and brought up her math mark a whole grade. Evan's eyebrows go up and he nods. Kitty smiles up at the big cop. So, not two kittens then. The deal's a deal, comes the solemn reply. I chuckle and shake my head, glancing over at Dad to check his progress with Annabeth. They're chatting, and he's showing off one of Hellcat's tiny kittens. It's weird to be hanging out with cops and Annabeth, along with Dad and the boys, everyone playing with kittens and talking about normal things. But it is so much better than having the police and that vigilante in pink trying to get dirt on us. And even if it wasn't, I've got something that makes up for all the trouble. Today I woke up with my sweet kitty next to me, and tonight I'll fall asleep with her in my arms. And I know we'll both fight like hell to make sure it stays that way from now on. The End Dr. O Sneak Peek Chapter 1 Aaron. It's almost midnight by the time I drive my motorcycle out of Ravenwood Hospital's sprawling parking lot. It's a foggy night, turning the road into a tunnel and the surrounding forest into something ghostly and surreal. It's the perfect weather for Halloween. I love Halloween. I've been a horror movie buff since I was 10. I grew up on a ranch 20 miles from town in Wyoming, so the 31st of October meant a special dinner pumpkin lanterns, and a lengthy horror movie marathon instead of trick-or-treating. I love those nights. I'm dead tired, and I don't much mind that I won't be home in time for any Halloween parties. Behind my visor, my eyes are bleary from checking and rechecking dozens of forms. It was back paperwork night in the cardiology wing, and as the youngest director in Ravenwood's hundred-year history, I didn't have any excuse to leave early. I had two assistants helping me out, Becky, a veteran of the department, and Kate, who is less experienced but a harder worker. I needed both to help me plow through this month's paperwork, which included the annual financial report and an assortment of federal grant applications. Now, each and every last scrap of paper has been filed, recycled, or followed up on, and I'm fleeing back to my mansion before more comes in. My head stings, my back aches, and I'm dehydrated. I know that enough fluids, a good meal, and a visit to my home gym and jacuzzi will fix everything. Meanwhile, though, I have to get home down a winding coastal road with wet streets and swirling wind to deal with. Good thing I'm steady under pressure. At least the rain has let up. The wet branches drip on me as I drive out onto the main road, humming Metallica's Enter Sandman under my breath. Ravenwood sits in the wooded hills just outside Marin County in one of the most beautiful regions in California. The air is clean here, there's plenty of rain and open land, and the sea goes on forever outside the Golden Gate. The area is at its best in high summer, with warm, slightly misty nights full of stars. In fall, however, it's, well, I find it perfect, but some of my co-workers find it creepy as hell. Especially since we have to cross a gorge on our way off hospital grounds, and the spooky-looking bridge we have to use is always dark falling under the shadow of towering trees with no lights to guide the way. At night, you have to use your high beams and pray there are no surprises waiting for you. I'm trying to sort out what movies to watch as I approach the stretch of road that leads to the bridge. The road is just wide enough that I can see the moon through the break in the trees, sailing ahead of me high and silver, with a pattern that always reminds me of watermarks. John Carpenter I muse aloud. Classic horror is always good. Problem is, I already did a John Carpenter marathon a few months ago. Though I love his creepy stuff, I need a palate cleanser. Ha, huh, I mutter. I have a bad habit of talking to myself when alone. Tales from the Crypt Something from the MST3K collection. Nah, too campy. I frown as I go around a turn. I can see the faint shape of the bridge looming half a mile up the road. J-Horror The Japanese have their own very distinct style of horror, and some of the best people in the business these days come from there. I've been working my way through the Ring series which, except for the crackfest of the second movie, 
has managed to be both poignant and terrifying. I haven't seen the prequel about Sadako, Ringu Zero, and decide to put it on first when I get home. There's nothing like a Japanese ghost story. Figures in white with streaming black hair transform from demure wives, mothers and daughters to betrayed rage-filled entities whose power seems bottomless. The fact that these horrible monsters are often played by fetchingly pretty actresses only adds another layer of creepiness to it all. I nod to myself, satisfied. That's one movie down to watch while I have my steak and beer. The household staff will be gone for the night except for my security team, but I'm sure I can sort out reheating my dinner. Too bad I have no date to share movie night with. Being a department head in my mid-thirties tends to eat up all my free time. And a relationship requires a lot more than a quick date during my few spare hours on weekends. At least now, with a backlog of paperwork, phone calls, and meetings eliminated, I can think about going out to a bar or something this coming weekend. It's been a while since I even danced with a woman, let alone took one to my bed. I miss it, in that bone-deep way that leads to dirty dreams and the occasional reckless decision. I'm almost at the bridge. My Harley's headlights splash across the weathered wood, and I peer ahead, catching sight of something emerging out of the fog. What the hell is that? I mutter. There is something white, standing in a misty patch of moonlight about halfway across the bridge. It's human-sized, if smaller than me, though almost everyone is. It has either black hair or a black shawl hanging over its shoulders, and it's dressed in flowing white, either a robe or a coat. For a moment, my tired brain goes, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, and I'm certain that either this is a nightmare or reality just took a hard left. But a split second later, I get hold of myself and let out a laugh as I slow down. Oh man, no way. I'm not looking at a Japanese ghost. I'm looking at a young, living woman who just really looks the part. I slow down enough to have a better look and to give her a compliment on her costume. Not a catcall. That's not my style. But she did just scare the crap out of me. Mission accomplished as far as dressing like Sadako. As I slow the bike down, she squints up at me, holding up one slim pale hand to shade her eyes. She's not Japanese, though her petite build and straight silky black hair make me think she could be mixed. Her wide, deep brown eyes catch my attention then, and I find myself falling into them before I can stop myself. Oh. I manage as I stop and turn the headlight away from her, just enough to keep the glare out of her face. Hi. Nice costume. Costume. She looks down at herself, and I get a better look at her, as I wonder if she's a bit high. She's actually wrapped in a lab coat that is about five sizes too big for her, making it float around her dramatically in the wind. Beneath it, I catch sight of an overlarge pale sweater and the silvery drape of a velvet skirt. It's all too big for her, but she's so waif-like that it almost looks like a deliberate fashion choice. If not as I thought before, a costume. I'm sorry, are you okay? I ask suddenly. I've seen people with this shocked, sad look on their faces before, usually when I'm talking to the family of someone we lost on the table. It doesn't happen too often, but that haunted expression sticks with you. So I notice it right away. She stares at me, as if she has no idea what to say. The wind picks up, hissing through the pine branches and sending her hair and clothes drifting around her. We watch each other mutely. After a pregnant pause, she lifts her head and gives me the saddest smile I have ever seen in my life. No, she replies simply, and my heart sinks. Chapter 2 Madeline The sky is so enormous now that I am free. I have been indoors for so long that I feel dizzy as I stare up at the slowly disintegrating clouds as if I will be overwhelmed if I don't look away. And it's not just the sky, the whole world outside the asylum is vast. I manage to avoid swallowing some of my meds before bed check, spitting them out and flushing them instead. It's been a good two hours since then, just enough time to slip out and steal clothes from the nurse's lockers and to hike this far down the road. Problem is, the pills still partially dissolved in my mouth before I could get rid of them, so I'm lightheaded as I turn to the man on the motorcycle. 
I didn't expect anyone to be out driving this late in the middle of nowhere. The fact that he came from the direction of the hospital makes me a little nervous. But Ravenwood is huge, the campus has three separate complexes on it, including the mental hospital. It's possible that he doesn't even work in the same building. I try to remind myself of that fact as he dismounts from the bike and pulls off his helmet. When I see his face, everything else leaves my mind for a few moments. I don't know anything about men or attraction. I haven't had the opportunity to do anything but admire boys from afar. But suddenly my stomach flutters, I feel a warm flush in my cheeks, and the dark thoughts that have been swirling through my head part like clouds before the moon. His hair is a sort of tawny brown color, like a lion's mane, shot with gold threads that reflect the glow from the motorcycle headlights and sparks. It stands up from a high forehead, must by his helmet. The lean tanned face beneath is prickled with blonde stubble along his jawline. His mouth is generous and well-shaped, and his narrow green eyes stare into mine like he's looking right through me. He's also huge, I realize, as he dismounts his motorcycle and stands up straight. He looms over me, and only his gentle expression keeps me from freaking out and putting more space between us. What's your name? He asks me softly. I blink at him, reluctant to tell him. He could hear, later, about a missing patient named Madeline at this very hospital. But then I just shake my head slightly, amused with myself. Unless he's a regular visitor to the hospital, he's not likely to hear anything. I doubt they'd let my name get out to the public. Madeline. That's a pretty name. I'm Aaron. Do you need some kind of help? He tilts his head slightly, and I shrink a little under his piercing gaze. He's intimidating without even meaning to be, even when he's being kind. I know. There's not much that can be done really. I'm just going to spend a little time around here, that's all. I struggle to sound casual and wonder why it's so hard for me to keep the shaking out of my voice suddenly. You can, you can go on. I'll be okay. Really? The gorge is deep and shadowy, with rocks like jutting fangs. I can hear rushing water down there. The whole idea of throwing myself over the railing terrifies me. But if there's one thing I know, it's that they will catch me if I stay on the run. I have no family, no friends, no money, nowhere to go. It doesn't matter that I don't have any of the illnesses that I was hospitalized for, except, of course, for the depression. The doctor will not let me be free as long as I am alive. Aaron gives a deep resigned sigh, and before I know what he's doing, he leans against the weathered railing, not so inconspicuously placing himself between me and the brink. He folds his powerful arms, and the leather of his jacket creaks against his biceps. I don't think you're going to be okay if I leave you, sweetheart, he says in a calm tone that leaves me with tears brimming in my eyes. As a matter of fact, I think that if I leave you here, they'll be pulling you out of the gorge tomorrow morning. Oh, that's nonsense. I, I start, then realize that I have started fidgeting. I'm, I just, look, Aaron says softly, catching my eye. I don't know what's brought you out here like this. I don't know what you're going through, and I'm not gonna judge. But I am gonna ask you something. I stop fidgeting and lick my lips, gathering my wits. How did he know what I was planning? I wipe my eyes impatiently. What? If you don't care whether you live or die anyway, then how about you come take a ride with me instead? His smile is charming, his tone reasonable. But his eyes bore into mine, seeking my answer. This wasn't in my plan. Confusion swamps me again and I stand still, blinking back at him. Why would you do that? I ask. He shrugs. I can't just leave you. But I can't tell you what to do with your life either. If you don't mind my saying so, you look a little ambivalent about the whole situation here. I figure maybe a nice ride will help you clear your head. I hesitate. It's true that I have nothing left to lose. It's true that if anything, taking this man up on his offer gives me a chance at a running start before the doctor finds out I'm missing. Escaping with my life might be possible after all. Or if it isn't, maybe I can just have a little fun before I go back to my first option. I walk over to the motorcycle, which gleams black and silver in the moonlight. It's huge and powerful looking, like its owner. 
Maybe he's a biker that was discharged from the emergency wing. Maybe he's not the type to turn me in. Nothing to lose but my life, and I was an inch from giving that up anyway. I look back at him and nod. Let's go. Chapter 3 Aaron I've never ridden a motorcycle, she confesses, and I smile and pull my spare helmet from my saddlebag. I'm so relieved that she agreed to my plan to keep her from killing herself that it feels like a weight has lifted off my chest. I came up with it by the seat of my pants. But I became a doctor for a reason, to save lives. I wasn't about to just leave her there. Here. I'll get on and you climb on after me. I'll show you where to put your feet. I look her over. Do you have anything to put your hair up with? She didn't, so I take a strip of gauze from my saddlebag's emergency kit and tie her hair in a low ponytail. Here you go. Mom and Dad have never understood why I would leave their land in Wyoming, which expands every year and is full of every possible luxury or bit of wilderness that a man could possibly need. But I wanted to make my own mark. It wasn't enough for me to simply inherit Father's pharmaceutical company or the ranch built by its wealth and coast on his achievements. So med school it was. And then my specialty, and then my residency. I started climbing the ladder at Ravenwood in my late twenties, when most people my age were still finishing grad school. I was far too focused on my goal to let myself waste time. My attention is brought back to Madeline as she adjusts her ponytail. She's skittish, shifting nervously when I touch her. I don't feel too bad about that. I don't know what hell she has been through, but as long as she isn't jumping off a bridge I figure she's better off for my intervention. I just know I can't expect her to treat me like a hero because of it. I help her get the helmet on, wrap her in my leather jacket, and get on the bike. After a few moments of hesitation, she gets on behind me. I feel her arms slip around my chest under my arms and feel an unexpected jolt of pleasure. Shit. This woman is distraught enough to be contemplating suicide. I can't even think about my attraction to her until she's stable. I absolutely have to make certain that she's okay, first. First, do no harm, I think, as I rev the engine. Okay. Hold on to me firmly, and if you get scared, let me know. She buries the front of her helmet in my back as we take off down the road. Her arms squeeze me tight, she's already scared. But she doesn't stiffen up, and she doesn't tell me to stop, so I keep going. There's a possibility that she's playing me, and we'll jump off the damn bike as soon as we get up to speed. I don't know what I'll do if she does that, besides get an ambulance here as fast as I can. In a way, we're both forced to have faith in each other. As we leave the bridge behind and drive off into the dark, I can feel her relax just a little and continue to do so bit by bit as we get closer to the coastal highway. We can't talk, and besides monitoring her and the road, I'm pretty much left to my thoughts. I was made head of Ravenwood Hospital's cardiology department early last year after the old head, Dr. Emile Blanchley, retired abruptly after breaking the nose of the head of the psychiatric wing. I can't say that I blame him one bit for landing that punch, Dr. Westridge is a jerk. But rules are rules, and while some members of the board chuckled about it, Blanchley was told to retire immediately if he wished to keep his pension. I've been scrambling to clean up after him ever since, going through years of neglected paperwork that has demanded many late nights. Blanchley might have been an incredible doctor, but a pencil pusher he was not. I've been forced to plow through it in chunks while struggling to keep up on current papers. All this administrative crap frustrates me most because it does nothing to directly serve patients. I know it's pretty unusual for a department head to have a hero complex, but I have helped save lives since taking the position. It's just been indirect, not hands-on. But I do everything that I possibly can. Everything from getting a kid from a poor family a transplant to keeping the department on the cutting edge of modern cardiology medicine. I go after it all with everything I have. I'm not an ex-army tough guy like my dad, but I still fight for my patients and for my department. 
even if I have to fund the battles with my own money. This mess with Madeline is just another day at the office in that respect. I'm trying to save a life. But the question is, how best to do so? If she's suicidal by law, I'm supposed to turn around and hand her right over to the psychiatric wing for a 48-hour hold. If I don't and she kills herself, I'm liable. But if I do, she'll end up in the hands of the worst department head on the entire Ravenwood staff. Dr. Westridge isn't just a bad doctor, he's a bad administrator. All kinds of rumors fly around this place about the psychiatric wing. Unacceptably high suicide levels. Unexplained deaths. Complaints of other things. He and I have clashed on a variety of subjects, including his insistence on keeping certain mentally ill cardiac patients in restraints, even when it endangers them. He loves drugs, often keeping his patients on levels of sedatives that sometimes endanger them as well. And he loves petty power plays, even among his equals, making him nearly impossible to work with. The rest of us on staff keep hearing reports of complaints and lawsuits filed against Westridge and wonder when he will finally run out of money for settlements. As far as I am concerned, he doesn't belong anywhere near a patient, ever. But so far luck, money, and a talented lawyer have protected him from any serious consequences. I can't send Madeline to him. I know too well what will happen if I do. The man will make everything worse. He seems to have a talent for it. If I take her across state lines, though, and into a major city like Portland, I can get her into a hospital with someone who has to be more competent and ethical than Westridge. Now that she's starting to calm down, maybe I can get her to agree to that as a plan if she needs to be hospitalized. We emerge from the access road onto the coastal highway and sweep northward along its cliff-hugging curves, the sea shimmering under the moon to one side of us. I can see the gleam of lights from little hamlets dotting the hills above us, and the sheets of cloud from the dying storm have all lowered into a hilltop crown of fog. It's a view worth living to see. I hope my passenger notices. I check in with her, reaching back carefully to pat her hand with my gloved one. She squeezes my fingers briefly, and I go back to driving, temporarily satisfied. Well, she didn't bail back on the road, and I doubt she's going to jump now that we're out here. On we drive, past several cliffside houses and a rest stop, until finally I slow down to take a break at a turnoff that leads up the hill to my home. It has a couple of benches and an old phone booth. I pull up by one of the benches and get off to stretch my legs and talk to her. How was that? I ask as she awkwardly pulls off her helmet. It was a little overwhelming, but I... I'm glad you took me for a ride. Where are we going? Her voice sounds so hesitant and tentative that I wonder if she thinks I'm leaving her here. I open my mouth to offer her a ride back to my place, and then I have to stop and wonder at my motives. Behave. Well, I say slowly, where do you want to go? She looks out over the ocean silently, wrapping her arms around herself. As far from here as we can, she finally murmurs. That's where I want to go. I think about the two days off work I have coming, and mentally count the cash left in my wallet. I live more modestly than I have to, so I usually have a decent amount of liquid assets. I might have to visit a bank at some point, but... Any specifics? But of course, she shakes her head. She really wasn't thinking past tonight. I'm glad I was smart enough to pick up on that. All right, up the coastline it is then. I'll just get us some clothes to change into in the nearest large town. I give her a smile and see a gleam of something like hope in her eyes. End of sneak peek. Start reading three Christmas surprises now.